Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, thank you so much for being here uh, at this early hour. We're really happy to see you uh, in person and uh, welcome online as well. Um, I'm Caroline O'Donnell, the chair of the Department of Architecture, um, and I will give a really, really brief intro because we have an amazing uh, set of speakers today. So welcome, everyone, um, to the Preston H. Thomas Symposium. Uh, since 1975, the Preston H. Thomas series is funded through a gift to Cornell's College of Architecture, Art and Planning from Ruth and Leonard B. Thomas of Auburn, New York, in memory of their son Preston. The symposium events are free and open to the public, and the Preston H. Thomas Memorial Symposium explores areas of knowledge related to architecture and brings outstanding speakers together whose presence, thoughts, and expertise enriches and inspires our work. Um, so it's a real, real uh, treat and honor for me to um, welcome everyone to the symposium titled Junior Architects Building Disciplinary Transformation Through Education. Um, James Baldwin wrote that the purpose of education is to generate the ability for people to look at the world for themselves, to make their own decisions. Uh, to ask questions of the universe, he said, and learn to live with those questions is the way that a person achieves their own identity. In his book on Baldwin's American Schoolhouse, Carl Grant wrote that education in an oppressed society can give a person who is oppressed a ladder to climb over some walls of oppression that intersect along race, class, gender, and other lines, but education can probably not enable them to completely escape. So. To change education, James Baldwin said, we have to change society. So Baldwin wrote that in the 60s, so uh, we know that 50, 60 plus years ago, uh, years later, uh, there continues to be inequity in education along race, class, gender, economic background, and other lines. Uh, so yes, the Symposium Junior Architects Building Disciplinary Transformation Through Education will push boundaries on important questions around education, but also ask big questions about society and questions about identity. Uh, so yes, it is about early learning programs, but it's also fundally, fundamentally about examining the infrastructure, to, this infrastructure of education to act as a series of catalysts leading not only to a more diversified group of upcoming designers, but also a major shift in methodology, knowledge production, context, professionalization, cultural competence, holistic support mechanisms, and definitions of excellence. Since joining Cornell in 2021 and before that at the University of Michigan in Detroit and at, at FIT in New York, uh, Assistant Professor Suzanne Lettieri has taken on uh, architect and social justice activist uh, Carl Anthony's charge to see cultural experience as a foundation for change and to celebrate human experience within a broad range of communities that interface with larger systems of power and oppression as a means to finding pathways to a more just society. Uh, Professor Lettieri's seminars and studios here at Cornell work to identify and disrupt subconscious bias in design. Her hands-on projects with young students are aimed at expanding methods of early learning engagement through build work, paying particular attention to um, how design experiences can have large-scale impacts on more equitable pathways to higher education and develop a deeper understanding of the built environment. Underlying this work is the intent of introducing a broader cohort of high school students to architectural design as a viable path to post-secondary education. And importantly, the work also supports architectural liter literacy in secondary education, regardless of one's desire to pursue this discipline. So in this type of hands-on work, Professor Lettieri demonstrates a boundless energy uh, dedication and a keen awareness of an empathy and care for the viewpoints and experiences of students who are newcomers to the field. Um, so thank you all uh, for being here, our speakers, our audience, um, our organizers. I know Suzanne will introduce everybody more and thank the key players in the organization of the symposium as well, um, but I would like to personally mention uh, Neha Garg, Eduardo Tehran and Heidi McNall for all of their uh, efforts in um, bringing this together in the amazing exhibition as well. So thank you to all of you. Let's. Um, and a uh, uh, really special thanks to Imani Day, <clears throat> who uh, has just been a light 
uh, for us in the last year and a half since being here. Um, so, um, and especially at the end, I'll thank Suzanne Latieri for bringing us all together today and the incredible thoughtfulness and insightfulness with which uh, this has all been done and will be done today. And so I'll pass the mic to Suzanne. Uh, welcome to everyone and thank you, Suzanne. Welcome everyone to the Fall 2023 Preston Thomas Memorial Symposium. Um, thank you, Caroline, for the introduction. And again, welcome to our guests from 15 different universities and early learning programs across the United States. Welcome to our audience in person and on Zoom, both our AAP community and pre-K through 12 community, as well as the other colleges across um, Cornell. We also have some alum of various youth enrichment programs here with us today, as well as current and past directors, instructors, and fellows. This is to say we have uh, an intentionally expansive group of people coming together to share with and learn from. So Caroline highlighted that this lecture series commenced in 1975 um, and has had an impactful role in supporting the research endeavors of numerous faculty members over the years. The lecture series fund is an endowment that, had, that was established by Ruth and Leonard Thomas in memory of their son, Preston H. Thomas who tragically passed away when he was a third year student of architecture at Cornell. What may be lesser known about Preston is his early involvement with the Auburn's Children's Theater, where he began his acting journey at the age of eight, performing with a traveling troupe, and later when he became a BARC student, he maintained his active involvement with the theater. Preston had designed a creative environment for children, intended to host an arts and crafts program for young people, and in honor of his memory, his friends, along with his parents, initiated a fund to realize the outdoor plans, founded on the principles of dedicating resources to the arts and to youth. I share this broader narrative about Preston today because it resonates with the central theme of our symposium, the creative potential and optimism inherent in young individuals. It also underscores the cyclical and reciprocal nature inherent in the work, where success for youth enrichment programs is often measured by alum who come back and act as mentors to the next generation and feel tethered to the programs that have had a, a positive impact on their lives. Important to note here is this, that this relies on the institutional commitment to stay in touch and to support their alum. Junior Architects Building Disciplinary Transformation Through Education is about the transformative potential of architecture and design when driven by young people and how their ideas can be activated when properly supported. The subtitle is inspired by our keynote, Dr. Sutton's dissertation published in 1978, Learning Through the Built Environment, an Ecological Approach to Child Development, which was grounded in her work as an architect in residence at PS 152, with a predominantly black and brown student population that participated in the Architects in School program. As quoted here, major goals were to increase children's level of awareness of the built environment as a basis for teaching other areas of the curriculum. So to learn through is to embrace the other tangential lessons that can be gleaned or absorbed while experiencing something like the architectural process or art or music. Both teacher and student gain a deeper understanding of teamwork, patience, communication, follow through, and importantly, can invert notions of expertise. What I mean by this is that we can learn from the youth in ways that can be transformative to the discipline, which is very different, a very, very, very different mindset than accepting this as service work. My own experience working hands-on with young people started in Detroit as a University of Michigan Mellon Fellow in Egalitarianism in the Metropolis then in New York City and most recently in Ithaca in the upstate New York area, where I've learned that making with, making together, and leaving space for individual ideas in the design process opens all sorts of opportunities to break down barriers and inherent power dynamics in a teacher-student relationship that can often be stifling to personal growth. I see this work as both a pedagogical framework as well as a way to develop tactics for a more pluralistic design practice. So in other words, for me, working with the high school students has redefined what practice can be. Foregrounding the student's way of seeing and doing alters the typical sequence of making, leaving space for their aesthetic sensibilities to be amplified alters the starting point for design. 
It can amplify social spaces or events that adults or professionals might overlook, so in this case of prom. It leads you to taking up space in places where young people don't always feel comfortable in, but they should feel like they belong, that they are welcomed, whether that's grandiose architectural spaces or the Ivy League quad setting. Folding that shared experience into a design making or building experience reorients us in space. It builds confidence and imparts agency. It has been impactful to build comfort also with technology and value. It also has a space that can amplify agency. These modes of working easily bring differently stu different student um, group populations together to dismantle intimidating settings such as review culture, which is so embedded in our design norms. For me, this way of thinking recalibrates the intention behind early learning programs, where the focus should not be on us ushering as many young people as possible into the discipline if we are not willing to change the discipline. This recalibration has been reinforced through the interviews that Imani Day and Neha Garg and I have been uh, conducting with various programs over the past year, seven of which will be foregrounded, foregrounded in the symposium today. Many of these programs are teaching architecture in less hierarchical ways. They are often community-based and rooted in the participants' aesthetic sensibilities. And at their core value, um, they're about making young people heard. They're bringing young people um, to the table. There are much more expansive definitions of wh which you'll hear today, um, but I'll share a few values. So territory from Chicago, creating safe spaces for youth through one-to-one -one building, ARC scholars learning through building and siting in their own community, ARC prep celebrating style, DAP youth creating advocates for racial and social justice, Baltimore Design School collective making, GSD black and design exposure and experimenting with mentorship models, Carnegie Mellon UDREAM teaching in cyclical ways and embedding learning to teach in these programs. So in the programs that I'm featuring, the, the pedagogical framework becomes a means to change some of the problematic structures embedded in the discipline. In this way, the programs themselves are an opportunity, opportunity to learn through. An important takeaway from today's symposium is to acknowledge the amount of work that goes into these programs and to rethink measures of accountability. During the recent Association of Collegiate Schools of Architecture conference themed Pathways, the president began that with despite institutional efforts, the representation of underrepresented populations in the discipline remains persistently low and is in fact declining. Many of us, especially those with experience in teaching in the programs, recognize that current pathway programs as they exist are not sufficient to address this issue. I think there will be various thoughts today about this, um, the systemic issues that need to be addressed in education. With this in mind, it is important to also look at the somewhat hidden and, and inventive infrastructures of support that the programs featured today explore. These programs begin to break the mold of a linear way of thinking about pathways. So we typically think about a pathway elementary school to middle school to high school to higher ed. Instead, these programs consider much more expansive relationships across institutions, institutions that typically remain siloed. So for example, vertical networks connect early education and academia with the profession. Horizontal networks are cross-institutional support mechanisms between different tiered um, academies and the open-ended support systems, which may, in my mind, offer up the most hope in propelling a broader cultural transformation in the discipline linking early architectural thinking to a host of different professions. So again, these frameworks offer a transformative way to think about institutions and about community, breaking down traditional models of educational pathways. As our keynote, keynote speaker, Dr. Sutton, and actually our first speaker today, Noli Wei Rooks, have expressed separately in earlier conversations with me, the more challenging task, rather than finding ways to bring more people in, is to examine the discipline itself. The harder challenge lies in reevaluating our discipline and educational systems so that pathways become unnecessary. This brings us to the primary title of the symposium, Junior Architects. Junior has two primary definitions. The first, of, for, or denoting young or younger people. The second, which is what many of us are familiar with is the, in the context of architecture, junior architects being one of the first professional titles in practice. It is defined as low or lower in rank or status. So within the title, we confront a foundational issue with how many of us began our careers in architecture. 
and the embedded power dynamics that shape the culture of, of the discipline. What the symposium hopes to draw out is how these structural dynamics play out in education and, dis and the discipline writ large, and how we need to challenge this. To truly support and re represent all youth, we must acknowledge the deeply entrenched inequalities within our educational system nationwide. It's crucial to recognize that the standards of excellence upheld by our institutions can inadvertently perpetuate these disparities. Across various architecture programs, there has been a growing demand for educational reform and a steadfast commitment to fostering diversity and inclusivity. This call for change has gained even more momentum in the wake of transformative events in 2020, and more recently, the Supreme Court's decision regarding affirmative action in admissions, and what that signals to minoritized students. The symposium we gather for today raises a fundamental question. What is our role in higher education when it comes to addressing the systemic failure of our country to meet the needs of all youth? While not all speakers today directly engage with early learning or youth development, their ways of thinking begin to shift into, the align into alignment with some of the core values of positive youth development to help all students thrive. A brief description of today's event, um, a series of presentations and panel discussions are pinned to key moments in a student's trajectory, so before, during, and after higher education. Building Society discusses the state of public education in the United States and the academic institution's relationship with the public. Pedagogy and Pluralism will confront institutional histories of academic elitism and their established beliefs, as well as the inherent difficulties and advantages encountered in the pursuit of more pluralistic educational environments. Civic professionalism will explore how diverse avenues emerging from architectural education can act as vehicles for fostering a more culturally engaged and influential practice, and it will explore how adopting this mindset can reshape the discipline. Throughout the day, there'll be video interludes um, between speakers, and those video interludes are the seven programs that I've uh, mentioned that we've decided to foreground in the symposium. A companion exhibition in Milstein Hall Dome offers a comprehensive survey of approximately 25 such enrichment programs spanning the nation, showcasing their approach and impact. Bringing the um, symposium activity to a close, Dr. Sharon E. Greta Sutton, distinguished visiting professor of architecture at Parsons School of Design, will deliver a keynote reflecting on the day's shared perspectives and offering her own takeaways drawn from her heralded career dedicated to fostering an inclusive design discipline and developing the tools and environments to bring it to fruition. I'm sure there are many themes that will emerge from today. Um, in organizing the symposium, some of the following themes have surfaced and perhaps can be a starting point for that guides our discussions throughout the day. So outreach, how do we view outreach beyond a student recruitment tool? Um, emphasize the important, importance of teaching and learning from each other, necessitating a reevaluation of methodology, knowledge creation, context, professionalization, cultural competency, support and excellence evaluation. Pathway frameworks, what lessons can we draw from these programs that create, create inventive solutions for systemic gaps? Expertise, how do we amplify youth expertise in connection with community networks? And mutualism, acknowledge that reciprocity and mutualism at the, is at the core, challenging conventional design processes and redefining embedded power dynamics. Um, so I'd like to end with just some thank yous um, and a huge, huge thank you. I can't say enough uh, about my team, Imani Day and Neha Garg. We've been working so closely together for the last year. Um, they've worked with me with all these countless interviews we've been doing and just been such a huge support um, for me mentally as well. Um, our graphic designer, Milo um, Bonacci, uh, the exhibition and fabrication team, uh, so Jelly, Eduardo, and Kim, that would not be standing out there if it wasn't for them. They've um, worked so hard in the last week to get that complete. Um, extra assistance from um, students Telis, Leo, Justin, and Frida. Um, a big thank you to the Department of Architecture. Special thanks to Heidi McNall. She's been extremely helpful in this process. Uh, Dean Mijin uh, Yoon, Chair Caroline O'Donnell, as well as the Cornell AAP Fabrication Shop. Um, so with that, I welcome Maria uh, to the podium. She'll be introducing our first session. Maria, here you are. <laughs> What an amazing day ahead of us. That was very inspiring. Um, uh, so 
we're going to get us started with a fantastic opening panel. Um, just going to give a bio of all of our presenters, and then they'll come one by one. And then at the end, we'll have a chance to have a discussion um, amongst the panelists and, and with the audience. I think we couldn't uh, find a better way to get us started than by Professor Nollywer Rooks. She is a multidisciplinary scholar and the Herbert Balu University Professor of Africana Studies and the Chair of Africana Studies and of the Rights and Reason Theatre at Brown University. <clears throat> Her fascinating and very important work explores how race and gender both impact and are impacted by popular culture, economic malfeasance, social history, and political life in the United States. She works on the cultural and racial implications of beauty, fashion, and adornment race, capitalism, and education, and the urban politics of food and cannabis production. And Professor Rooks will be joining us on Zoom. We're very excited to hear um, how you're going to get us launched into these very important questions. She'll be followed by Andrew Chin. Uh, he is the interim dean uh, and of the School of Architecture and Engineering Technology at Florida A&M University. He has 30 years of administrative and teaching experience uh, his research exposes the intersection of race and urban form in North Florida communities, and we look forward to hearing uh, more about um, this experience later on. Uh, he'll be followed, uh, well, by the, we'll have the videos uh, in between these presentations, but as a speaker, uh, we'll finish up with our very own Milton Curry. He's a professor of architecture and senior associate dean for his strategic initiatives uh, and engagement at AAP here at Cornell. Um, he produces creative work and scholarship on the role of architecture in shaping social consciousness and the intersection, uh, intersectional role of race, class, and urban geography embedded in modern and contemporary aesthetic practices in the Americas. Uh, we have the representatives of the youth programs that we're going to be uh, uh, hearing the videos and they're going to be joining us. Uh, we uh, will have Naomi Langer Voss. He is a New York City based architect and instructor at City Tech at Parsons. Naomi founded Arc Scholars with the New York City Housing Authority and as a local practicing architect. And also we have from the Territories program, we have Aliyah Phillips. Uh, she's the program director at Territory and she's working to help create a welcoming studio space and deepen Territories roots in Austin, Chicago and build um, pathways to career uh, for young people ages 14, 20, uh, 14 to 24. And we also are super excited to have Jaquela Rogers with us. She's a Territory Youth Leader and an alum of the program. It's amazing the um, range of participants in these programs that this panel has. Uh, so we're very excited. Overall territory mostly focuses on giving skills to young people in which they can, you know, use their own voice and kind of empower themselves and create spaces, um, you know, that are safe, that are comfortable for themselves. And that pretty much all starts in the intro studio. For me, the thing that stands out the most as to why territory is so unique is the fact that they've been able to kind of retain the overall mission of putting young people first. We've been working really hard to kind of interact with the community overall and letting the young people, obviously from Austin, kind of be that bridge between them. But overall it's, you know, about asking them what they would want to see and then us helping the young people of the community to make that a reality. We did an arch. We've made it because we wanted the community to notice us in a way. It's hard to explain. It's like we want to get noticed, but for the right reason. Like, so we made the arts so people can notice it, take pictures with it, look at it, describe it. And we're proud of it. The youth, including myself, worked on different concepts that we thought would help create the quality of life plan. That was a plan that focused on the needs of Austin in order to increase its quality of life and its residents. And one, that could be infrastructure, that could be social services program, that can be our transportation systems, that can be jobs in our area. And we pitched it to local community members and activists and stakeholders. And it's currently something that's been actively bought upon in Austin as it currently is developing itself. 
the Peace Circle was a craft for safe spaces in the west side of Austin created by high school students who has a way to develop and improve areas for all generations to come and just sit and enjoy their space in their community. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Um, and and, and uh, I have to admit, uh, from the starting point, and be open, I am, I'm, uh, initially I wasn't clear how I fit, but I would say that HBCU programs are not pre-college programs. They're accredited architecture programs, and they graduate students that go off and work just like everybody else, right? But I do think it's a fit because, as stated earlier, it provides a context. And also, these programs are teaching-centered. Student, they're, they're teaching programs very much in their heart and mission, and they're student-centered. And what I mean by that, they meet students where they are. And, and, in that, and in that belief and in that commitment, I think they serve an example, as an example of how, how we can change the discipline by changing what we do, because I do think we as institutions are the problem. Um, I also have to say that I'm not an HBCU graduate. Right? I'm not a legacy child. My father went to McGill, Champaign-Urbana. He went to all those other places like here. And I went to University of Florida. Right? I, didn't, I didn't go to an HBCU. And I, would, hey, I grew up in a time, I'm a, a public school kid from Long Island. I grew up at a time where HBCUs weren't popular like today. There was no Kamala Harris. There was no uh, Deion Sanders. HBCUs weren't, weren't cool as before, uh, uh, different strokes and everything else. Um, I went where I was told my parents went to go, uh, said to go. So, but, but, you know, in this appropriate tradition, I say I'll start and assume you don't know what HBCUs are either. And actually the wide palette of acronyms, classifications of universities. So I'll start off by really clarifying this kind of wide palette and also the history of HBCUs. So hopefully there. You know, if I was to ask most of you, what are the different types of universities? Um, the quick answer is public and private, right? There are public schools, there are private schools. But the palette is much wider, right? There are women's colleges, men's colleges. There's some base not on kind of its fiscal condition, public and private, or gender, but hey, even religious beliefs, right? There are all kinds of classifications, all kinds of types of institutions. Gender, race, economics, HBCUs, Hispanic serving institutions, and even tribe and colleges and universities. Okay? So when you think HBCU, it's not this unique thing, this unicorn. You know, we're all part of this classification. Are you R1 public and HSI? Or are you private, tribe, and so forth? We're all, we all have a mix. We're all poly. Um, we're all hybrid in some way. But what are HBCUs? Um, historically, black colleges and universities are institutions that were established primarily for the role of educating black Americans. Uh, they were founded and developed in an environment of legal segregation. There are, there are currently 101 HBCUs, 19 states, U.S. Virgin Islands, and if you look far west into California, right, Charles Drew. Primarily, though, in our southeast. Before the mid-1900s, it was extremely difficult for African Americans to receive an education. Laws prohibited education in many areas across the country, and only a handful of institutions allowed African Americans to enroll in college. Often black churches were the only source of elementary and secondary education. Black Americans like Frederick Douglass had to rely on self-education and informal educational settings in order to receive any form of schooling. The first HBCUs were created before the Civil War, and most were, most were founded in the late 1800s. And that is, boy, that is grainy. <laughs> Between 1861 and 1910, the American Missionary Association and the Freedmen's Bureau were primarily responsible for creating these colleges. And the first, Cheney University of Pennsylvania, founded in 1837, right, as the first institution of higher education. But if we were to um, talk about HBCU types, I often, uh, as I became part of that family, started to realize, oh, there's the 1862 and the 1890. Um, the moral land grants of 1862 and 1890 were the statutes that created the land grant colleges in the US. But it was the 1890 Second Moral Act 
that required African Americans to be included in the U.S. land grant system. It required states with separate colleges to train black students in agriculture, mechanical arts, and eventually architecture. Um, and if you look up in the East Coast, you'll see a red dot in New York in, a, in Ithaca, right? Small town. So this school is part of the 1862 land grant. If you look at the schools in the Southeast, you'll see the 1862 versus the 1890, right? I think, I can't see it up there, but uh, you'll probably see Virginia, Virginia State, Kentucky, Kentucky State, Tennessee, Tennessee State, Texas A&M and Prairie View, University of Florida, Florida A&M, right? So you see the dots, 1862, but among HBCUs, they are always the question, are you part of the 1890 land grant? So just another type, even within the many types and classifications. Um, even though only 9% of African American students attend HBCUs, the 1890 land grant students, schools produce 25% of the undergraduate degrees, pretty much, right? 9% of the African Americans are at HBCUs, but these schools are producing 25% of the African Americans these bachelor's degrees, but I think the real impact is some of the numbers that are cited, okay? Um, HBCUs are often credited with creating a black middle class, and the numbers, I, I really point to these, where they talk about the numbers of professionals, the percent of professionals that have a degree from an HBCU, right? Yes, there are HBCUs with undergraduate, graduate, PhD, medical programs, dental programs, and so forth, but those professional programs are, you know, the medical schools and the dental schools are, and the law schools are not as many as in the predominantly white institutions. But, but what you tend to see is people get their base, develop strong roots at an HBCU, and then can go on to excel anywhere. And part of the reason I kind of stay with this slide is to say that the assumption is, well, those places are just giving away degrees. Not if they're also accredited programs meeting the same bar, and also those students are getting into graduate programs and PhD programs and graduating, moving on, and really just focusing on living happily ever after, because that's the goal. So HBCUs are a great place to start, and for many of us, a great place to finish. Please note, though, HBCUs are only part of the spectrum. The presence of black Americans in the built environment is a timeline that has been written, photographed, verified, and well published. Multiple resources document the contributions of enslaved Africans in the plantations of the American South as sole practitioners from New York to California and an international practice in Brazil, the black owned firms from Detroit to DC, and the black leaders and corporate firms like HOK, Gensler, and others. So there's an existing timeline. HBCUs are not the center and only place of people of color and BIPOC people learning about architecture and moving on. It's about that 100 years in the middle. It happened before HBCUs, it continues to happen today. I see it more of woven into it. There are connections back and forth across, um, but HBCUs are woven in there. Within this timeline, the seven accredited programs are part of uh, are part of the timeline. When I see the 100-year story of HBCUs teaching architecture, it begins in about 1890, and I personally organize it along three themes. Industrial arts training eventually becomes industrial arts as a means for racial uplift, and then eventually racial uplift and accreditation. The themes can be understood through an introduction to three schools, Claflin University, Tuskegee University, and Howard University. Hey. A 1902 survey of black industrial schools by, by W.B. Du Bois identified 94 schools and 33 curricula. This is 1902, which included four schools, which also had studies in architecture, and those schools are listed on the left. It is, it is, it is, at that, wait, it is so hard to read up there from down here. The many, <laughs> the many HBCU industrial arts programs and drawing classes at the end of the 19th century reflected the demand for architectural training. At that time, there were few formally trained U.S. architects and only a handful of professional programs. Keep in mind, when we talk 1890, even architecture at Cornell didn't begin until 1896. So this Tuskegee and these other programs are starting at the same time as Cornell. Claf uh, within this 
palate uh, or need. Claflin College in Orangeburg, South Carolina is often recognized as the 1890 HBCU pioneer. It predates Robert Taylor and Tuskegee Institute by several years. Now that's by my organization of three types. If certain other people were here, friends named Quasi and others at Tuskegee, they would say no, don't mention Claflin, but hey, Quasi's not here. Uh, Northern missionaries founded the private HBCUs to educate free, freedmen and their children, and Robert Charles Bates led Claflin's mechanical arts training. Uh, Bates is recognized as one of the first black architects in the United States. His practice included several of the university buildings in the 1890s, including the Claflin University main building shown here in 1899. Claflin's instruction included architectural history, styles, ornamentation, and really construction and administration. And I highlight construction administration because that's the pattern you begin to see in these early schools. One of Bates' students, William Wilson Cook, completed a bachelor's at Claflin, but also studied art history at Columbia. Cook returned to teach at Claflin in his alma mater, Georgia State, and later Savannah State. I highlight Cook because it also indicates a certain pattern. The Claflin, Bates, and Cook's relationship illustrates a pattern found in many of today's HBC programs. There's a commitment to developing future faculty. Many begin their career at an HBCU, continue their career at an HBCU, or continue it at another HBCU or another institution, and people move back and forth. There is a community in some ways. Um, you know, I often get a call and people are tentative about talking about other HBCU programs and partnerships and other things, and I said, look, this is not Michigan versus Ohio State or uh, Alabama versus Auburn. We're all part of the same community. We all move toward the same goal. And we're all friends and part of a certain unique family. In addition to faculty connections, HBCUs share the use of, the early HBCUs shared the use of construction skills training to support campus operations. Numerous schools like Hampton can credit students with physically building their spaces. And I, and I always, reference this when my students start complaining about having to build models and do certain levels of work. And my comment is, hey, be glad you're not repairing the administration building or <laughs> fixing financial aid uh, more than just complaining. Industrial arts is racial uplift. While the Morrill Act of 1890 increased educational resources and social and economic Social and economic process were stunted by Jim Crow laws and sanctioned, ter and sanctioned terrorism. In response, path to change were presented by Booker T. Washington and W.B. Du Bois. Each of their positions influenced architectural education. At Tuskegee University, Washington's belief in industrial arts programs directly impacted design education. From its inception, architectural students at Tuskegee were rooted in building sciences and the hands-on practices. So this is real materials and methods class and structures up close and personal. While the 1892 recruitment of MIT graduate Robert Robinson Taylor led to added history and design in the industrially focused and drafting oriented program, they were seen as supplements to the hands-on experience. The 1892 catalog at Tuskegee states, in addition to time spent in the drawing room, students must spend time in the workshops to give them a more intimate knowledge of the materials which, with, with which they deal and to supervise work intelligently. The training of architects was addressed along two paths at Tuskegee, opportunities for faculty and opportunities for students. The first is that the university was essential in developing black faculty. As a result, the program secured talented black graduates from prestigious white institutions for teaching positions. If you wanted a great job, you wanted to practice, you went to Tuskegee, you could build and teach. The second path was the education of the students. By 1900, 36 of the 40 campus buildings were built with student labor. The lore of Tuskegee was national and only a third of the students actually came from Alabama. Washington dubbed the benefits of progress made through artificial forcing, I'm sorry, Washington doubted the benefits of progress made through artificial forcing and saw education in the industrial arts as a basis for economic mobility. He believed that seizing an economic full, through seizing an economic foothold, blacks could then assert a moral, social, and a political claim for equality. 
Du Bois challenged this bottom-up approach and insisted that racial change would occur through the leadership and activism of a population of cultured scholars, the Talented Tenth. He saw the role of higher education as a means for producing this cohort of leaders, social thinkers through a liberal arts curriculum. Du Bois believed that blacks should assert leadership and not wait for full and equal rights. His positions are evident at Howard University. The early 1900s saw the beginning of the great migration of blacks from the southern states and northern states and the precursors to the Harlem Renaissance, the emergence of the new Negro ideologies of black equality and cultural aesthetics. Their views were reflected in Howard's commitment to a liberal arts oriented curriculum and on, quote, on teaching architecture as a fine art rather than an applied architecture. Consistent with, consistent with his Beaux-Arts model, uh, historian and Howard administrator Melvin Mitchell argued that Howard provided a fundamentally different paradigm from Tuskegee University. Howard's liberal arts-based curriculum reflected the tradition of the programs attended by the early Howard faculty, by Howard Mackey, by Hilliard Robinson, and Lewis Fry, and like our schools today, the faculty teach what they know and what they were taught and how they were taught. According to Mitchell, Hazel, Mackey, Robinson, and Fry symbolized the literal passing of the baton from Tuskegee to Howard and the education of the black gentleman architect. In summary, Washington and Du Bois were influenced by different geographies and social contexts, the rural south versus the urban north of its time. Like this event, though, the two shared a vision for building transformation through education. While Tuskegee, Howard, Hampton, and Prairie View have a long history, additional programs were added in the late 70s. The newer HBCU programs, Florida A&M University, Morgan State University, and the University of District of Columbia, are public HBCUs. In closing, there are five type takeaways I'd like to highlight. HBCU designation is just one of many higher education classifications, okay? So when you hear HBCU, first, what is HBCU? It's just another acronym. There are a lot of academic acronyms. While they are often paired with, I would also want to clarify though, while they are often paired with HSIs, right, under the larger bubble of minority serving institutions, I would argue that they are more similar to the religious institutions, where their history is tied to their mission and purpose. And there are religious institutions that are architecture. Notre Dame, Catholic, Right? Judson, California Baptist. HBCU architecture programs are connected. Faculty are, are part of a larger community. Every year, the seven schools host their own spring forum, bringing together more than 200 black and brown architecture students. This was, I hosted it this spring at FAMU. There are students there from Howard, Tuskegee, Prairie View, FAMU, Hampton, and so forth. Um, we, we get them together to talk about the issues of historic preservation in African American sites. It was part of the National Trust. Brent Legs was there. Um, we're connected. Three, HBOC education is part of the story. It is not the only story, but it is a certain attitude about architectural education, but it's part of a long timeline of African Americans in architectural education. Um, in 1948, Alberta Jeanette Cassell, shown on the left, who was one of the first, and, and the, the university historian can correct me privately, was one of the first two African American women to graduate from Cornell School of Architecture. Her sister, Martha Ann, was the second. They were the daughter of prominent Howard professor and architect Albert Cassell. HBCU programs recognize a responsibility to a broader community. Um, community, yes, community responsibility to the architecture as a community, their own black and brown community, but also the term community in terms of, I would say today it's interesting, in terms of design justice. Recently, many of the schools have connected with a group, Dark Matter U, and have pushed and embraced discussions of design justice. So these DMU design justice uh, classes, fundamental design justice, occur at both FAMU, at Howard, at Tuskegee, and so forth. Fifth final point, HBCU architectures embrace their purpose. The seven HBCU programs comprise less than 6% of the accredited programs of architecture, but educate 30% of all black students in accredited architecture programs, 
Okay. Despite this critical and distinctive role, the identity of these programs is both uniform and dynamic. The schools vary in funding sources, size, history, and location. The seven programs emerged over roughly 100 years. Each program continues to evolve in response to its geographic context, changing economic situation, social, and also institutional pressures. Thank you. The program provides an introduction to architecture and urban planning to young adults living in New York City Housing Authority developments through the study of NYCHA campuses. The students are joined with City Tech and Parsons architecture students, and together the cohort research a NYCHA campus and determine positive architectural changes. We establish partnerships with communities in need and provide multiple learning dialogues. City Tech and Parsons students learn from the NYCHA youth about communities and site, and the NYCHA participants learn about architectural concepts, design skills, and problem solving. The goal is to provide momentum to NYCHA youth to activate change from within and empower them to successfully articulate their ideas and to ultimately pursue higher level education and employment. As we continue developing the program, we continue to cultivate the ARC Scholars family and propel them to make change. You're learning what real architecture is. You have to understand who you're designing for. You have to understand the communities, the issues, the needs, the opportunities that exist in each site. And in order for you to create a successful project, you have to understand the people that live there. I've seen some of the young residents that have participated here kind of come out of their shelves throughout the past uh, cohorts. I'm here to learn, obviously, about architecture, but most importantly, like giving back to the community or helping the community improve. I Good morning. Everybody hear me? Yes. Great. Good morning. Thank you to uh, Suzanne, uh, Latieri, uh, Mani Day, Neha, and all the organizers. It's really great to be here. Um, it's an honor to be here um, at, at such an important conference exploring such an important topic. Um, I should start by saying my speaking uh, today uh, publicly um, is in my role as a professor, not as senior associate dean. Uh, of the college, and so these are my, all of my personal views. Um, and um, again, excited to be here to talk about, um, um, in my presentation, reparations and accountability in contemporary architecture, um, focusing on work that um, I've been pursuing independently and collaboratively. Um, and so I'll start with some background information and context and then move into discussing some of the programs that, um, that I'll share with you. Diversity has become both a goal to be achieved as well as a condition to be managed. Reparations for past harm done to enslaved Africans, indigenous, Asian, and other persons of specific ethnic and racial origin has receded in the wake of diversity as an emergent unifying narrative for broad-based inclusion of a multiplicity of persons and identities in our society's opportunities and shared um, opportunities and shared ideals. In the discipline and profession of architecture, the professional organizations and academia have failed to comprehensively affirm repair and reparations as an overarching logic from which to address social inequity. And in light of Supreme Court rulings on race conscious admissions criteria in the nation's top colleges and universities, we must confront the convergence of these decisions with the multi-decade assault on black Americans' existential equity in the American democratic project and efforts to incrementally devalue it. I grew up in the late 1960s in Fresno, California, in central, the Central Valley of California, 
under the specter of the 1954 Supreme Court decision, Brown versus Board of Education. I experienced both the negative and positive impacts of racially integrated public education. Yet I witnessed the impacts of racism embedded in the systemic public education model on myself, my fellow classmates, and my fellow citizens, as did my mother. Mary Curry started the Concerned Citizens for Quality Education in the early 1980s after having seen her community ravaged by poor quality community schools and a desegregation plan that left the predominantly black community without a middle school at all. She led through advocacy, old-fashioned community organizing, and grit through the years of court and state approved desegregation plans meant to avoid court ordered forced busing and launched a district wide boycott to draw attention to the myriad of inequities in how the black community was disproportionately shouldering the burden of desegregation and reaping few benefits in terms of community and neighborhood schools of quality. As a high school student, I did much of my homework many nights at the Fresno Unified School District board meetings as I watched my mother and community persons gather to make demands of the school board. So the fight for public education, the fight for a vibrant democracy, where books are not banned but read, and where the work of people like my mother, now 92 years old, is not taken for granted and in vain, these fights, as the SCOTUS case and others behind it have shown, are not over, but have begun anew. The Civil Rights Act of 1866 designated race and color as the earliest forms of protected classes, barring discrimination against members of these groups on the basis of race and color. These protected classes have since expanded to include additional categories of persons, such as religion, religious beliefs, age, sex, gender, disability status, and harassment. Yet the original protected classes continue to bear a large brunt, disproportionate brunt of overt and systemic racism. Brown versus Board of Education, a landmark 1954 Supreme Court decision, outlawed specific, separate but equal education systems, public education systems, and set the stage for decades long battles over force busing and nationwide desegregation plans to integrate racially segregated public schools. As Professor Louie Rooks articulately uh, stated earlier, today, 2023, many parts of the country are more racially segregated by race and class than at any other point in our history. And many of our public school systems are more segregated by race and ethnicity than they were during the period immediately following the decision in Brown versus Board of Education. Public school districts, as Professor Rook stated as well, are chronically underfunded, understaffed, and lacking in providing basic competencies in educating students of color. Colleges introduced affirmative action in college admissions so that students' racial and ethnic backgrounds could be part of a holistic review of their qualifications for admission. I won't go through all of them, but in Regents of California, versus Bakke in 1976, one of the early decisions where the Supreme Court ruled that the use of racial quotas in its admissions process was unconstitutional, but a school's use of affirmative action to accept more minority applicants was constitutional in some circumstances. In 2006, voters in Michigan passed Proposition 2. In, 2000, in 1996, voters in California passed Proposition 209, both prohibiting and banning public institutions from discriminating on the basis of race and other characteristics. In Grutter v. Bollinger and Gratz v. Bollinger in 2003, and in 2003, the Supreme Court ruled that the use of affirmative action in school admissions is constitutional if it treats race as one factor among many its purpose to achieve diverse classes. The court reasoned that the law school's goal of student diversity was a compelling interest and found that the law school's individual review of each applicant 
where race was only one of many factors was narrowly tailored, uh, was admissible. And there's several other cases after this that bring us to the current Supreme Court case. Um, I think one of the takeaways is that moving from repair and reparations and trying to take care of past wrongs somehow converged into uh, diversity as a compelling interest. Um, both of those can be true, they're not mutually exclusive, but the over-reliance on the compelling interest argument has led us in many ways to the current Supreme Court decision. And studies have confirmed, a uh, recent study in, in 2020 um, at the UC Berkeley, by the UC Berkeley Center for Studies in Higher Education, confirmed that uh, causal evidence uh, of banning affirmative action exacerbates socioeconomic inequities. Uh, but here we are. Uh, we're now in a post-SCOTUS students for fair admissions versus Harvard uh, situation. And where do we go from here? Um, citizen architect, a term that I started using as dean of USC School of Architecture and the focus of a forthcoming book is organized, my thoughts on, on what a citizen architect is, is organized around the premise that our democracy as it has been conceptualized within the Americas and specifically within the United States, must be redesigned from the bottom up and that new configurations of democracy require new conceptions of space, spatial practice, and the politics of space. And these spatial practices, urbanism, urban design, and city design, architecture, landscape architecture, and contemporary art, are currently function really as silos. And I think in order to make more impact, uh, we need to think of these as more porous, um, as many institutions have, have, have started to do. Along with thinking about perspective paradigms that embrace radical transformations of the conventional ways in which we educate architects and spatial practitioners. Now, to date, citizen architect, and I'm not the first one to use it uh, for sure, um, I think has been grossly overused and in fact under-theorized representing our discipline's seamless alignment with the neoliberalism and corporati corporatization that now plagues academic institutions and civic discourse. Citizen and architect, when decoupled, appear to be in tension with one another, with citizen operating in service of a concept of citizenship and nation, what Benedict Anderson termed the imagined community, an architect operating in service of a client, focused on the commercialization of professional services and the aesthetic expression of a set of values. On the right to have rights, as Hannah Arendt so adaptly pointed out in 1949-1951 in the origins of totalitarianism, the problems of civicness, the problems of being a citizen are outlined. And Marcia Gessen, in a 2018 article, says, quote, according to the United Nations, there are a record 65.6 .6 million people who have been forcibly displaced. 22.5 million are considered refugees. 10 million are considered stateless. The refugee crisis after World War II revealed to Arendt that humans can exist in a place called nowhere. They can be displaced from political community. They can turn into abstractions. It is clear that not only can humans exist in a place called nowhere, but once they have lost their position in the political community, they can never be certain of regaining it. Here, to have rights means to participate in staging, creating, sustaining, through protest, legislation, collective action, or institution building, a common political world where the ability to legitimately claim and demand rights becomes a possibility for everyone." End quote. So the right to have rights is in fact the fight we're currently in. The so-called right to the city, the right to housing, the right to justice, under the rule of law, the right to a publicly funded or publicly subsidized education, on the question of the status of the citizen, the refugee and the migrant as transnational subjects, architecture and urbanism have a central role to play in the conception of the city as a physical, spatial, civic, 
social space of settlement and habitation, and I argue, in the construction of the citizen as a humane subject. What does democracy and diversity demand at this critical moment in terms of addressing systemic, racial, ethnic, and class conditions embedded, in fact, in our own ped pedagogies of teaching and training architects? How can schools of architecture participate in, in this questioning? Um, within architecture pedagogies that touch upon aesthetics and aesthetic practice as a political art, is abstraction a form of translation? Is signification a form of intelligence? And I think, um, historically, um, we know that this profession has been impeded by its homogeneity. Um, that homogeneity can be intentional, unintentional, but it's been impeded by that. Um, the Texas Rangers, the, the uh, spirit of, of developing architectural pedagogy uh, along a modernist track socially, uh, embedded with social ideals um, is, is, is one origin of certain kinds of pedagogy that certainly is very embedded in, in Cornell, in schools like Cornell. Um, but as I realized as Dean of USC Architecture and acquiring the archives of Paul Williams, uh, the first black American architect to be licensed west of the Mississippi, and the first black member of the American Institute of Architects, um, the story is not complete without black architects and others who really should be a part of the canon. And I think um, the importance of seeing our role as thinkers around pedagogy, um, I think the role of, of you know, thinking about modernism as, as in, in many ways um, an abstraction or translation of certain classical principles of architecture or thinking about the way in which innovation derives from uh, rigorous analysis. Um, I think about all that as I look at the work in the archives of Paul Williams, who uh, produced over 3,000 projects uh, from his office in Los Angeles uh, and in uh, Colombia as well, in Latin America, uh, doing public housing uh, as well as private homes, um, as well as very visionary projects, um, many, of whom, many of which are not known to any of you, um, but hopefully will be as uh, soon as his archives are exhibited and open to the public. But that's just a glimpse into, and Andrew gave a glimpse into many other architects that we don't know about, but who had tremendous careers uh, using the tools of architectural thinking to develop various ideas about community, uh, transformative urban conditions, et cetera. Um, and I think the question that, that I think comes into being for me is um, this idea of transformation as an architectural tool. Um, cultural translation is something that we need to think about as well. Um, universal versus culturally coded aesthetics. Um, and I think what's interesting in the work of both contemporary architects as well as contemporary artists who are working along the spectrum of architecture, spatial practice, installations, et cetera, is some of these works are not to be understood by everybody in the same way. And so dropping the universality um, that we desire for every um, activity in architecture uh, can actually open up opportunities to code aesthetics to various communities um, so that not everyone necessarily has to see something the same way at each moment in time. Um, I'm not gonna go through all of these, but just to kind of mark that as an idea. Now I want to spend the rest of my time going through two programs. I had the uh, pleasure of, uh, uh, well, the difficulty and then pleasure uh, of starting one at the University of Michigan, Art Prep, uh, Architecture Prep, and then another one at University of Southern California, uh, ALAB. And um, just to, to speak a little bit about the reason to, to do these programs, I think the first is that uh, the numbers that Andrew uh, and others put up of the paucity of uh, inclusion that we have today in black and indigenous and Latinx students in our nation's top schools of architecture. Um, and so that was a driver uh, as well as the fact that um, I think what I learned uh, is that a course is different from a program. Um, Putting a course in front of high school students versus lifting up a program is, is different. Um, 
The socializing affect that these programs have fostered was actually a surprise to me. The bolstering of self-awareness and self-confidence affirmed by peers in a protected environment was a revelation to me, as was the impact of association and affiliation with a top-tier brand. Um, and finally, the, the importance of a space uh, that, that affirmed the quality of the, of the project. So um, very quickly, this is the um, Michigan Architecture Prep. This is a space that we uh, took the position that we needed to do something that would help indigenous Detroiters. So we outfitted a 4,000 square foot space in midtown Detroit. And we started a program that exists today. This was 2014-15 that it started. Um, hundreds of people have graduated from this program. This is the space that we put our investment into to make uh, for the program. Um, and it was a very simple proposition that we would take the students for a half day of every day for one semester of their junior year in high school, and we were responsible for their education. Uh, it was architecture-infused curriculum. Uh, where they got high school credit uh, for uh, elective credit for visual arts and mathematics. Um, that was split up into f basically four studio days and one day that, that focused on uh, modules that dealt with um, uh, college uh, application writing and also career, career development. I want to go through the curriculum because I think um, it's important to understand kind of how at least for me um, how the curriculum developed and why. There were three projects. The, the third one is labeled Project 4, so sorry about that. But uh, there were three projects, and the first one was Drawing Objects, which is a, a relatively um, conventional tectonics form generation project um, that had them drawing different objects uh, using uh, tools to do constructed drawings, orthographic projection. Um, then the second project was this Agitprop Activator. Uh, maybe un more unconventional, necessitating the analysis of social movements and translating these social movements into um, space, form, and ideas for a project. And so introducing politics to 11th graders, introducing the politics of space, uh, at the same time they were introducing tectonics and architectural aesthetics. And I think that, that collapsing is extremely important for embedding certain principles uh, intellectual principles into students at this particular point in their career. Um, so that, that project unfolded with um, ideas of, of we had, each of them had a social movement that they had to research and then begin to, to work through projects on that. And so it was a, in a way kind of civics instruction as well as architectural instruction. Uh, we brought visuality into all of the uh, precedent studies, into all of the uh, examples of work that we were showing students. Um, and then we also, you know, framed up a list of spaces that they were to take care of in this kind of outdoor installation project. We had sites for it. It was sited in the city so they could walk to the site. Um, the final project was Agitprop Common, so take the same idea of architecture and propaganda and thinking about a conventional site, conventional urban site, but then an unconventional program that uh, had to was forcing students to think about architecture in terms of uh, an, an activator, a provocateur, an agitator within the urban context. Um, and so the idea of um, looking at different precedents, uh, continuing with the social movements, um, looking at the site and its historical um, situation, um, and then looking at the architectural program and how volume and adjacency could be used to kind of frame up and curate a certain uh, operational program that they wanted to have for the, for the building. Um, precedent studies, um, you know, we move back and forth, and I think this is, you know, this is a question, but the kind of precedents that, that people are showing, we move back and forth between, um, you know, conventional, modernist, capital M examples, and then other things that were, that were very different from that. And so that was an intentional pedagogical move, um, looking at Lebius Woods' work as well. Um, and then the work that came out of that I thought was very inspiring. I'm just going to show some small examples, but looking at Frida Kahlo, a border between two countries, and beginning to kind of think about that spatially. Looking at Kara Walker, beginning to think, you know, how do you translate um, some of the, the, the emotive expressions that you're feeling uh, after engaging that work into form, into space, into something that can, can be 
part of a discourse around building a larger project. Um, and then the project itself, beginning to think about how um, how these volumes, you know, are signifying different activities, signifying different functions at the same time as kind of communicating a transparency. And so I think it was very interesting to kind of hear the students and, and some of the, the, the language here is not language of, uh, in my portfolio, these are 11th graders and so we let them be 11th graders and so uh, some of this is, is a little bit uh, awkward. Uh, in terms of its positioning, as it should be. Um, and so I think this is the kind of ethos that, um, that came to me out of the program that was very uh, significant and um, hopefully has been impactful to, to the students who went through the program. Um, and then very quickly, I'll just move through slides. Um, for ALAB, the program at University of Michigan, for this program, we brought it onto our campus. It's, the, it's sitting on the USC campus. Uh, this is the space that we outfitted for it, which also is, is used for other programs at the school. Um, it takes a team to put these programs together. On the far left is our uh, administrator from LA Unified School District. In the middle is uh, Provost, at that time, Ch uh, Charles Sukoski. And on the far right, uh, just in from the far right, is Lauren Matchison, who is director of the program, director of pre-college programs and this program. Um, I think the pride that the students take in beginning to um, deal with what they're doing, uh, the parental involvement and engagement is very important. Um, and then I think quali quantitative surveys that we use to, as a metric to tell us were we actually uh, moving the bar. And so um, I think this is just the beginning of the kind of evaluative processes that, that might be used, but I think it, it did help us to identify that we were moving the mark in, in some instances. Thank you. That was a fantastic panel. I think we could just spend the rest of the day with what you just heard. Uh, we have about a half an hour for a discussion. I'm going to ask everyone of the audience to start putting together your questions, your comments, you know, how you think of, of the amazing histories, macro histories, micro, micro histories that we just heard together and think about it. I'm just going to throw words while you think about your questions. Um, I, I was really fascinated, although we're going to have a discussion among ourselves, so you have to do the work as well. Think about your questions. Uh, I was particularly inspired by the challenge that was put in the panel in and of itself, no? You got us started uh, with the amazing um, invitations to think about change, to think about more just futures, but you're doing that by asking us to think historically, you know, to think about how these promises have changed and of like future new just possibilities are actually quite old promises that have failed. Um, so I think that that's just such an important way to set us up. You know? Yes, uh, there is like the micro, we began with like a mi micro histories of, of the systemic failures, but also of the persistent um, requests for change. And then we saw how some of the institutional histories, no, the macro history of the, of the difficult realities of inequality and segregation of these countries, looking that in the face, but also looking at the institutional histories that have pushed against the inertia of that history. No, and I think that both of your presentations uh, bring that difficult histories together with joy of efforts that have continued to be made. And, and therefore, we set ourselves to your challenge on the footsteps of those efforts. And I was thinking how important it is from uh, your presentation to build a sense of class consciousness almost, of social consciousness, like segregation works for real, like making each of these institutions, individuals, uh, programs think that they're working on isolation, really segregated, like there's fragmentation that is institutionally embedded, so to think of communal mission. Uh, and I think that your presentation on, on the um, HBSU uh, schools made that very potent to me as well as I was listening to that which brings the whole exercise of putting all of your programs together into a whole new life, right? Like it's not just about learning how, you know, institutions are doing it, but about generating a sense of class consciousness, of collective consciousness. Anyway, so that's like the mi micro history 
that we've learned institutionally, historically in this country, but then we have these micro histories, the small ways in which this is happening now in the ground and the work that it takes. So I would love to get us started by hearing a little bit more, like opening those one minute videos, opening them up and, and hearing you uh, talk about um, the work that it takes, but also the pride, I think Milton just through that word pride at the beginning of your presentation, uh, and we have talked about the pride of these, of these programs. So my first question or, or, or comment, I'd like to open the table um, to the three of you to talk a little bit. I would love to hear like the micro histories of your program. Your programs are particularly embedded in the communities. We saw it in the videos, like you are like, there making it happen with, um, with your students, uh, but of course, there is a lot of discussion, like these programs exist, they have a history, but this history, I know it's very much uh, changing every year, right? Because that's the premise. You're working with communities, you're learning with communities, you're challenging pedagogical uh, models with communities. So I would love to hear, uh, Aliyah, from you a little bit perhaps on how the program has been changing, like from one installment to the next, in conversation with the communities, right? And 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 perhaps give us some sense, you know, uh, Milton in his presentation brought us from the large history to sort of specificity of some of the exercise, how this actually works, and that's a lot of the challenges that we have at the schools. Like, what are the exercises anyway? So I would love to hear uh, Jaquela from you about some of the exercises that you feel that worked best to make that. Um, conversation happen, some of the exercises where you felt pride to be part of these, uh, of these programs, um, and, and perhaps you can follow up with some of the sure. reflections for your program as well. Thank you. Can you hear me? I, I can, but it's green. Yeah, it's, it's on. You all can hear me? Yeah. Wonderful. Okay, so um, so it's not working. It's Maybe not bring working. it closer. Is it working now? Can you try try this one. Can you already? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I okay. Let's talk about the history of territory. Well, territory originally, in response to moving. Um, based on the needs of the community. First, I'd like to just point out that territory wasn't originally in Austin, Chicago. Uh, for those that do not know where Austin, Chicago is, that is the west side. Territory was first um, founded on the north side of Chicago, so in Albany Park. Um, and I would say um, that is one of the changes that, one of the first pivotal changes that happened within territory mm. was that we moved mm. to Austin based off the response of the youth. Mm. And we noticed the response of the youth is because most of the youth that were involved in territory were traveling from the west side of Chicago to Albany Park to first for school, but to stay for a territory after school program. So in response to that, territory relocated, um, but also just noticing a difference between the Albany Park youth and the West Side youth. The West Side youth were more passionate about their community, so um, with that passion and with like that real desire for change, um, territory decided to relocate to Austin, and Austin is such a profound community on the west side of Chicago because they're very invested in their community. They know what they need, and the youth um, advocate very freely for that. I would like to say some more changes that has happened. Um, our territory team has created, um, first they collaborated with another organization called BUILD on um, advocating for how to make the community safer for young people. And with doing that, they collaborated on the quality of life plan. They created that as well as out of the quality of life plan came about the Austin 2.0 project. So with the Austin 2.0 project, there were six strategies. And out of those six strategies came our sit, stand, strut. And so what I love about the sit, stand, strut um, is that our youth highlighted very well how they do not feel comfortable or confident walking um, around. They do not feel like the public space was designed for them. Mm -hmm. And so the sit, stand, strut piece addresses those needs. Um, the sit 
advocates for the peace circle and for peaceful spaces. The strut allows you to be, feel confident walking around. What allows, it points out the need of the youth. And then the stand piece is the entrepreneurship piece um, that came out of what the youth created. So those are some changes. But all of those strategies, what I love is all of those strategies point specifically to the unique needs of Austin, and those strategies also provide the solutions. So I think so far that is how we have already changed. Mm -hmm. uh, we have already shown over the history um, that we have been meeting the needs and moving based off what our youth mm -hmm. um, want. Mm -hmm. So does the youth agree? <laughs> <laughs> Can you guys can you guys hear me? Okay, so um, yeah, I would agree. Um, the projects that Aaliyah mentioned are actually the projects that I was gonna uh, answer your question with. The quality of life plan, which was completed my first year of territory, and then uh, the sit portion of sit stand strut, which um, I was able to basically ideate um, coming up with the sit. And then uh, being able to go along the process of creating different uh, seat structures, uh, how we wanted it to look, um, actually going to a workshop and building a prototype of it, um, putting it out on the blocks of Austin, Chicago, um, seeing how the community responded to what the teens in Austin felt like we needed. Um, and now uh, they should they're going to start putting the SIP portion of our project in Austin on blocks um, to be there permanently. So, yeah. How, it was interesting at the end of Milton's, he begins to look at with his surveys, these kind of quantitative analysis of success. And it clearly talks about the goals. And I was curious, what are the long term? What's the success? How does your program define success? Mm -hmm. Mm, great question. <laughs> so I really, okay, so personally I think territory, what we do, um, we define success as we have like four different things we look at. The youth agency, we also look at um, design equity for the youth um, as well as the how how do our youth feel like they've been exposed to a venture, to a venture out? Um, and so not only do we hold ourselves, the staff, but we have the community hold us to that measure. Mm -hmm. And I think um, what we define success is when our young people present an idea to us, um, it's our duty to help support them create that idea and bring that into a reality. And so, um, as well as seeing how to come alongside our young people, but how also to stay committed to them and seeing them take that ownership themselves, mm -hmm. lead that and come back, that's how we define success. Mm -hmm. um, and we've had so many of our youth join and stay on for years. And now we have students um, away at college that's mm -hmm. taken up architect and design. So that's how we define the success. Mm -hmm. That's so interesting, and I, and I would love to hear, Naomi, how your program, I'm sure you, you want to define success that way as all of, all of us, but there are certain institutional uh, relationships, but that might require other measures of success, not by working with the New York Housing Authority. You might need to deploy you know, other quantitative measures. Uh, but, but so I'd love to hear how to navigate those, know how to keep the core mission that success is about the empowerment, the pride, and I'd love to hear later perhaps more about the, the peace circle. Um, but that oftentimes institutionally requires other quantitative measures that might go against, you know, focusing on that mission or not. So I'm going to start with our mini successes, which is recruitment. So we offer, the class is offered to anybody who lives in a New York City Housing Authority development, young adults, ages 14 to 24. So the idea is that we are finding young adults that might be interested in architecture that 
was they, that never had any exposure, that never took an architecture class, that never knew an architect, but really understood they wanted to be involved in the built world. So we're starting at a, at, at a point where some students come in, they say they don't even know what the word architecture means. So for me, success and for our program, success, success has really been recruitment. How do we get our young adults in to an academic environment where they learn that they can make their own changes and that they can learn about design and architecture. So, so that's one part of success. Um, of course, when we have, students can come back as many times as they want. So when I have a student who's been with me five out of six cohorts, that's huge because that means that there's a much higher chance that they're gonna make it to a upper level education system, right? That they're gonna end up wanting to pursue a real, a, a career that, 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 af that affords them a professional place at the table. Mm -hmm. So our biggest challenge is, is really recruitment. How do we find students is sort of the first challenge. And we're dealing with issues of housing and those issues are super personal. So we study a different campus each class and um, Students are very open about talking and sharing issues of their housing experiences, and then we have to do that big leap, which is how do we make those changes? Both positively, like how can we bring positive change in ways that the students can understand it and figure out how to make? I don't know if I answered your question, but. You answered my question, okay. and then. <laughs> and then, have and then, and then you have, of questions. course, of course. But I think, I think that's, um, when I hear about, you know, propelling the students into the next level of education, I, it, it's so promising to me to mm -hmm. think that our students could, could launch. Um, we, I, I, it's a new program, you know, it's, it started during COVID um, when I really sort of looked around at inequalities in, in education and wanted to figure out how to engage with community. Um, but that's really one of, one of, one of my, my plans, is how can I propel the students over into, into a higher level? The nodding, the nodding yeah. works collectively. I just realized there's some special determinism that is bad. I'm in the middle and then the program. <laughs> so for the next um, um, moderators, don't do that. <laughs> something different. <laughs> um, but I, I love. So but by this I'm saying, whatever, just uh, interact. Um, I'm thinking about Professor Rooks, who couldn't join us for the discussion um, on Zoom, no? But her challenge really, and it's something you, you mentioned in your introduction, is to call attention that the need for these programs, the need for platforms of launching the students, as you just put it, uh, it's both uh, a need and a, and a sign of failure, no? And that's, that's what we're doing here, and, and I think that that's part of it. So I'd love to hear, um, hear you talk about that part was very clear. It's kind of like the goal-oriented aspect of the, of the measure of success. But it seems to me that all your programs have a lot more to say about the architecture practice in and of itself, like the act of coming together, of drawing, of building. I was fascinated by the way all your programs have building, like building labor as part of building that pride or, or, or a, a practice that allows to exchange information, community empowerment. So I, I guess that I would love to hear everyone talk a little bit more about the, the practices, the techniques, the strategies that really um, build that sense of community. So on, on a way, what I'm saying is that you build academic pathway towards programs, but you're building a lot more. No? There's a knowledge of, of becoming uh, necessary, helpful, uh, and together in a community. Yeah. Well, first of all, congratulations on these other programs. That um, mm -hmm. These are amazing, and the work that you're doing is, is hugely impactful. I think the whole ecosystem benefits from, from each part of it. Um, just in answer to your question, I think you know, from my perspective, I mean, architecture is a discourse and it's a profession, it's a field. Um, and so I don't care whether a student's 10 years old or a junior in high school, we've got to introduce them to the discourse of architecture, 
um, not just the profession of architecture. Right. And so I think that's where, for me at least, it was important um, in starting these programs, and, and they evolve with, with directors that have, um, you know, the pedagogy and the, the project that they do will evolve as well. But I think for me, um, the discourse of architecture, which is something that we debate and have ideological positions on here as academics, um, we've got to introduce that at a at a level that is age appropriate to uh, the students we're interacting with and engaging with. Uh, shielding them from that is kind of babying them. And mm -hmm. I think it's, it's mm -hmm. dismissive and I think it's not helpful. And so I think we've got to figure out, um, in my view, how to do that. Obviously the profession of architecture, um, building the competencies to be license, all that is important as well. But I think uh, we've, got to, we've got to introduce them to the discourse of architecture. Otherwise, um, you know, it feels like kind of a retro grade activity. Um, I agree. And in, in hearing the early introduction and, and the comment about the failure of the systems, it, it was really the first time I, when we were in a Zoom and I connected and I said, well, you know, I, I feel the same way. HBCU programs generating 30% of the graduates is really the failure of the other ACSA schools. Um, it, it leads me to the question is why is it that one group or one cohort is producing 30 percent? Is it because they're the only ones that can or they're the only ones that care? Mm -hmm. uh, does it only matter to these places? And, um, you know, and, and even reflecting on the question I asked about success, and, and, I, and I was thinking about that with, as Milton started to talk about, and you referenced pedagogy and so forth. Um, you know, I, I think it for change to occur and long-term change. It, it, it starts, but it will continue with, I think, creating the faculty. Um, and I think that's going to be the responsibilities and the faculty at both ends, not just at HBCUs, but at all the other institutions. And, and, and I ask the question of success, because I ask myself that question. And I say, you know, my goal is to create those, fac is to help support the faculty at HBCUs and across the country and black and brown faculty that will change the discussions mm -hmm. and what's talked about and how what we talk, how, how being in a studio, being the, the different student in the studio is not something where you feel like you're being tolerated, but yeah. difference is actually celebrated, that difference is something that is looked at, admired, and part of architectural conversations, part of the discourse that there are broad and many differences, but, but, but often we're asked to sit within a certain box. Um, you know, I, in, in, if, it was interesting also looking at the high school, and I, and I don't know if this was tied to one of your comments, when you bring those students together and they see their teachers and their friends like them, and they mm -hmm. hear about architecture, they see that they actually fit in this thing. Mm -hmm. And how many of us are, have never been in that kind of space? We're taught architecture, but never in those kind of spaces. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's what I thought about. How many other faculty I know, black or brown faculty, are known for being the black kid in the room as you learned about architecture and always were curious, do I fit in this thing? And that's what I kind of admire very much about the um, the pre-college programs and what occurs at HBCUs where that is no longer an issue and you're just there to learn about the discipline. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. yeah, so you just talk about the box. Yeah. The certain box where, you know, there is a way of misunderstanding these programs as opening little holes to get in the box, as opposed to the peace circle, which is a way of, sorry, I'm using the, the shapes here. Um, Right, like because it, this seems to me that this program is not happening within the traditional institutional framework of capital A architecture, allow perhaps more freedom to create uh, experiments, exercises uh, outside of that of that box. Um, yeah. So, and, and I just wanted to add, um, I think what's been probably the biggest success of the program is that it's mentorship. It's all student mentorship. So. Um, we have City Tech students. City Tech is um, part of CUNY. It's a public university. And we have City Tech architecture students that provide mentorship. Sometimes it's, you know, we have maybe six or seven, so there are a lot of them around. So the, the students are seeing 
a very, a very close path toward a future architectural education. And then this semester, we're piloting, also working with Parsons architecture students. So they're getting um, even what, a f and they're upper level students. So they're getting kind of the next level. Like what would it be if we, okay, well now we have our city tech friends. And how do we then go to the next level, which is what does it look like if I really get through this program and become an upper level student? We also have professional mentors, but I think really it's the student interaction, exactly what you're saying. Students seeing like-minded students and connecting with them in ways that they're not connecting with their professors yeah. and seeing that that could be them. Yeah, but also you're bringing, you're bringing architecture to their space. You're, you're, you know, I think that's what's also significant and different. When, you, when, when many of us walk into the studio the first time and you hear about all the other kids that say, oh, my mom and dad was an architect. Oh, yeah, I did this in the mm -hmm. summer. And you're sitting there going, oh, gosh, I never even met an architect. Yeah. I picked this as my darn yeah, major. Yeah, yeah. I got to stay up all night, and I really don't know what game, what the, what the end game's going to be. So I think what's important is whether it's a school, uh, Detroit, or, or in New York, you're bringing the discourse to them in their space mm -hmm. and saying, no, we will bring this to you, you hold it, uh, we'll bring it into your family. And not saying, oh, you gotta get out of your box, get out of your space mm -hmm. and come to us. And if, if you come to us, we'll teach you a little bit. Mm -hmm. I had a couple of um, observations on both those remarks. One is I think um, elite institutions have gotten lazy. Yeah. Um, we've been able to go to the private, top private schools and get the diversity that we thought would be needed. Um, and we haven't reached further down uh, to um, cities or schools that, that, that have, like the schools I've dealt with, or cities, LA, Detroit, uh, that, that, that have more complicated educational um, systems that are challenged. Um, and I think, so that's one, one observation. The other one is I think um, one of the things that we language-wise decided to do at Michigan was we said, let's stop talking about talent. Let's start talking about potential. Cultivating potential and not identifying talent. Um, the idea that, that students are gonna come to us pre-packaged to be architects, ready to go on day one, uh, then what are we, what are we supposed, we're teaching architecture, we're not expecting the high schools to teach it, and then they come to us pre-packaged, ready to go. So I think the idea that, that, again, we've gotten a little bit lazy in terms of how you talked about meeting students where they are, um, I think that's important um, nexus of, of thinking that we need to, 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 get, to get with and to, to be, um, to make it part of our ethos. Um, the other one is, the other observation is that I think um, what, what the Michigan program opened my eyes to is, you know, I was sitting, I would sit with parents um, of students who were prospectively going to come into the program. Uh, some of those parents making $100,000 a year um, in income, but maybe not having the assets to be able to send their kid to a private school. Another parent, uh, uh, parents who might be making Thirty-five to forty thousand dollars a year. Um, I could tell those parents apart in terms of their energy, excitement, and uh, effort to help assist the program, their students with succeeding in the program that we we're doing. And I think those kinds of revelations. You know, we we we're here at at these these institutions, and we get students as freshmen, and we they're kind of blank to us. Um, but what they're coming from is fascinating and the experiences that they've already had are fascinating and I think um, that's just a revelation that I think oftentimes we, we kind of um, fashion kind of poverty and and low income in a certain category and uh, it's, it's just there's a different reality it's much more nuanced and much more um, amazing actually to kind of see shaping itself uh, as, as you deal with, as you interact with the students and also the parents who are, who are living in, you know, in these conditions. It, it, and I would say the wide, the wide palette of conditions that students, whether they're high school mm -hmm. or freshmen, that black and brown high school and freshmen come from. And it always, it, I always do this double take. And I was surprised at one place where a person kept, one in university, person kept talking about 
black and brown urban kids, and I was like, wait a minute, I'm, I'm black, and some people think I'm brown, but I, I didn't live in an urban place. I grew up in a suburban place. And <laughs> please don't make this assumption that all yeah. black and brown yeah. kids are from urban in environments, and my father did <laughs> you know. So it, 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 it's interesting that he, so kind of we have to stay open to this wide palette and, and not assume oh, well, we don't know if he or she can do study abroad, and then the kid tells you, oh, no, no, I was in France last summer with mom and dad, <laughs> you know. Um, but I think there are always these assumptions yeah. Yeah. Of, of where people are coming from and what they are coming, almost positive and negative, what they're coming with yeah. and what they're not coming with, and, and you yeah. kind of don't know. So I, I really admire the, these, these other programs that kind of say we're going to make sure everyone, if they move to one of our ACSA schools, they're going to get the head start. Um, they're, going to, they're going to have a head start. Uh, so just thank you. Um, I have tons of questions, and I asked everyone to um, think of a question, but the objective was to never have time <laughs> <laughs> to have you ask the questions. But the rest of the day unfolds, so you can ask them you know, as we mingle in the corridors. Uh, and that's the idea, no? to keep the conversation ongoing. Uh, again, thank you for offering your histories uh, of your programs, large and small, and get us started um, on this really challenging foot for the rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Welcome back to the uh, the second session for today's symposium. So we're um, focusing on pedagogy and pluralism. I'm excited for this uh, session personally. Um, my name is uh, Dr. Janet Loback. I am an assistant professor um, in human centered design, which is in the College of Human Ecology here at Cornell. So we are um, another design department here, and I have some affiliations uh, with um, AAP, but really um, grateful to, to be invited to uh, participate today. Um, my own work, my own research and advocacy uh, largely focuses on um, the design of environments for children and youth, um, and how these environments, including um, how they're designed and by whom, who's making decisions, how they are impacting young people, and also then how young people in turn uh, shape um, their, their built environments. Uh, so I have a particular focus on uh, public and community uh, environments, as well as settings for, for play, leisure, um, and learning, and how these affect positive youth development. Um, but most of my work, I take a rights-based uh, approach uh, to this work, so rec recognizing that children and youth have the right to be part of decision-making, <laughs> In, including about the design and planning of um, spaces that they're they're spending their everyday lives in. Um, and so a lot of my work involves participatory research and co-design with, with young people. Um, and as you can imagine, as, and we'll hear a little bit more uh, today, positioning children or young people as co-designers or co-researchers, I get a lot of skepticism, a lot of pushback. Um, um, and I'm, tr you know, a few contemporary design students really get exposure to or um, their training to how to effectively work with uh, groups, including young people. So um, that's an experience I try to provide for a lot of my students through my teaching and, and my research. And so I'm um, really excited to hear about uh, the programs and hear from the speakers um, today, hopefully keep informing my own work. Um, so we're going to start, um, I'm going to quickly introduce um, our speakers and uh, the representatives of the uh, pathway programs that we're going to um, be exposed to through some videos today. Uh, we'll go through our um, our presenters, and then we'll have a discussion at the end, which will include some representatives from those those programs. Um, and we'll have lots of time for for discussion. So our first uh, speaker today um, is going to be Anya Sorota, uh, who's a Ukrainian-born architectural designer and educator. Um, Anya is an associate professor and associate dean at the University of Michigan's Tubman College of Architecture and Urban Planning, and is the founding principal of Akalaki, uh, an award-winning practice of architects and urban designers specializing in public space and cultural infrastructure. Uh, secondly, we're going to be inviting uh, Jess Myers uh, to speak, who is an urbanist and assistant professor of architecture at Syracuse University whose practice includes work as an editor, writer, podcaster, and curator. 
Her personal interests and research engage multimedia platforms as a means to explore politics and residency in urban conditions. Our third speaker, who is going to be um, joining us via Zoom, uh, for a recording via Zoom, but will be available uh, later for our discussion, is Curry J. Hackett. Uh, he's a transdisciplinary designer, public artist, and educator. And his practice, Wayside, synthesizes cultural and ecological narratives to envision meaningful work in the public realm. Uh, currently, Hackett is completing a Master's of Architecture in Urban Design um, at the Harvard Graduate School of Design and is a core member of the Anti-Racist Design Justice School, Dark Matter University, um, and has taught um, at several universities besides. Um, our fourth presenters, uh, we did have a fourth presentation uh, planned today and a couple of those um, presenters were not able to join us, so we aren't going to have a formal presentation from them. Um, this is from the Sweetwater Foundation, but we do have um, one of the representatives, um, Andrew Epps, who's here with us and will join our moderated discussion. So Andrew is an Urban Ecology Fellow in Residence at Sweetwater Foundation and a recent graduate of the Master's Degree Program in Regional Planning from Cornell. So welcome back, Andrew. Um, and as a fellow, um, Andrew is performing a whole range <laughs> of activities, including um, listed agricultural, carpentry, and research tasks. Which sounds like a great gig, so. Um, okay, so we are going to move on to uh, introducing the representatives from our programs. Um, so we have, uh, for our first um, video, we have uh, Tori Smith and Zane Amuser here. Uh, Tori Smith is a Detroit-based designer, artist, educator, and co-director of the University of Michigan program, ARC Prep. Her investigations span from environmental justice and design biology to storytelling and urban placemaking. So welcome to her. Um, and Zane uh, Abusair is a lecturer and DEI faculty lead in architecture, teaching the undergraduate program at Tubman College of Architecture and Urban Planning, so at uh, Michigan. And her work explores the potentials of architectural methods of representation and analysis in spatializing and unfolding scenes of changed and unsettled sites. Our second uh, program, um, our representative is Katie Zaya, uh, who's an educator and architect living and working in Baltimore. She co-teaches 10th, 11th, and 12th grade architecture pathway classes at the Baltimore Design School. Um, a Baltimore City Public Transformation School, sorry, that's um, the Baltimore Design School is a Baltimore City Public Transformation School, uh, and she's also taught at Morgan State University and Maryland Institute College of Art. Um, Katie is, was a fellow at Princeton and developed, instructed the Princeton Arc Prep program. program. Uh, and finally, our third program representative is Kiki Cooper, who will, I think, also be joining us by Zoom. Did I miss that? Is it Katie? Uh, Kiki's on Zoom, yes, okay. Um, so Kiki is a designer activist, organizer, and facilitator. Uh, they are a core member of the Design as Protest Youth and the Dark Matter University and currently attending Harvard Graduate School of Design, working toward a Master's of Landscape Architecture in Urban Design and a Master's in Design Studies in Publix. So it's very busy. So, uh, so welcome to all of our speakers and representatives. Really looking forward to our session and I'm going to pass it to our first presenter, Anya. Thank you so much for the introduction and also for the opportunity to join this conversation. It's um, uh, really a pleasure to reconnect with old colleagues and uh, meet uh, new ones that are part of uh, the effort to think about the future of education through the prism of uh, diverse, uh, robust, experimental and uh, inclusive process in, in education. I'm also uh, very, very pleased to be joined by such a robust cohort from the University of Michigan, uh, both instructors who are currently teaching, student, uh, students who have graduated, uh, faculty that have completed the program and contributed immensely to it. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, prior to starting a conversation about aesthetics and pluralism and early design education, I just wanted to take a moment um, to acknowledge that we are in a scenario, a public scenario, a global scenario of, is it too far? Okay, I'm gonna just bring my notes over. Watch this, I'm gonna probably, 
How's, how's that? Are we better? So much better. I was, the last five minutes was about how grateful I am. <laughs> um, and um, I just wanted to, to also uh, acknowledge that we are in a very complex global scenario and that we're facing um, a level of intangible grief among people, uh, dehumanization, trauma. Uh, currently, people are facing um, massacre, ongoing struggle. And it almost seems difficult to justify a conversation about aesthetics, particularly when uh, no one's blood is uh, darker or redder than another. But despite this current scenario, I am uh, confident that we can move forward with a conversation that addresses this concept of aesthetics because it is uh, undivorceable from politics and from social constructions and it informs the very questions of access to the foundations of design education. Specifically, I hope that we can spark a conversation around the societal role and the purpose of aesthetic practices in instructional methods, pedagogical strategies that embrace diverse perspectives and shared visions, and the possibility of nurturing an open-ended, pluralistic, culturally contingent aesthetic as the potential pathway toward a future of coexistence built upon the premise of universal access to aesthetic generation and the meanings that it embodies. It is also a conversation I hope to spark about the acceptance of cultural sig signification as a form of intelligence. Exploring the intersection of aesthetic discourse and pedagogy demands a departure from what we understand as commonplace interpretations of the term rooted in popular culture in the pop stratosphere that's sort of turbo boosted by social media and the concept encompassing an array of visual ideals related to beauty, from cosmetic application videos to printed media, bike pimping, and fast fashion hacks. A perfunctory exploration of Aesthetics Wiki, a tool that many of my colleagues use abundantly, reveals a robust repository of both digital and tangible aesthetic categories aggregated through devoted open source identification through observation, cataloging, and visual patterns. A surface scan of the index under the letter A includes agro people, Adam Punk, Australian Outback, Anglo Core, Alien, and Afrofuturism, all presented in an ever exhausting but also ever expanding vibe catalog. Reflecting on aesthetic discourse in terms of its social function and its potential to challenge our foundational beliefs and common perceptions about architecture's disciplinary conventions calls for a historic and theoretical contextualization. We might turn to the insights fostered over the previous decade by critics like Mark Foster Gage with ideals and ideas profoundly inflected by Jacques Rancière and other continental thinkers. Gage's 2023 publication, Aesthetics Equals Politics, suggests that aesthetics perceived as a broad lens through which to view, quote, the relationships between humanity and the forms of its expressed reality, unquote, could emerge as the central conversation for civic and societal emancipation. Gage points out that during the 19th century, aesthetics divorced, aesthetic discourse was marked by a clear division. On the one hand, there were those concerned about morality, authenticity, resistance to the dehumanizing effects of industrialization, and on the other hand, aesthetics ventured into a domain untouched by ethical, economic, political considerations, solely chasing beauty and pleasure. This latter perspective, termed as cultural anesthesia or illusory discourse, delaminated for a time aesthetics from pressing political and ethical realities. Grasping both these standpoints in parallel shines a light on the concealed truths and driving forces be behind what we might seem as innate and frames the analytical endeavors championed well over a century later by post-structuralist intellectuals. And so by contrast in the 20th century and arguably continuing today, though with distinct nuances, one can identify myriad artistic practices rooted in a profound critique of aesthetic content as the modality of, of obfuscation. These practices prioritize conceptual understandings and strive to uncover the deeper truths 
that lie behind mere visual appearances. Post-structuralist discourse on aesthetics, especially where representation is concerned, have gradually become viewed as an unmasking of underlying power dynamics and the socio-cultural and economic forces that shape our society. These realities often elude all but the most discerning intellectuals and artists deeply immersed in their craft, the intellectual elite. So as Gage and Rancier note, contemporaneity is post-critical, demanding a transition from engagement rooted in critical theory toward ones that resonate with a revived and broadened comprehension of aesthetics. This isn't just about art and isolation that we must be considering, but collective forms of palpable experience. By opening the dialogue to diverse voices, the discourse on aesthetics and by virtue of its interconnectivity to our design disciplines more broadly, may aim to foster more sanguine, more sincere linkages to issues of identity, community, societal interaction, social construction. So rather than just acting as a superficial curtain, aesthetic practice can rise as a bedrock of ideas, emphasizing human rights, championing social justice, pondering existential truths through first-hand sensorial experiences in pursuit of equity. Theorists like Ritzvana Bradley, especially in her recent work, Anti-Aesthetics, Black Aesthetics, and the Critique of Form, express deep reservations about the strategic rekindling of aesthetic discourse. She underscores the complexity of our present age with its intricate balance between the fading era of liberal racial um, portrayal and the rising tide of racial colonial revival. These dynamics sometimes harmonize, but they often clash. Within their juxtaposition, where extraction and containment stand side by side, the black experience struggles to find place in modern aesthetics, their theories as well as practices. This not only affects, but also restricts the ways in which black existence and artistic exp expression aspire to advocate for emancipatory ideals within the standard structures of modernity, modernity and its institutions. From 2017 to 2021, I held the position of the director of the architecture preparatory program at the University of Michigan. And uh, this initiative, which the former associate dean, Milton Curry, so uh, cleverly and clearly teed up, was the collaboration uh, of the college with uh, the public school department uh, at the, at, uh, in, in Detroit. And it offered juniors from Detroit Public Schools a very comprehensive, as you could see from, from the last presentation, semester-long college preparatory course that focused essentially on architecture, urbanism, and studio design. Since it was established in 2015, U, uh, UM's Art Prep has continuously offered sessions for high school credit and free of charge that spanned three hours daily and five days a week throughout the semester. From its inception, the program aimed to expand career possibilities, to cater to anticipated professional demands, to introduce diverse perspectives in the realm of architecture, planning, and design. Art Prep is especially geared towards students who are often underrepresented in American architectural institutions and consequently in the profession writ large. So in other words, the program was designed to equip students with the essential critical skills to navigate established institutional pathways within design education and the profession by replicating in some ways the disciplinary modalities of representation and communication at a very high level of resolution and expertise. As an educator with a deep affinity for the tr transformative potential of alternative pedagogies, I was drawn to challenge the deep-seated conventions reminiscent of what Rancier labeled as the explicative order, or Paolo Freire criticized as the banking model of education, where students are conceived as vessels to be filled with information. While it's a utopian attitude, uh, challenging this notion of a hierarchical expertise can pave the way for mitigating the adverse effects of traditional pedagogical approaches. From 
quashing individual uh, potential to reinforcing systemic equity, inequity. Furthermore, it necessitates a reevaluation of current architectural standards of beauty, aesthetics, composition. This entails adapting a more fluid aesthetic approach in sync with the evolving societal representation of our profession. So concretely, what does this mean? Altering the aesthetics of normalization and restoration calls for diverse voices, spanning from art to civic leadership to gardening to activism as a counterbalance to the prevailing orthodoxies of our design profession. It calls for a consideration of the spaces that we work in, the chairs that we sit in, the modalities of participation, the soundscapes of our studio environments. It requires suspending our certitudes and working deeply with students to elevate their perceptions and their experiences, to offer new narrative tools of self-expression, to share in agency. It starts by turning to expertise very much outside of our field, like master carver and assemblage artist David Philpott, whose introduction of ornamentation captivated our students during a lecture and workshop in 2017, one year before he passed away. Taking the design conversations outside of the studio into spaces coded through cultural specificity allows our students to work in collaboration with community organizations in situ, developing an understanding of their aesthetic standards and their aspirations. It necessitates engaging with cultural leaders to grasp the material and financial limitations that shape modes of cultural expression resistant to universalism and their inherent ability to convey narratives in the face of contextual challenges. It also requires a kind of de-emphasis um, on productivity and formalism. It transforms momentarily the studio into a space of experimentation, both, both corporeal, but also having to do with what it, what it means to collectively experience a sensorial environment. And here it's a workshop led by a yoga teacher, Imani Smith. So let's uh, take even a further deeper dive into the question of the scenographic value of constructing this kind of space for a more liberatory experimentation uh, with questions of aesthetic production, down to the furniture piece, down to the Chiavari chair, which is a classic seating option that was designed in the 1800s in Italy. But it's, it's a chair that's captured the hearts of event organizers, of wedding planners, of uh, church communities worldwide, maybe for its elegance, um, maybe for its gold dazzle. It's characterized by a slender frame. It has bamboo-like legs. Um, and it's not that comfortable to sit in. You might use a cushion, but it's a beloved artifact in um, community organization meetings throughout Detroit. Art Prep's chairs for community events were donated by fellow citizen, a Detroit-based social impact design organization led by James Lesko and Stephen Gliotto, and again, down to the tonality of the chair in order to create the ambiance, the atmosphere, and the, the, the recognition uh, of, of a scenario that's no longer just bound to modern aesthetics. Uh, our work with students involves engaging the designer as a scale figure in a collectively constructed environment. It's about the question of collaboration, collectivity, but also uh, working together in order to uh, produce what students believe uh, represents a contemporary vibe. Um, it deconstructs the heroicism of the modern architect uh, as a single figurehead in the production of form or in the production of space, uh, and asks students to work together on alternate realities that they co-curate. Um, there's an agnosticism in the approach to digital technology, play, abstraction, and humor. Uh, and here, work that was produced by students in 2019 that flip the question of the datum literally on its head. 
and of course your very own uh, associate professor Susan Lettieri uh, working with students on an installation about um, how to bedazzle, uh, to use the bedazzled taste of students' fashion sensibilities in order to create a scenographic backdrop uh, for, their, uh, for their collective imaginaries. Um, these are workshops, uh, images that are drawn from workshops where we lean into our faculty um, at Taubman College and ask them to participate in a voluntary measure in order to create mediated analog productions with pop cultural interplays, visual antics between the personal, the culturally coded, and the projective experience. There's product design as a source of discursive political interest in a workshop led by doctoral students, where in this case, the student Sarah uh, Shaw Nichols imagines the symbolic potential of a chocolate um, company that stands in for the rich materiality of an equitable urban future. Even thinking about the pandemic and what it takes to take that and transition the experience online, taking cues from the student's desk to replicate the exuberance and chaos uh, of what happens physically into the digital realm. And enrolling the full mess of contemporaneity in the context of disembodied pandemic inflected production, here are the outcomes of a mask making exercise uh, that lent a sense of agency to students. Uh, in a time of, of sort of great social distress. So uh, an image of a graduation scene, and I, I'm hoping this will help us wrap up. Um, but in this scene, what you see in the background, uh, one is Emily Rogers, a local DJ and um, a bassist uh, from Detroit, as well as Tiffany Brown, the invited speaker, uh, who's, who's there to encourage students uh, to think about the plurality of possible pathways uh, for their design education. But again, constructing a space of uh, radical inclusion that um, mitigates some of modernity's uh, challenges and offers a way to recount the power, prowess, and possibility of uh, design education and its relationship to uh, the environment, the built environment. This requires an alumni network uh, it, in, in, it requires us to embrace that students don't always want to go to the University of Michigan, and we have to be happy with that. But it also inflects the ways that we have begun teaching at the University of Michigan at the undergraduate and graduate levels. These are images from our TV lab, where we use some of the, we've engaged some of the lessons learned about personal narrative, scenography, where students tell us about their, um, their identities, their backgrounds, by choreographing stage sets in the digital environment uh, that, that replicate things that are important to them and begin to engage in this aesthetic discourse about the future of education. And so ARC Prep has created a reciprocal, symbiotic relationship between our college programs and our pathway program. It, it's integrating a pluralist range of voices into our lectures, workshops, installations, forums, techno demos, hybrid experiments. And as ARC Prep has demonstrated pathways to intentionally dissolve the academic silos stacked vertically and horizontally, the program's impacts all of our institutional educational models. It helps our graduate students learn how to teach. It supports faculty working in Detroit by offering access to research experts. It invites artists into multivalent conversations at the, at the college. And it um, celebrates exuberance and experimentation. And so um, this works, again, across programs. And it, it's, a, it's a way to, to center ideas of joy, of collectivity, into a collective future of education, not solely based on uh, diversifying our college, but changing the very ways that we think about education at the undergraduate and graduate level. It takes a village. Uh, thank you to all of our faculty that uh, collaborate and participate in this uh, ongoing, close to decade-long experiment. Uh, thank you to the incredibly uh, energetic, uh, selfless fellows who run and teach this program. 
to our professional partners that enable our students to move on uh, and experiment in the professional world, uh, but also to our institutional partners uh, and to our academic partners, among them um, Cornell University that accepts students into their summer program after they've graduated from art prep. Thank you for all that and um, look forward to the conversation. The mission and specific aspirations of Art Prep since its start in 2014 has really been focused on engaging and introducing Detroit public high school students to architecture, planning, landscape, all types of design. They also get to work with community partners in the city of Detroit, which I think is really incredible. Their semester project focuses specifically on engaging in their home city. Of course, the community partners are excited as well because they get to work with students who are really talented and excited. And all of that energy is, is what Art Prep is about. When I first joined the program, I thought that architecture was only about drawing and making buildings, but that's like, that's not it. Like, I still start to understand how much our, our environment is influenced by architecture and like things that architects really do. It's important to focus on the other person and what they really want. And it's a selfless career. It's challenging, but I think that actually makes it more interesting. And I did have a lot of fun. So I also learned um, placemaking and site. So before doing this project, I had to research um, what were the native plants, the people that lived there, what were the things around the site. And I felt that was important because you have to understand how the spaces that you are designing fit into the community. The program is really like, it's not only beneficial for like, if you want to go into architecting, but it's also beneficial for like something else that you want to do. Say if you want to go in like graphic design, or like, you know, Different, different type of creative stuff. Things opened me up to just different things. It showed me um, a different type of career choice, I guess you could say. So I like that, and it's not just architecture, we do all kinds of different stuff, like college essays and going to do the music video is really fun. And it, it just, you know, opened me up to maybe, maybe I don't want to do engineering like I originally thought it would, and maybe I don't want to do that. So it's definitely changing my perspective on a lot of things in my life right now. Hi, my name is Jess Myers. Um, I'm a assistant professor at Syracuse, just started. Um, I am going to be talking about the influences, uh, the pedagogical influences for a course that I was teaching for about three, three and a half years at RISD, um, since I'm pretty brand new at Syracuse. I think that Often when we imagine uh, alternative pedagogical practices, sometimes we cite that in a very contemporary moment. But I really want to talk about and uplift, um, first of all, the career of Elizabeth Catlett, who um, is very well known as an artist, but less well known for her work as a pretty subversive uh, teacher in a lot of different contexts in a uh, pre-Brown uh, versus the Board of Education world. So just to talk a little bit about Catlett's um, artistic practice, she was born in uh, DC in 1915 and uh, is often historicized alongside uh, some famous husbands that she had but uh, I think we can leave them in the marginality uh, uh, today and instead focus on the fact that she was coming up at, as an artist in a time and in spaces where revolutionary arts movements were extremely influential on black artists and black work. So uh, one amongst them being, of course, um, the Mexican muralists of the period 
one being Diego Rivera, this um, being an excerpt from the enormous mural um, Man at the Crossroads, which of course Rockefeller famously had chiseled off <laughs> after he commissioned it um, because of a lot of the complex and radical politics that this image um, portrayed. But both this artwork and also the, uh, let's say, uh, discourse that it raised in its period became extremely influential for different black arts movements and ways of teaching arts in black communities. Um, so Catlett herself had also traveled to Mexico and often is um, mistakenly identified as a Mexican architect, artist because she had been, uh, for the work that I am about to talk about, an exile to Mexico and for uh, decades had not been allowed back into the country for the type of teaching she had been doing. Um, this is one of her um, lithographic series really speaking to um, the anti-lynching uh, period where um, lithographs like this were shown beside other artists and modernists like Isimo Noguchi, who was also creating anti-lynching um, works. But to speak more specifically about her pedagogical practice, um, Elizabeth Catlett, as soon as she uh, finished her art degree, went right into teaching. So teaching and practice were hand in hand for her for her entire career. Um, she, some of these colleges we've already discussed um, in previous uh, presentations, but everywhere she went, she both, she placed pedagogy at the center of not just political um, organizing, but also what it meant to practice as an artist. At Prairie View College, she, in just one year, uh, took students along with her to desegregate museums. Um, in the Southside uh, Community Art Center in Chicago. Um, she participated with other artists who would essentially uh, follow the one black artist that had been allowed into art school at the time and they would take those lessons that whoever was learning would do and would start a, uh, this art center that was not just for you know, students who were coming up from high schools are going into college, but was really for people's education, so workers' education at the time. So we've been talking a lot um, this morning about um, youth education, but what Elizabeth Catlett was also a huge proponent of was continuing education and education for folks who had no access to it and also had to work in order to uh, sustain a life for themselves and sustain a family. She was also uh, active at Dillard University in um, New Orleans, um, and then later on, uh, after her exile, um, would teach in Mexico City. But the uh, school that I want to talk about the influence that she really had is George Washington Carver School in Harlem. Um, and keeping in mind this time period is the late 1930s, early 1940s, and Washington Carver School was also called a people's institution where workers could pay as little as two or three dollars to take courses in philosophy, in economics, and in uh, craft and in art making. So a course that uh, Catlett taught that is, uh, made her quite famous at that school was called How to Make a Dress. She taught this to domestic workers um, working usually the um, circuit in Harlem. And at the time, if you were working as a, a, a black domestic worker in usually white households, you would stand on, outside on a street corner. You would wait for usually the woman of the house to come to that corner. And you would hope that they would pick you for a day of work. The, one of the struggles of this type of sort of peripheral work was that you needed to look a certain way in order to be chosen by the wealthier houses, uh, by wealthier um, women. So what would happen is that often folks would not have the dresses that were 
nice enough to be chosen and you know in many communities would pass around one dress to different households in order for folks to be able to get work so by teaching the how to make a dress workshop not only was she responding to a need that uh, workers had at that time, but she was also using dressmaking as a way to teach political economy that situated domestic workers within their own position and their own relationship to their employers. So for example, as she was teaching, uh, okay, you're choosing a lace collar for your, uh, for your dress what do you think that communicates to your employer? Why do you think that creates a certain hierarchy of de desirability um, uh, as you're, you're waiting to be chosen on, on the street? And these conversations would essentially allow uh, workers the capacity to say, to tie their work to these broader discourses um, of essentially radical organizing and questioning that uh, positionality that they had been sort of uh, cornered into by this particular uh, type of work. Now, some people might recognize this methodology or sort of associate this methodology more famously with the pedagogy of the oppressed, but it's important to uh, know that these, uh, this type of people's education actually predates um, the pedagogy of the oppressed by about 20 years, maybe a little bit more than, than 20 years. And at the same time, these types of schools in places like Harlem and New Orleans and Chicago um, were also being influenced and influencing international movements of workers' education, of people's education. So uh, Yugoslavian um, ideas of people of workers' education, Mexican ideas of workers' education, Caribbean ideas of workers' education were all flowing through um, these schools. And also folks who were teaching here were going to those places and, and teaching what was coming out of workshops uh, that were being taught in places like the George Washington Carver School. At the same time, um, as this period or as this education is made available, one of the most important domestic workers' uh, organizations and strikes uh, really changed the working conditions for domestic workers at the time, which was all from their perspective. They were the leaders of that movement. Um, uh, women who were at the most precarious positions in the margins really lifted themselves um, and people's uh, schools, uh, people's education was a huge part or hub of that organizing. So I would say that for me, this style of connecting very firmly making to a political economy was very influential to me as I was coming into what is it to put together a curriculum for studio. So to uh, jump forward, almost 100 years, less than, a little less than that, to um, uh, another huge influence on the way that I thought about studio pedagogy um, is Adrian Marie Brown, of course, um, a, uh, someone who really thought about and isolated the skill set of facilitation as a part, a, a critical part of pedagogy. Now, a lot of Adrian Marie Brown's uh, scholarship also focuses on um, uh, Afrofuturist, uh, black sci-fi, black fi science fiction as a means of thinking about how to create, um, how, do you, how to co-constitute environments with students um, that really take their experiences uh, seriously as a means of talking through their positionality um, and what is important to them. So for example, Parable of the Sower um, is, a, is a novel that is so jam-packed with vision of tying together what would be a, a concluding uh, sort of um, dispersal of the politics that Butler was seeing in her time. And uh, Adrian Marie Brown really used this, this novel um, through the work that she did in Octavia's Brood to push 
push into a um, method of facilitation that became emergent strategy. And one of the most helpful things from emergent strategy for me was the facilitation guide where she would establish a means to co-constitute the environment of a, of a classroom with her students. So for example, would really think through can you tell me what were the most productive classrooms you've ever been in? And what were the least productive? And what are elements of that that we can agree with, with each other in order to sort of not just use the sort of university's general code of conduct as a means of how are we going to relate to each other in the classroom, but by coming up with the type of relation that students would like to hold and share um, in the classroom, and then hold each other accountable to that. So it allows for students to have both a sense of power in a classroom, but also, and very crucially, a sense of responsibility for the, the type of environment that a classroom would hold. Right? So a last sort of example that I wanted to, that I want to use in this case is works within scholarship within architecture that relies on um, essentially interview tools, research tools from the social sciences. So in both Dana Cuff's Architecture, the Story of Practice and uh, Laurie Brown's uh, Contested Spaces, which focuses on research of, on a, abortion clinics, women's shelters and hospitals, um, both of these books rely on um, research instruments like interview, survey, uh, and and um, sort of humanities uh, style research uh, as well as policy based research um, and tie it back to design decisions. So here um, I would argue that architecture, which I, I think a few people have talked about, is very strange within the academy, right? It sort of started off as a trade, of course, that slips into an atelier structure within a Western model. So we're talking Beaux Arts here. We're also talking the uh, a sort of Bau uh, Bauhaus model as well, um, and then starts to move and push, especially in our contemporary movement, I mean, towards being situated within um, STEM, right? So close closer alignments with engineering closer alignments with the technical aspects uh, of architecture. Now we've already had a bit of a discussion about what this can yield in terms of practices that are really looking for a uh, more formalist approach to pedagogy. And I think it's really important to also understand like where a hyper-formalist perspective is coming from, right? Often folks were trying to, uh, as we were talking earlier in Anna's presentation, divorce themselves from the, uh, let's say, requirements of loyalty in uh, religious communities, as well as in uh, politi certain uh, political environments. So to say that because this is a hyperformalist model, we are not approaching those things and therefore don't have to be held to standards of morality or of political purity, correct? But at the same time, that type of shield can also be used to practice for whatever type of client that you would like, but maintain a shield of liability that says that because this is my client and it's not me uh, that espouses certain ideals, um, I shouldn't be criticized or held liable for certain things. So both of those practices are true within the question of a hyperformalist model. So it's, you know, I I'm never one to say like, let's absolutely banish this, the idea of formalism because let's understand like what it was trying to avoid, but it's also important to understand what it, also, what it gets it used for as well. So I think that within the uh, question of, sort of social sciences and the humanities, we can come back to that sense of how do we uh, imbue the formal with also a sense of responsibility uh, towards the um, sort of life and, and behaviors that certain architecture is espousing, right? So all of this is, uh, I think, a, a long prelude to talk a little bit about a course that I um, taught at RISD uh, called Cities, Core 3. Very boring, <laughs> very matter of course that all um, MARC students would have to take in their second year. 
So cities had been under the guidance of uh, many different faculty. Um, some wanted to take on a more mega scale or infrastructural approach. Others wanted to take on um, more questions of public commons. For me, when I was asked to take over Core 3, what I wanted to do was focus on public housing as a means to essentially force the conversation on how do these questions of political economy influence form. So uh, the course takes unfolds in three parts. One is a requirement to compare uh, American public housing site um, to either a private site, which we did in the, in the New York version of this course, or to public housing from another, uh, uh, another context. So public housing that emerged from another set of policies in, in, in a different context. Um, after that point, the students would have to pair off um, and choose one of the sites that they had been researching in the first exercise and to write an RFP based on what they knew of tenant organizing on the site that they were talking about. So when I say, uh, like, again, look for the efforts of tenant organizing, it didn't just mean turn to an academic catalog um, that exists on the site, because often that was not the case. Like, what was happening in tenant organizing was not captured in that way. You could turn instead to uh, blogs, you could turn to uh, people's Instagram accounts, you could turn to the YouTube channel that someone asked their grandma to put together, things like oral histories that were being captured, and really listen in them not for just a laundry list of improvements that needed to happen on uh, different public housing sites, but also histories of how certain aspects of these sites, particularly maintenance, had been abandoned over time, and to have discussions on why that was. So one of the first questions that I asked as students came into this class was, how did you first become aware of public housing? And the responses that I would get from students would be things like either, oh, my parents told me never to go there, or I heard this in a Jay-Z song, or um, I heard this on the news, often identified as a place not to go, right? But I've also had students that told me, oh, my grandparents lived in public housing, or my best friend was in public housing, or I lived in public housing for a period of time, right? So you have that conversation in the same class to also think about when we are divorced from, what is the need or what inspires the effort, the political will it takes to bring public housing into being, how do the fact that often we are still caught up in a uh, culture war of 100 years ago on, over public housing, how does that affect the way that you pr approach it as a designer? Indeed, how, do, how can we look at existing public housing for what designers felt that people deserved in public housing, right? So this image here is from a first exercise of a student comparing um, Stapleton, which was a housing development in uh, Staten Island, on the east side of Staten Island, NYCHA development, to a housing development in uh, Stockholm from the Million Program, uh, and really talking about these two sets of policies that brought about um, public housing using very similar materials, but how did they come to be and exist and live in these communities, this type of housing? Who applied for this type of housing? Who used it? Who fought for this type of housing? That kind of question, these kinds of questions. Um, the next, this is an example from the uh, Chicago um, studio. Uh, from the second exercise, it was really thinking about the, um, essentially what were uh, tenants looking for, or asking, asking for at this um, site, Dearborn Homes in, in Chicago. Um, and one of the things that we did uh, with this site was we read some Gwendolyn Brooks poetry. Because you can really see in Gwendolyn Brooks' perspective on Chicago, a post-occupancy study of these types of of this type of housing, um, and in it, uh, students were able to track using both 
things from poetry to people's TikTok accounts um, to Flickr accounts to films to uh, recordings of local tenants meetings, organizing to see how these elements all had scraps, pieces, points of stories that led to, ah, okay, from for the last 30 years, no one has fixed the elevator in this building, right? And to be able to really track that through different media over time. Um, this last one is I will show is a response to, so a, a, something that I forgot to mention is a part of the class is that they have to exchange RFPs with each other and respond to those RFPs. So this is a response to another student's RFP on Farragut houses in, um, Brooklyn, North Brooklyn by the Navy Yard, if you're familiar with the borough at all. Um, basically trying to think about both ways to uh, create more housing on the site, but also to bring back uh, all of these services that had been promised on the site and on many uh, NYCHA sites um, in New York um, that came at a time when political will was strong for building and maintaining public housing. Um, and as that will waned, um, those services uh, left and many of those things like um, childcare, things like um, community centers um, disappeared and were now being used for storage. So students were sort of coming into that space and reimagining it. And all of this is to say that, again, like other presentations have uh, mentioned before, it's important to look outside of architecture for pedagogical practices that have existed over time and can be so useful to us. Um, people's educate things like people's education or the push towards facilitation or an understanding of uh, social sciences research instruments can weave together into conversations that really transform not just the subject of a studio but the way that that studio is conducted so to really sit with my students and ask them what is the most successful studio experience you've ever had and how can we hold ourselves including me including you holding me to that standard at the same time how do you show up to this studio not just looking to make the nicest drawing that anyone has ever seen, but to show me that that drawing is really being produced off of the research and conversations that we've been having, right? Um, so I guess I'd like to, to um, conclude just with some references that were really helpful to me as I was working through these. Uh, both these slides and sort of um, this thinking. I particularly like to thank uh, Christina uh, Heatherton, who has done an extensive amount of research on Elizabeth Catlett as a part of her research on um, the sort of Mexican Revolutionary Arts period, um, and is one of the few writers who allows her to sort of stand on her her own feet as both an artist but also as a, a teacher, uh, and brings together those three identities of, of sort of teacher, artist, and and um, uh, an activist that she held. Um, so I'm gonna uh, conclude here, but I thank you so much for having me and also um, thank you to the previous presentations that really I think provoked and, and made me think about my own slides in a different way. I think the impact of our program is creating that community within the school and and linking them into a greater community that is architecture in the world, whether they go into architecture or whether they're going to just go back into the world and use their design thinking skills to be a better person, to be a better thinker, a better designer. Really, that's the impact of our program on the school as well as in the greater community. I think the intent was to just give kids an experience that they can get at any other high school and show them just the different careers that are out there waiting for them. I've learned that architecture isn't just, you know, one thing, it's actually an umbrella and that there's a bunch of different branches to architecture, so you can really just find whatever you like. My next steps after graduating high school is to go to Morgan and pursue my architecture master's. The aspiration of the program really is in line with the mission of the school and that we're trying to give students different ways to think about space, different ways to engage with the community, 
um, ways to use the creative juices they already have to make the world a little bit better. Less than 2% of, of registered architects are African Americans, and that is wildly out of proportion with the percentage of population it should be. And so part of our mission is thinking about like, how do we make sure that students in Baltimore, many who are African American, are getting access to a good design education and are aware of what architecture is, have role models in architecture, um, can envision themselves as architects. One thing we think a lot about is what is the pathway for our students after they graduate from here? If they do want to be architects, how can we support them through that path to make it more accessible to more people? Ideally, we're hoping that our program, with our partnership with Morgan, we're hoping that more of our students are able to become high quality students at Morgan that are going to be highly successful and then graduate and work in Baltimore, ideally, that they're working and giving back to the city that, um, that educated them and got them ready to be architects. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Kerr J. Hackett. I'm calling from Cambridge, Massachusetts. By the time you all see this, I would have traveled to London for an exhibit. Uh, I really wish I could have joined you all there in person, but I'm super excited to be a part of the discussion today. Uh, today, I'll be talking about the everyday. Um, lately, I've been using words, other words to describe the everyday, like mundane and quotidian and, and even banal somewhat ironically. I I am just really fascinated with the cultures that are produced at the scale of the everyday. Um, I just feel like that there is not only so much rigor and sophistication, but there's a lot of intent there. And there's a lot of relevance to architecture that goes understudied. And so I, I think the last few years uh, have been concerned with how might we look to the everyday uh, everyday cultural productions, especially those of Black folks, to inspire new ways of building, new ways of learning, new ways of teaching, new ways of practicing. So this is Everyday Pedagogies. I'd like to ground this conversation just a bit in a certain geography and way of, of, of showing up in the world. Um, so I, if I can be a bit autobiographical for a second, uh, I grew up in a small town in southern rural Virginia called Farmville. You can think of this as being in the kind of uh, foothills of Appalachia. There's a small farming village out just outside of Farmville called Prospect, uh, in which my mother's side of the family has stewarded and cultivated land for several generations dating back to the 19th century. Uh, these two photos are from that place, that farmland. The photo on the left is showing a repurposed um, bathtub and, and sinks that are have been used as, as planters. If you're from the rural South, you've probably seen something like this before. The photo on the right is just me helping my great grand, my great uncle uh, feed some chickens on that land. And uh, I think both of these photos together kind of signify two things for me. Uh, Ingenuity, right? Just the idea that we are repurposing these things to such that we might uh, foster relationships with land and kinship, right? So the relationship probably not only with other family members, but even with other non-human uh, folks. So I, I think there's just a lot of, um, there, there's a lot of relationships that are, I think, being shown here that foster relationships with with not only land, but with food, with 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 plants. Um, that in turn shape a kind of cosmology in a certain way of being. And so I'm, I'm coming from this context and that's what's undergirding a lot of the how uh, and why probably that I teach. Uh, I then left Farmville to go to DC to, for undergrad. I ended up at Howard University, which is of course a historically black institution founded just a couple of years after the American Civil War in 1867. This is a place, uh, you're looking at a, an aerial view of the upper quadrangle. Of course, almost nobody calls it that. We call it simply the yard. Uh, this is a place that historically has been, I think, a place of great refuge for Black folks. This, you know, Black folks are just 
can often be found here just living uh, un- unapologetically, right? With without, uh, I would say, a pure re- state of reaction to uh, whiteness. Uh, it's also a place where there is a lot of just longevity in certain cultural tropes um, that emerge on this on the, in, in this place. Uh, in this case, you've got the uh, Greek organization Omega Sci Fi. They're doing their annual kind of ritual of bringing new members in. Uh, and these are, again, traditions that are passed down from year to year. So it's interesting to think of the yard not only as a place of leisure, but actually a place literally of, of ritual. And lastly, uh, a place of joy and yes, yes surprise. This is uh, a moment where Drake made a cameo appearance here uh, on the yard during Yard Fest. So, that you know, again, very different context than Farmville, but similar in the sense that this is a space that is be- built for and by Black folks that is then shaped and reshaped at the scale of the everyday. And I put both of these places in context with each other because they constitute what I consider Black landscapes. These are places that are built for and by and with Black folks such that we might operate and exist and live and thrive uh, in abundance and with agency. Um, and so that is kind of where I'm coming from as a person. And that is also what is um, animating and shaping a lot of the the um, areas of study that I'm that I'm interested in at, at, the, at the current moment. In 2020, I joined uh, Dark Matter U, which is a BIPOC-led collective network of architecture academics and architecture practitioners. We emerged after George Floyd. We were ultimately trying to think of the ways that we might redress architecture education such that it is not purely rooted in not only whiteness, but also maleness and all these other kind of normalizing forces within our field and and really think critically about what can what we can offer uh to to this frame of of architecture school right and design education um as well as practice and so i think we're ultimately really concerned with how we might uh, engender new forms of education new forms of knowledge new forms of collectivity uh all of those things we're kind of putting on the table at the moment one of the more beautiful and formative features of this group and and being a part of this group uh, was the ability to collaborate through Zoom, uh, which is when a lot of these, how a lot of these connections took place, but also across institutions. Um, And so this played out in a couple of different scenarios, um, which I'm I'm gonna talk about here. These are both syllabi from two classes that I was able to co-teach. But um, in the the studio on the left, which was co-taught with Jaleesa Bloomberg, It was called uh, For With an Individual Practice Towards towards Collective Expression. Uh, This was taught virtually at Carleton uh, in Ottawa. Uh, And then the syllabus on the right is called Fugitive Practice. This was a discussion-based seminar um, that was trying to uh, introduce, recenter, and explore certain Black and Indigenous means of, of design and making. Um, And so that was actually taught while I was teaching at Howard um, and Jerome Hayford was teaching at Yale. And we we co-listed students from both schools to be in the same Zoom space at the same time. So both of these ideas were, I think, quite radical in terms of how we were able to pull these ideas together and then deploy them in places that we hadn't actually been to uh, much for, for terribly long. The studio for with uh, was looking at black means of performance again to try to unpack emergent ideas about what space and place can be, who shapes it, who has access to it, who maintains it, and then trying to make a case for that knowledge to be applied onto architectural practice and representation. So in this case, we were looking at everything from beating your feet to HBCU marching bands to gospel music. Uh, and trying to invite the students to discover their value uh, to to contemporary uh, architectural practice. Um, in this case, Lorraine developed her own 
notational system to try to um, how to represent double Dutch. And so in this case, this animated GIF, she's trying to set up a, a hierarchy or a relationship between the Turner and the and the jumper, right? So essentially de- uh, de- trying to develop a way of drawing something that is very fluid and that is very soft, so to speak. Similarly, Alia was uh, looking at uh, how different forms of uh, different parts of the body are moving as well as who is on stage at any given time, the movements from uh, an individual performance and how that then merges into a collective performance. Uh, this is uh, this is an analysis of Beating Your Feet, which is a dance done typically to go-go music, which is a, a genre specific to DC. So these are, again, the students are just inventing ways of drawing and trying to see uh, and, and un, uh, unearth patterns that we normally, again, would just kind of assume as not having much intent or sophistication. And then just, you know, what does it mean to try to use essentially a, um, an academic way of, of mapping something that we would normally consider as just kind of customary and non-academic? In the discussion seminar, this was uh, Fugitive Practice. We were also looking at collective forms of production. Beginning of the course, we did um, collectively or co-authored collage, which was actually inspired by quilt making. So thinking of quilting as a kind of pedagogical tool, we looked extensively at the G's Ben quilters in particular. Uh, so these are two collages that uh, were created using co-authored means even even of co co-locating, I guess, or found digital material. And another project towards the end of the semester, we invited the students to actually do one-to-one makings. In this case, uh, these students w- actually went out into the woods and were actively trying to weave in an emergent way. So they, this was, I would say, part improvisational, but also part... Uh, very intentional, right? So they're using their existing context and being in dialogue with with the landscape, and uh, and and this was also taking inspiration from the quilting, the black quilting tradition. Both of those classes, I, I can't understate how foundational they were to how I think uh, currently as a grad student here at the GSD studying urban design. But also even uh, in my teaching that I would go on to do after those initial courses, and even as a practitioner, um, that 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 a lot of my work finds itself in the public realm. Um, After teaching at Howard and teaching in those those couple of courses in DMU, I ended up teaching in person full time at the the University of Tennessee, uh, and teaching two courses that I wrote essentially from from scratch. That were you could think of those as kind of these as kind of sister classes to those first courses. One was looking at um, black and indigenous forms of mapping and kind of personal forms of cartography. So situating the body in the act of mapping. Uh, the other was looking at uh, water um, and and its place in black culture. Um, so again, one was a seminar, the other was a studio, Subjective Waters, which is what I'll expand on for a little bit. Baby, oh, I drink from the water. Baby, oh, me down by the river. Not today, one on one on water, uh, water. However you want to play, choppers on choppers on choppers, uh, yeah. Gonna lay down my head and load. All right, so hopefully the theme was was apparent there. Uh, we were looking at how water shows up in different cultural forms within the uh, Afro descendant culture. The studio started by just acknowledging that I think Black folks have a very troubled relationship with water. That, you know, as I mentioned uh, to a few folks the other day, the Atlantic Ocean has has seen some things, right, over the over the centuries. Um, and Gordon Parks is trying to capture that that kind of dark history, I think, um, and the the way that water haunts Black folks even in the present. 
Um, but he also uh, is is interested in how uh, water structures even black leisure uh, in the more contemporary sense. Um, and so the studio for a semester was trying to grapple with those tensions to then um, think about how we can uh, invite new forms of uh, new spatial conditions. The studio started with a curated list of uh, songs that dealt with water in some way, uh, all by Black artists. So in one case, uh, we might be looking at spirituals, which are typically encoded with um, means of escaping from the plantation, but using bodies of water like the Ohio River. Others were, you know, kind of protest music. Others were looking um, at water as purely as a kind of uh, uh, vernacular if you think about waves and black hair or if you think about drip in terms of ice uh, ice and, and uh, jewelry and style and then the students were then invited to um, interpret those relationships with water um, using what I called visual research uh, papers so they were trying to trying to visualize similar to that previous uh, project uh, with the, the four with studio trying to really understand what the artist uh, might have been trying to convey uh, by mentioning water in their in their songs. Those uh, analyses then informed a set of collages. Collage was used throughout the semester, not only as an outcome, like as a kind of medium, uh, but also as a way of thinking. So collage as collage as mindset, right? Collage as pedagogy. Um, and this ultimately helped to set up a variety of um, inspirations to set up, uh, to in turn set up a, a set of uh, diverse spatial conditions for the final project. We were often working in very messy kind of emergent, very uh, raw ways. So you're getting a sense of how we were uh, actively trying to organize and and find similarities in each other's work. I'm often trying in this in this particular studio trying to find ways to lead from behind and and uh, invite the students to discover value not only in their own work but in their peers' work. So this is us trying to again sort sort the work uh, in ways that might be useful for us to build on for future uh, future projects in the semester. And then we underwent a pretty rigorous uh, multi-week uh, collective drawing exercise in which the students were bouncing in and out of uh, the computer and modeling in Rhino, printing it, cutting it out, transferring it back into Rhino, doing it, doing that two or three times, and really, again, getting them comfortable with messiness and trying to unsettle the kind of Cartesian and Euclidean and frankly, Western notions of neatness and messing, uh, uh, neatness and finishedness. Um, and, and even um, I think trying to set up opportunities for collective authorship, which is definitely something that I learned or was validated through, through Dark Matter University. So in, in this case, we have, I think as many as six people working on the same drawing at the same time. And at the end of that project, uh, we uh, ended up with three groups tackling three parts of an imaginary site that we co-imagined. So it was imaginary community for about 500 people. And those three groups then jigsawed their drawing together to create a giant uh, nine, foot, uh, nine foot by nine foot drawing. Uh, and then we were also inviting the audience to incorporate uh, suggestions and 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 name certain questions that might have been raised by the the final work. So in this case, um, not thinking of or trying to set up a new relationship with time, even as it, and, and and the container of the semester, we tend to think of that as a hard start and stop. But trying to think of the final review more as a comma rather than a period. And I'll just show this image. The students thought it would be uh, funny to include me as their scale uh, model, scale figures in all of their drawings. Um, this was would have been one of my last few days in Tennessee before coming to grad school. So this was a tender moment for us to share, but also trying to, trying to show that I think I was ultimately trying to cultivate a relationship um, 
in the studio that was not purely hierarchical, right? They're they're really trying to build trust in the studio and show that there's there's things that I can be learning from the studio and and ultimately um, build a, a sense of levity um, in, in the way that we work. And so alt ultimately, this way of teaching, this way of thinking, for me, what I want to drive home is that there are feedback loops that can be set up that can contaminate how we think about practice as well, how we think about research, um, that then in, can inform certain ways of redressing the academy. Uh, so up to this point, I've talked about how we can look really wildly, I think, beyond so-called architecture to then inform how we think about architecture. Um, and similarly, that's informing how I approach even research. Um, I've been thinking a lot about kind of liminal and marginal um, spaces of refuge and refusal, like um, the Maroon communities in Jamaica, alley dwellings in DC. These are places, again, not, um, these are places of constant resistance, but also of competing interests. Um, looking at uh, Black coastal material cultures, like those of the, of the Gullah Geechee community. Looking at archival practice, even, this is a photo of, uh, of a painting from my mother, um, in which she's collaging certain memories together in, into uh, a painting. And so I just want to name here that a lot of the teaching work that I've talked about today is now starting to filter into my work here now as a, a, a graduate student at the GSD studying urban design. And I found that the questions that I ask are much deeper than they would have been, I think, if I wasn't teaching in this way with these contexts, right? In this case, I'm looking at an archive in one of the collections here in, in, in one of the libraries of a black enslaved family in Virginia that's been writing letters back and forth amongst their, their family members. And um, uh, this is a part of a, a, a class, a research-based class that I, that I took last semester in which at the end, we were invited to speculate on the history or the the nature of the collection that we that we stumbled on. Was where it was if there are these letters here in the 19th century when it would have been illegal to read and write from many um, enslaved people. How did black folks get stationary, right? Um, and so I kind of embarked on this this um, uh, probably necessary uh, study of thinking through what it might look like for Black folks to have made their own paper uh, out of readily available materials. In this case, I ended up making paper out of collard greens and okra, right? So the the I think it just, this way of thinking of looking at um, something that, looking at the familiar, bringing yourself, bringing your, all of yourself to your education or finding opportunities to uh, bring um, yourself to, to, your, to your work. I think all of that is is coming full circle for me um, as someone that is a former educator, but has now found themselves back in the academy on the other side, um, and and you know I'm continuing to to think through um, the everyday, to think through the 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 mundane, right? So these are all tools now that I might have used as a teacher that I'm having a lot of joy. Uh, bringing to my work now as a student. So I, I think there's multiple institutions, multiple things that are at stake here. There's multiple subjectivities that I would uh, that I, I would love for us to kind of invite into the so-called kind of container of architecture. I just think that there's a lot of social cultural potential here in in terms of how we how we teach and how we build. Thank you all, and uh, I, I look forward to seeing the other contributions to the to the conference. Design is protest, and the collective that was started in 2020 developed nine original demands. Those nine demands range from everything from divesting, reallocating police funding to centering community leadership in the design process to creating anti-racist models of education. And so DAP Youth is really a way for us to 
one, introduce K through 12 students to the design justice demands, all nine of them, understand how they are applicable and can be understood within the context of things that they already know. Ultimately, we want schools to take on new ways of teaching for all levels of education. We believe that the more black and brown people you have supporting stuff, the better the world will be. Um, And ultimately, we're here to help influence the next generation of designers and members of society. We invited designers from all sorts of backgrounds, architecture, graphic design, landscape design, various forms of communication, storytelling, urban planning, to come and talk about the fact that racial injustices are not just happening in the built environment, but they happen because of the built environment. One of our intentions uh, from our past experiences before coming into deaf and bringing those into deaf youth is forming a curriculum project or forming spaces that we can provide space for youth to explore and be creative and learn those tools. The ability for young people to prolong being young, prolong being curious, prolong being creative and resourceful in a way that isn't you know, tied to a specific outcome or achievement. If you go on to become an architect or not, or like there's all these other careers that impact their built environment. And you can be that person to lead that change, to bring these innovative ideas and really make the spaces just. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Some extremely, personally speaking, some very uh, provocative uh, presentations and, and videos. I'm anxious to prolong this discussion. I'm going to invite um, our speakers and representatives of the programs up and everybody else. I'm going to invite you. We've been sitting for a long time. Take, Do your seventh inning stretch. Um, stand up. Move around a little bit um, uh, so we can refocus uh, on our discussion. Okay, so thank you um, uh, so much to to our speakers and um, the programs that were represented by the videos. I'd like to uh, just give a minute or two to the representatives that are here from the programs. Um, if there's anything else you'd like to to add to to speak to to supplement um, your video, so I'll I can start with uh, uh, with Tori and group from. Uh, Sure. Yes, feel free. Um, I just want to start by saying it's it's so incredibly inspiring to be here with all of y'all and and also see the work um, that's being done by each of you and your organizations and just like the solidarity um, within this room I think is super important. So I just wanted to give space for that. So thank you um, for for inspiring me in so many ways. But uh, just adding to what's already been said by the multitude of contributors to Arc Prep over the years, which has been really incredible, and we have so many of them with us today, um, not, not even at this table. Um, but I think what Andrew was saying earlier uh, about visibility and access in the profession is so important. Um, I think the quote, if you can't see it, you can't be it, is so important. And I think it really drives a lot of the work um, that we do at Arc Prep, really connecting the students with not just mentorship, not just um, engaging them with ways to be creative, to begin to understand the built environment in new ways, ways to engage community organizations, um, but really to be able to, to see themselves as potential future architects, and I'm not going to just say architects, but maybe urban planners, landscape architects, um, fine artists. Like I think really especially myself and my uh, co-director who is incredible and is unfortunately not unable to be here today, but Salam Rita, something that we're super passionate about with the future of Arc Prep is thinking of how can we think about architecture and um, architecture and activism, architecture and um, art making, place making, um, architecture and uh, ecology. So that's something that we are able to share with the students and it's really exciting to see them engage and get into uh, the different 
fields and, and interdisciplinary moments that I think ARC Prep provides in so many ways through Anya's incredible uh, presentation and the video just showing some of the silly moments, but also uh, the moments of rigor, the moments of thought, the moments of engagement and collaboration, um, of messiness. We, we embrace all of it, so I think that's, that's really what ARC Prep is about and that's where we'd like to go. Great, thanks so much. And <laughs> anything to add? You'd like to add? Yeah, um, is this working? I think so, yeah. Um, I'd like to just add that I think something that I really admire about ARC Prep is that it, it partners with the EAEC, so the Equity and Architectural Education Consortium, in offering a really wonderful mentorship program. Uh, the mentors come from both undergraduate and graduate uh, colleges as part of the EAEC. And they work with the students uh, for a full semester in supporting um, uh, pluralistic perspectives, diverse backgrounds, and really just being there to support them from like really big questions of, you know, how to become an architect if they were interested in doing that, or if they weren't, like how do we even apply to college, how to apply to financial aid, and all of those like really big questions that I think go beyond the walls of the classroom. And I think what's fantastic about that mentorship program, it, it's part of a stack mentorship program in the AEC. So the students um, start out as being members of this kind of community of mentors and mentees. So a lot of the mentees actually go on to become mentors and even become like instructors at ARC Prep. So it's really one big um, community that they will always be a part of and find that support. Great, thanks so much. And I'm sure we'll make sure we have um, opportunity that we can direct some specific questions to you. Um, do we have Katie here? Is she with us there? Hi, welcome Katie, I can see myself. So um, if you just want to, um, uh, if there's anything that you'd like to add to speak to your, um, your program? I mean, it's really, it's been amazing to see all these presentations. I think when you're teaching every day in a K-12 setting, it can get really easy to get bogged down in the minutia of everything. Like, this person's not using their T-square correctly. Um, the district funding is very tied to how they do on certification exams. Um, there's just so many data points that we're constantly tracking that we don't often back up and think more clearly about, like, what does it mean to educate these students? Um, what kind of pedagogies are we introducing them to? is it an equitable um, pedagogy? So I think it's been really informative for me to be here. Um, yeah, and I'm here to listen to more and more. Great, thank you so much. So what I'd like to do, I'm sure that there are some uh, questions that the presentations have, um, uh, or that are gonna emerge from, from listening to these. Um, with these longer sessions, sometimes we a lot of questions sort of get focused on what we've heard last. So uh, what I want to, to start with is a, a little bit of time to direct some questions specifically to each of our, um, our speakers. Although I invite the speakers um, to feel free to respond to <laughs> the responses of, of the others. So uh, we do want this to be a nice uh, sort of organic discussion. But I'd like to invite anyone who would like to, uh, who has a question or would like to comment um, on Anya's presentation. Um, I was interested in Curry's uh, comment on rethinking this idea of time in the, ped in the kind of structural pedagogy mm -hmm. um, and finding ways to uh, reconfigure that and how we um, think about how uh, architecture responds to time but also in ideas, notions of productivity and uh, you know what constitutes success, and um, was also kind of thinking about that in, in your presentation, Anya, and how you connected to uh, you know showing that the students in this kind of like yoga session and the emphasis on productivity and formalism and aesthetics. Um, and I'm I'm wondering if you would be able to continue to to speak to that and how we can. Mm -hmm. um, structure a pedagogy that, that just thinks about productivity and outcome differently in a way that supports a more uh, equitable environment for students. Because I think that's a big part of it too. I mean, it's uh, one of the, 
I, I guess, uh, images of a, our architecture education. It's a pressure cooker and it's studio and you're up all night and you're meant to produce something. And what might look differently if we addressed that in a different way? Mm -hmm. I, I'd like to start by confessing something. <laughs> about the ARC prep program, because in situations like this, it's very easy for all of us to fall into um, a utopian positivist solutionist rhetoric. And ARC prep is kind of the perfect Petri dish for us to consider some of the harder questions because it's, it's of its longevity. Uh, it's eight years old now, and it's gone through four different distinct pedagogical models. Uh, I would say the first one that we encountered today through uh, Milton Curry's presentation, we genteelly and behind his back, I don't know if he's here, we call it the Cornell model. It's like a distinguished, well thought out, extraordinarily um, rigorous, uh, college bound model of education. Um, we followed up with a more exuberant modular structure uh, that was taught primarily through doctoral uh, student practices and uh, led heavily with a humanities, urban humanities bend. We had two years of pandemic uh, despondency and digital studies emerged as a, a leading factor. And now we are looking more toward a community facing, outward facing pedagogical model. So we've had an opportunity to test multiple iterations of how to teach. Regardless of how we teach, only one out of 10 students is interested in pursuing a design education, no, no matter how we cut it. And so we think about this often in, in this broad collective of people who contributes to, to the program. And we think maybe the problem isn't our pedagogical model or the way that we perceive time and space or the way we teach time and space. Maybe there's a problem with our profession and maybe there's a problem most broadly with our culture. And that's not something that we can fix through a pathway program directly. That doesn't mean we can't produce citizens or civic actors that can inflect the future of our world and hopefully feedback into a pedagogical model that has a better ap applicability in the future. Uh, but we just have to be honest that um, the pedagogy in and of itself, despite its exuberance and best, um, best intention, doesn't actually change the needle on uh, the outcomes in the profession. Whether you know, we're interested in time or deconstructing, uh, you know, those, those uh, the aspects of our, of our field that are profoundly modernist. I would also say that we haven't given up on form making and rigor, despite like the interest in communications, in narrative formation, in identity building and collectivity. The formal aspects of what we do are still very uh, strongly embedded in the teaching and the pedagogy across all of these experiments because um, we are keen on producing uh, students who have the power to engage or disengage at will, but are not kneecapped by not knowing how to use the tools of the trade to their interest and to, for, their, uh, for, for their empowerment. So I hope that answers your question. Um, can I just uh, respond to that too? Um, I can understand why one of the metrics is, you know, are our mm -hmm. students from these programs going into mm -hmm. um, particularly the traditional design mm -hmm. um, uh, fields? Do you do you follow up with them, like with some of these programs? Do you have the long um, the long view, especially these longer programs? Because mm -hmm. my sense is that even this exposure in these pathway programs may still be very influential in sort of non-traditional design trajectories, and I'm just curious if, if you've had the opportunity to um, sort of get this longitudinal view with some of the past participants, and if you're seeing that that experience is still influencing um, and maybe um, impacting where they end up, even if it's not in a traditional field. 
Yeah, definitely. I feel like everyone's looking at me ready to speak. Um, <laughs> yeah, sorry, but yeah, yeah. definitely. Uh, so we do, we follow up with all of our ARC Prep alumni graduates. Um, we have a great way of tracking, I mean, all the way back to um, when ARC Prep started in 2014. We have, we, we follow up, we reach out to our alumni and, and we, we want to know what they're up to, whether they're in, our, have gone through architecture school, um, whether they are practicing in the field or not, whether, I mean, ARC Prep alumni, I think across the board, are doing incredible, incredible work, whether it's at an architecture firm in Detroit or outside. I mean, we've had students um, matriculate to obviously Cornell and um, GSD and some of the other Ivies, but we've also had a lot of students stay and go to UDM and um, U of M and Lawrence Tech and, and stay local. And then we've had students who um, are not even interested in architecture, but take that uh, toolkit uh, that, that they've gained through through going through the program and whether they go on to um, become leaders in their community or um, whatever field they're interested in, I think that that toolkit affords them um, the the kind of opportunities that, that they're able to pursue. So um, yeah, we definitely follow up and even with the fellows, I think there's, there's a whole nother side to that of um, keeping in touch with everyone who has touched the program and contributed to the program in some way because I think everyone um, in some way it's like a large tapestry since we were talking about um, quilting and making but uh, I really think it is everyone contributing and staying in touch in the network um, that I think ARC Prep provides is, is incredibly important. Great, I, I have a sense for maybe some of some like stealth impacts that are happening that that um, where these programs particularly are um, or even even graduates of these design programs who may take a different trajectory are still being influenced uh, by these experiences and the approaches that you are um, exposing them to. So um, I want to, um, we'll kind of rotate a little bit here so everyone has, has a chance. Um, is there anyone that would like, has any questions, comments, particularly to um, direct to, to Jess and her presentation? Pass the mic as we have. Anyone? Um, I was going to ask um, myself just in terms of, I mean, all of the presentations, um, I have all kinds of ideas percolating um, as I try to um, integrate some of these alternate um, approaches and practices, and uh, especially when I'm engaging with even young kids um, um, in co design activities. Um, do you, so you've shifted now to uh, to Syracuse. I'm I'm curious uh, with these practices uh, and these pedagogies. I'd be curious at what the response of the the students have have been to these, particularly as they are maybe uh, contrasting them to to more traditional um, approaches and other courses. Um, but also the degree to which uh, I'm curious about resistance you may have encountered. Um, <laughs> Um, or, or devaluing of, of some of these uh, approaches, if you're seeing that within the, the culture of some of these institutions? Um, I mean, well, I would say that, you know, I'm teaching, when I was teaching at RISD, uh, RISD is a pedagogy that really pushes, like, making and making as much as you can as, uh, like, core to studio, and actually core to seminar as well. And I think that for, me, what I really wanted to emphasize is uh, criticality as a skill set of design. Um, because, not just because, you know, we love people making things, but making things with purpose, but also because I think it makes students more confident. Like when you've actually done the research and, you know, every single session of studio in these courses started with a reading discussion that a student in the seminar had to facilitate. So to really take some ownership over the research that you've done, over how it's directed you in your design, over why you are making what you're making and feeling a sense of ownership and confidence about it, but also the capacity to have someone push back on you, like for example, the reviews always had folks who had lived in the sites we were talking about or had designed for the sites that we were talking about. And to have people push back on you in a way that's just 
shows that they are invested in that site, not necessarily that they're just trying to flame you in front of an audience, as often happens in architecture. Um, gave students the confidence not to withdraw into themselves when that happened, but to really say, you know, to really take that comment and build it into discussion, as opposed to, but that's what I really wanted to do and I don't want, you know what I mean? Like, the, to really say, like, this is the design that I chose after a long time of discourse, after really putting time into research practices, because I, I do think that sometimes um, when we bring research into studio, what can happen is, you know, the same thing that can happen when we bring designers into like a community meeting, where it's like, oh, just the people in front of me that I encountered first said this one thing, so the entire design is gonna be about that, right? Mm -hmm. But to really take, this is the interviews that I've listened to, this is what I've read, this is the discussions that we, I've had in class, and I've percolated all of that together, not as just a, I think I can, respond to every single issue that exists on the site with a one-to-one -one design solution, but that I can understand that architecture is co-constituted with life, with people who live here, with people who value these sites, um, and I can try to create something or propose something on this site that's in alignment with those desires. Mm -hmm. Anyone want to comment on that? <laughs> Respond to? Oh, but I have had people say, like, this class is incredibly biased, like, in the student responses, like, the reviews mm -hmm. of the course, which, you know, it is. I'm not, like, <laughs> I, I don't shy away from my own positionality either, mm -hmm. you know? But I don't think anybody does. They're just not necessarily announcing them as a position. <laughs> yeah. I was just thinking, when you were presenting your work, um, I couldn't help but frame it against the backdrop of the current technological revolution. Mm. And the responsibility that we have um, not to create a body of laborers who are unemployable, mm. and how the positionality of a critical voice deeply embedded in the urban humanities that knows what research looks like and can address it critically might be one of those privileged people who can read, write, and think that will survive this next wave. Mm. And so, it, I don't know, I guess that's more of a comment where I was like, yeah, this, you know, 10 years ago we would have said more, more drawings, more sections, <laughs> more labor, we need to see the labor. And now I think that you're presenting this at a moment where it seems incredibly logical to release the student from the, you know, the obligation to illustrate uh, the, the labor of the discipline and to look for some other form of intersection with the world. But yeah, I mean, I really do want to say, like, criticality, mm -hmm. um, I think, has been de-emphasized a lot, in studio particularly. Yeah. Um, and in sometimes some ways de-emphasize in favor of uh, production, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I do think that, you know, it's not just de-emphasized de in architecture education, it's de-emphasized if we look at the history of the United States in general. And I think for me, looking at someone like Elizabeth Catlett, for whom McCarthyism pushed her out of the country, it cost her her, in, her citizenship to teach in that way, right? Mm -hmm is to create kind of an arc between when we're looking at book bannings and anti-CRT, anti-trans movements now that are really a part of a quest to reduce criticality in education, right? That's a part of this long durée that like has really been perpetuated over the course of almost a century mm -hmm. to drain critical thought from American education. No. Great, yeah, and um, and my apologies, my apologies, um, uh, Andrew. I meant to um, introduce you earlier and give you a couple of no uh, minutes. You, you, yeah. uh, so Andrew was meant to be here, part just of hanging out here. the presentation. <laughs> but yeah, and if you can share a little bit uh, yeah. about Sweetwater itself. But then... um, so my name is Andrew. I am here today representing Sweetwater Foundation um, in from Chicago. Uh, Sweetwater is a transdisciplinary nonprofit based on the south side of Chicago. Um, and we are centered around a 12-acre site known as the Commonwealth. And so again, thinking about how do we build Commonwealth together. 
Um, a lot of the work, and I'm, I regret that we weren't able to present today, um, and I hope that that presentation can be made available later, um, but a lot of this work is based around this creative practice of regenerative neighborhood development, R&D, and it's thinking about architecture from and design and planning, but through a lens of agriculture, through art and through education. And one of the things that we do that kind of all comes together in the community. And so this is, you know, an interdisciplinary, um, um, multi-ethnic um, and multicultural organization um, of how we frame education for the populace, for the publics. And so this is um, apprenticeships, internships, fellowships, as well as immersions through different um, universities with local school children. And so I've been part of the university. I was through an engaged course um, here at Cornell. We went to the Commonwealth for an immersion. This was about a year ago. Um, and learning the, the kind of the, the practice of, uh, of regenerative neighborhood development, and then working with different values-based partners in Detroit um, on a three-day immersion. And so that experience then led me back to the Commonwealth, where I'm a fellow in residence currently. And I mean, speaking to a lot of this, this is, um, I think the, com the community is really both complementary to the academy, but also is, is provoking some of this through, um, I think, also questions of time. One of the values that we operate our work around is the idea of Sankofa, this idea of it's not taboo to go back and fetch something. What are the histories that we've left behind that we need to bring forward in order to inform how we move together um, into the future? And we talk a lot about how this work is also living in the future. Through agriculture, you're asking questions of, you know, what is this plant telling me about the coming, if the frost is coming, right? We just took down our tomato plants. And we knew that because the plant was telling us what to learn. Uh, and so I think there's a way that we can think about this from a very smallness. We can get to the smallness of that, and that actually informs these bigger questions that I think the field is often engaged in and is oftentimes removed from the community. And so how can we get back to kind of these smaller questions, these fractals, but then can actually speak to, to greater questions of, of the field of, of design, of architecture, and planning? Great, thank you so much. Um, we, I've got the warning. We have about uh, five minutes left. Um, if there's a really pressing question from the audience, I will entertain that. Otherwise, I have a question I would pose to our, our panelists. Anyone burning to ask a question, comment on? No? Um, so I'd like to, to sort of put to all of you um, what uh, your presentations and then some of this conversation has made me think about um, is like, uh, on you were talking about, you know, our, our particular moment in time here. And I'm curious, those of you who are, are embedded particularly in the um, design education programs, do you, is there an opportunity uh, right now? Do you, I'm, I'm curious to the degree to which you think um, our design institutions, design education institutions are open to and ready to be in, um, integrating some of these new pedagogical approaches? Um, is it still a, a context of, of resistance and, you know, are these traditional ways of, of doing and, and knowing? I, I guess I'm interested in, so do you, do you think that in, in 10 years we may be looking at, um, at sort of some of these what are now alternate approaches have actually become like very much integrated, woven in, or even replacing some of our, um, some of these traditional approaches? I'm curious where you, if you think we're at a moment and, and where do you see design education, where do you hope it would be um, in 10 years, the degree to which it would be reflecting and integrating some of these uh, these practices. And from the program people, understanding whether, I'm curious whether some of these pathway programs might be actually really instrumental, um, you know, sort of bringing a generation of, of the, these youth into these programs, whether that might be transformative. So, any comments? <laughs> I mean, I can, probably try to address that in some way. Um, actually, our undergrad program, the first two years of pre-arc program, used to only require four courses, and they ranged from three to five, credit, five credits. So if you looked at the types of students who could make that commitment, it's, it's not that many. Mm -hmm. So actually, a couple of years ago, they were broken down um, to two um, seven-week modules. And there's nine of them now, and there's about 10 of us that teach them. So it went from four faculty teaching them, so about 10, 
and they're, um, they're just like a lot more, they're easier to integrate into almost anybody's schedule, whether they're, um, you know, they have a job or they're not able to commit those five credits or they just want to understand what architecture is and what that did. It actually also proposed um, a more diverse approach to what architecture could be. So it isn't, to Anya's point, it isn't just about kind of drawing objects or drawings, um, but there's like AI, there's um, uh, using green screens, there's like making like body assemblies, there's still like kind of make, kind of working on form. So just trying to think of like maybe students come into this not wanting to do architecture, but maybe with, through this like two credits, seven week course, they can get a sense of it and it's just more accessible and it's really equitable to all our pre-arc students. Oh, oh. I know from our perspective, um, we find that we'll get a lot of students into college, but then we have a lot of trouble retaining them in college, that many of them drop out after their first or second year. So that to me kind of scares me. Like, I don't know if the field, if the institutions are willing to work with our students and really support them, that they're able to stay in these programs. Um, but I hope that they are able to change, that our students will be able to stay and become architects eventually. And I think something that we've seen too is is the challenge of we need to rethink the campus and the in the classroom, right? Like how many how many times are the the challenge that we're coming up against actually reinforced through these same structures that keep we keep repeating? And so think, rethinking how it is that we do com community engaged work, and rethinking what a classroom might look like, and how that can actually change some of these hierarchies and challenge some of these the, the status quo of some of this this hierarchy while also challenging some of these transformative pathways that lead directly to a professional path um, what are you know what are the other opportunities for people to, to, to take this work right directly into a community and have kind of immediate impact through some of these these uh, studios designs workshops I'm going to say something unpopular that's not going to be a good ending. Do, uh, do you have something optimistic? Go for it. <laughs> yeah? Okay. Yeah. The optimism should, should be the wrap last. Wrap us up. Yeah, should wrap us up. Like we had to walk, walk away with hope. <laughs> okay. I would, I would just say that um, despite working very hard on um, wanting to believe and continuing to extend exuberant amount of uh, sweat equity, on running initiatives for the greater diversification and good of our field. I don't think that we can address the question of radical pedagogy without uh, looking at the conundrum of cost. Mm. And as long as we release students into the world as indentured servants to corporate entities, we're not gonna be able to have a major impact uh, using these exuberant pedagogical methods. Lots of support for that. That's not optimistic. I mean, it's not optimistic, but, but he, what I would say is that sometimes when we're trying to get students to come into this profession and be quote unquote real architects, uh, looking at the other side of their degree and thinking about, because I had also been teaching for two years the professional practice course, thinking about um, our architecture, not just are you, are you an indentured servant for a corporate entity, but is architecture even offering a salary, honestly, mm -hmm. that can contend with the amount of student debt that you have to take on to learn, and also can contend with the fact that many architects have to be in expensive cities in order to practice, especially as a a junior architect getting your first job, right? Mm -hmm. So when I think in those terms, it's also um, what kind of skill sets are you armoring students with in order to come into a context like that, not think of their entire value as their job, have an idea of what they want out of their lives and how they want architecture to be a part of their life in a way that's not just if I am not practicing in this one way, then it was not worth it, you know? And for me, I had a student who 
and I mean this in a very gen genderless way, she was very much like a design bro who like came into a thesis class with me and kind of wanted me to be the foil of just like, ah, oh, Jess, you don't want me to make a building. You don't want me to make a building and I want to make a building. And I, I looked at her and I was like, do you actually want to make a building? Is there something, is there like a, maybe something else that you want to do? And what she ended up doing was she made a role playing game out of client meetings and like how the decisions being made in client meetings um, shape aesthetics and also how so much is outside of your control, just like in a very realistic way. And it made one of our reviewers cry, actually. Um, but I think the how wide open her eyes were going into the practice gave me a lot of, I wouldn't call it hope, but I would say I found it really inspiring because I know that when she goes into that practice that there are certain things that she will accept and not accept, just not being based on if I don't practice in this way then I'm not worth it, then it's not worth, nothing's been worth it, but understanding that she brought a critical, she brings a critical perspective into her working environments mm -hmm. where she knows like if I cannot practice in a way that meets a certain standard of ethic for me, then I have to find another way to do this. And that I feel good about. That's great. That's a, a great way um, to wrap. I had about 12 more questions I wanted to ask, but because um, one of the things I was really interested in is where where do we still see where are the barriers that we can potentially uh, tackle? I think your point is very apt about um, these other considerations, um, and also transforming design education doesn't mean we're transforming the uh, traditional practice of, of you know in industry, um, but we hope that, they say, I think this might be a stealth operation where um, we're, we're seeing um, inch by inch right now and, and hope that we may see some of these, uh, some tipping point um, down the road. So I want to thank, uh, thank you for listening, thank all of our, um, our speakers and our um, program representatives. I think we are shifting into lunch now or a break and so I'm sure I encourage you to um, to also approach them with any other uh, questions or comments you have so thanks for your attention and thanks again to our speakers thank you to everyone for coming and coming back um, welcome back to the Junior Architects Symposium. We have one more session, um, which I'm excited to jump into quickly. And um, I figured I might say just a couple things about my relationship to the work and um, how inspiring and uh, real and honest the conversations have been today and my appreciation for the honesty. Um, I think I was going to say something a little bit more formal, uh, just about like my career and who I am, and I'm a design teaching fellow here, um, but the conversations have swayed me into just being a little bit more honest. Um, and so I, uh, speaking very honestly, I specifically wanted to touch on um, being the only one in the room, um, where Andrew Chin and a few people have kind of mentioned that uh, we, often, especially in this work, are potentially encouraging students to enter spaces where they will be the only one in the room, or they may be the only one in the room. Um, and Anya, speaking about the one in 10 that we actually reach, that one in 10, though we've think, thought of it as, as a success, um, that actually means there's a really long journey of uh, isolation potentially in the future of that student and I'm not going to end on a negative so don't worry about that but we needed to get real um, and I think the, the honesty of uh, talking about the realities of the profession are only fair we absolutely have to talk about them we wouldn't be doing justice to the topic of the symposium without um, and so I wanted to just sort of remind us that these conversations are happening within Cornell, which is a predominantly white institution still, and the, the conversations around shifting pedagogy and practice, I think, are even more uh, amplified and uh, perhaps necessary to sort of be vocalized within this room and within this university and many, many others. Um, but the challenge of kind of facilitating the culture shock that then comes from entering the field um, and then really remembering that this is not necessarily about um, 
the pathway itself, but the support mechanism that allows for people to maintain beyond the point of where we might reach them in high school. Um, and so I feel pretty connected to this topic because yet again, I am often the only one in a room or in a, in a firm or wherever. Um, and in my work, that's changed over time, but there have been many, many times in my education and my career where I was the only one. Um, and so I really searched for and was um, always looking for the community of people who actually sit in this room today, and many are not in the room, and I really hope that we can continue these discussions beyond the room and beyond the symposium. But I really looked for the community that would sit and say, this person is interested, how do I get her to the next step? How do I continue to get her to the next step? How do I support her? How do I support her? Um, and not in a way that was driven by data necessarily, or like, you know, there's just a lack of representation. Um, but also a, a format of actually starting to help me identify myself and my positioning in the uh, profession because for so long um, I really felt like I had to change myself or the way that I do, uh, what, the way that I design, the way that I think about design, uh, the boundaries of design um, to fit into this profession and to be a part of the profession. Um, and over time, and again, the people in this room um, and beyond the room have helped me understand that's not necessary, that who I am today and the identity that I share today um, is a part of this profession um, outright, authentically. Um, and so I don't exist in this profession without those people and without this work. Um, and so without, this is not meant to toot my own horn, but I am a licensed architect in two states and I'm teaching at an Ivy League institution. Um, and I am, it's not, it was not to toot my own horn. Um, and teaching at my alma mater uh, with that. Um, and so the full circle that is um, that ability and that uh, privilege in a way um, really stems from these programs and stems from the dedication and the dedicated educators who are in the room prioritizing uh, these topics. Um, so I often wonder where I would be without the pathway programs that exist or have recently, uh, I wasn't a part of the recent ones, obviously I'm a little too old for that, but I, um, in 2005, I went to a pathway program that wasn't for architects necessarily, um, but that's where uh, we were just sitting in a room and another kid wanted to be an architect and before that time, I had never thought about it before. Um, and that was a pathway program for students of color at Princeton um, called the W.E.B. Du Bois uh, Scholars Institute. I don't know that it exists anymore. Um, but that's my beginnings of this. It's just sitting next to someone who thought they might want to do it, who was exposed. And so that exposure um, is important, right? Like that's, that's the moment in which we actually start the interest. Um, and the most important part of this, I think, is that this all starts with just an interest, right? But the way that we get beyond that is supported and cultivated and nurtured interest um, and then future kind of knowledge and investment in the whole human being, not just the student, not just the person who shows up to um, an educational setting, um, but all facets of community building and building relationships based on care and environments based on care. And so I wanted to just uh, ground this also by sharing a few data points also in the one to 10 that we reach. Um, in my licensure, I am one of, I think a little more than 500 licensed black women. 570, so we're approaching 600. The, the queen of architectural things is, is relaying that information. Um, and so we have this, uh, we have within that group the sort of informal counting that happens. And for reference, this is in my bio if anyone has ever read it, but there's, um, I'm 463rd informally uh, collected uh, within, so before the number 500, and 13th in the state of Michigan, licensed black uh, female architect. So we're still in the teens in some states, we're still in the single digits in some states. So these pathway programs, yet again, just start to speak to some of those numbers and some of those um, visuals of how many people are represented, and then who gets to actually turn around and serve a community that looks like them. Um, 
And so that within that counting, we can also identify certain other people in the room, namely Kim Dowdell, who also has a number. She's 295. Um, Dr. Sutton, who is not in the room, but Wikipedia told me today that she is 12. She is 12. Um, so we have the honor of actually being um, among the 12th, right, today, but that is the number in which we can actually still count on uh, some fingers and toes, right? Um, so I just wanted to also say I think this is like almost wildly serendipitous that I, um, up on the Milstein plate, happened to sit behind Suzanne Lettieri for our different versions of thesis in um, December or fall of 2011. Um, and we've followed each other kind of from place to place, from Detroit back to <laughs> Ithaca, kind of. And, um, and I think it's just important that we've been able to evolve and to collaborate in this way as a part of a friendship, but as a, pot, uh, as a colleague as well. Um, and I think her attention to this matter, her investment and sort of dedication to making sure that the people in this room can show up and have intentional conversations about how to push things forward um, has truly been amazing to be alongside you in this journey. Um, but that it's, a, that it's a testament to her sort of dedication to the topic. But it just also has been so personal to me and such an, an interesting part of my experience coming back to a place where a lot of these experiences are coming back, right? The pathway programs and the journey to which you get to even a Cornell Auditorium is coming back. Um, and so I look forward to the next, next, next discussion. Um, I just wanted to kind of note that there are a series of uh, people in the room who I've admired for years and just absolute mega stars um, in the industry who are about to speak hopefully pretty critically about the profession given the conversation we had in the middle session. Um, and so the, the discussions in this room I think are really, really important. Um, but the hope is that they continue far beyond the room and far beyond the symposium um, because we are also, uh, every time I speak to someone who's maybe not in this room about a pathway program, they say, oh, have you heard about this other program? Have you heard about this other program? So there are so many programs happening. We have 25 pretty carefully documented, but that's one of so, so many. Um, and so the work is happening on the ground in real time, people connecting with students where they are, understanding what they care about in the continuation of their interests. Um, and so I just wanted to say that and connect actually to the group. Um, so thank you to everybody yet again. Um, and I will send us into um, actually one of the mega stars who is <laughs> Jennifer Newsom to bring up the next session. Thank you. Um, well, I don't consider myself a megastar, but I appreciate that. Um, no, I really um, appreciate that kind of impassioned and necessary context setting, because I think we've all, um, I don't know, certainly I've definitely been the only one in the room at times, and my number is 277, just if anybody is wondering. Um, so I'm Jennifer Newsom. I'm an assistant professor here at Cornell. Um, I'm also a principal of Dream the Combine, a practice that I founded in 2013 with my partner Tom Carruthers. Um, and I'm also a proud former instructor at Juxtaposition Arts, which is a um, youth empowerment organization in Minneapolis, Minnesota, um, where uh, high school students are um, have the opportunity to do a kind of apprenticeship program, so they're working on real projects and they get paid, uh, crucially, that's important. We'll talk about the economic impact, I think, uh, certainly probably in our discussion. Um, but they also have a, a kind of environmental design uh, track as one of the, the five disciplines that students are involved in. And I'm also a member of uh, DMU um, with Curry and Kiki and Andrew and a lot of other people. Um, but I have the pleasure of introducing um, our last session on civic professionalism. 
And um, so I'm just going to jump right into it. So Kim Dowdell is a superstar and is a licensed architect and frequent speaker on the topic of architecture, leadership, diversity, sustainability, and the future of cities. Dowdell was the 2019 to 2020 National President of the National Organization of Minority Architects, also known as NOMA, and is the 2024 President-elect of the American Institute of Architects, the first black woman to hold that leadership position. Uh, she is also currently direct, Director of Strategic Relationships and a principal with HOK. Then our second speaker will be Ann Lee. Ann. Fantastic designer. Anne Lee is a founding principal of Future Firm, a Chicago-based architecture and design research practice, and is an assistant professor of practice at the University of Michigan. Lee's work explores the intersection of professional practice, collectivity, and the built environment. And then we'll also have video interludes and be joined on stage um, by uh, two representatives from youth enrichment programs. So Nihara Patak is a trained architect and is currently pursuing a doctoral degree in architecture, engineering, construction management at Carnegie Mellon University. Patak is also a UDREAM instructor where she teaches sustainability strategies and designing with the help of simulations. Uh, and then lastly, but not least, Megan Ponzano is Senior Director of Early Design Education and Lecturer in Architecture at Harvard's Graduate School of Design, GSD. Her role includes Program Director of the Harvard Undergraduate Architecture Studies Track, as well as Director of the GSD's Black and Design Mentorship Program and the Design Discovery Public Summer Program. So um, please join me in welcoming our first speaker, Kim. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Okay, so I was told to talk about civic professionalism, so I had to Google what that meant, which we'll talk about in a moment. But um, uh, we already did my introduction, so I'm going to, oh, that's not what I meant to do, sorry. Next. Um, okay, so that's just me, kind of a quick recap. Um, I like to kind of start with my journey to kind of let everyone know um, the, the context of, of which um, you know, I'm here speaking to today um, about you know my journey, but not just my journey, but the journey of other people who are from diverse perspectives and how we can um, create multiple pathways. So, um, of course, I made this into a group of logos. So, if any of these logos connect with you, we can talk later about them. But it, it, this isn't about me. I actually want to um, move on to how I came to this um, to this work. So, these two images show a building. It's a very large building. So, I kind of got a couple of different perspectives at different point, points in time. But this is the Hudson's apartment store in downtown Detroit, which is where I'm from. Um, however, when I was born, this, uh, this department store, it actually was closed. So I never experienced it as a place of commerce. I experienced it more like that. So as you can tell, you've got, we've got some broken windows and boarded up conditions. Um, so I was around 11 when I had my epiphany moment that I wanted to become an architect. Um, before that, I wanted to be a doctor because I wanted to, to help people, but I, I felt uh, almost like this, this like moment uh, when I saw this building and kind of made the connection that if I became an architect, maybe I can help be sort of like a doctor for um, you know for the for the community. Um, and so, unfortunately, just a few years later, uh, the building was demolished. So uh, that so I didn't did not get to work on restoring that building, but the the sort of architectural bug had already bitten me, and so here we are. Um, so when I came to Cornell in 2001. Um, you know, I, I really r maintained that interest in understanding what I could specifically do to help contribute to kind of healing the communities that um, have really been torn apart by, uh, by disinvestment. Um, and so uh, the images on the left show a couple of uh, images from my thesis project way back in 2005 and 2006, just, you know, documenting the deterioration from, you know, 1949 um, you know, an image of a, a neighborhood in 1949 versus 2003. Um, and then I started to really understand through that process what redlining meant and what certain policy um, you know, implications meant for the built environment and sort of how Detroit came to be the, the way that it was when I was growing up. Um, so for those who are interested in understanding more about how that works, there's a great book called The Color of Law, which came out actually far after my thesis, but um, it's a good resource to just share with you for reference. And so all of the experiences that I've had, um, you know, really led to my 
development of my own personal mission, mission statement, which I recommend everyone develop because it kind of helps to make decisions, uh, at least it has for me. So my mission is to improve the quality of people's lives by design, uh, which is a bit of a deriv derivative of my original mission, um, you know, relative to being a doctor, but again, choosing architecture um, as a means by which to do that. So we talked about civic professionalism, which I, again, I had to, to Google as a term. Um, it's actually a relatively uh, new term um, that re-examines the role of the professions in society, emphasizing the role of professionals in rebuilding the civic life of communities in addition to their traditional role in providing specialized services to individuals. So that's many words to just say like you're trying to do good work while uh, good work for you know for your community while you sort of engage in your traditional profession. So that's something that I've always been interested in. If you look at sort of the the different projects or or types of companies that I've worked with, that's been sort of a, a theme. Um, and so one of the things that uh, as as you go through the licensure process, for those who um, are still uh, on that path, or if you've already done it, you know that one of the things that comes up often is protecting the health, safety, and welfare of the public. That's technically what architects are supposed to do, and so that's on brand with, um, you know, with, with the conversation that we're looking to have today. Um, and that really brings me to one of the most kind of alarming infographics I've seen in a while. I saw this back in 2019, and I, I try to share this with people, um, you know, looking at disparities, specifically um, Chicago, which is where I live um, part of the time. Uh, the life expectancy in Chicago, which is the middle item, and I've highlighted it just for ease of view. On the south side of Chicago, which is predominantly, um, you know, black, uh, black and brown communities, the average life expectancy is around 60 years of age, which is terrible. Um, in the U.S., the average is about 77. Um, and then on the north side of Chicago, which is more fluent and, and typically, um, you know, more of a you know white community, it's 90 years. So we're talking about a 30-year life expectancy gap from one part of the city to the other. And the other images just show, um, you know, unemployment and food deserts and, and some of the other issues that contribute to that life expectancy. But, you know, I think about as architects, if we're supposed to protect the health, safety, and welfare of the public, how can we um, how can we contribute to, to this particular issue? And it's not just Chicago. Um, this just happened to be a graphic that was included in, in a Time Magazine article about that issue. But if you um, look at your own city, uh, there are uh, discrepancies or there are disparities between the different zip codes, and unfortunately, it also uh, strongly ties to race. Um, so nationwide, there, uh, there are also major disparities relative to pollution and where buildings are sited and where you know, people of color live versus where black people live in white communities. So, just, so there's a lot of information. I just have two that I've, I'm showing here, but if you are interested in understanding how these disparities um, you know, show up, I, you know, I certainly encourage you to continue to, to look for that because it, there's a lot out there. So uh, I've quoted, quoted myself here, um, health is the common denominator between equitable and sustainable design. And uh, for those who aren't aware, the AIA, where I'll be president in just like less than two months, um, our two st key strategic priorities are um, equity and climate action. And so those are some of the things that um, that I have, I've been thinking about and talking about a lot lately and um, just kind of tying health into that is something that I think is really important. So I, I see health as that common denominator. And so the, you know, the question is what kind of future do we want to design? As architects, we have the privilege of being the authors of the future of the built environment. Um, and you know, I firmly believe that uh, because architects shape the future for everyone, the the sort of community of architects should reflect the communities that we serve. And so the, the, the lack of diversity in, in architecture is part of a problem that I think we have to talk about, which is what we're talking about here, and you know, finding ways to, to increase pathways into the profession and also critically talk about why people are sort of coming off of those pathways for a variety of reasons. So I'll get into that in a little bit. But First, I'll talk about just the importance of diversity. I feel like I shouldn't have to say this, but there's a whole book that's been written about it um, by Scott Page called The Difference. Um, and I mean, essentially, the Cliff's Notes version is uh, the more diverse communities, um, companies, they, you know, they perform better. So I, my theory of change here is that if we can have a more diverse profession, we actually can have uh, greater outcomes. But um, again, this is a book to, uh, to look at if you need more information about why diversity is important. 
um, that's, that's a good resource. And then uh, the other thing is diversity and inclusion drives innovation. So this is another book actually written by someone who I know, Robert Livingston, um, you know, who, who writes about the conversation, how to seek and speak the truth about racism and how that can radically transform individuals and organizations. So again, another reference. I, I think those, I'm done with my book references for now, but I feel like if we're at a university, we should share some additional knowledge. So, um, but you know, diverse teams are, are really important. Um, especially because to, to build a builder, to design and build a building, you need a lot of people, and I think diversity is one of the things that um, you know that, that really helps to drive that uh, success. Um, another quote that I want to share: is, Diversity is about counting the people, and inclusion is about making the people count. Um, because it's one thing to just have like a bunch of different people, you know, on a project, but if you you know only really prioritize those who are from a particular background, and everyone else is just sort of like background, um, you know, talent or just like not doing much, they're not included. Then you know you're not really achieving the goals I think you, you want to, to achieve. So I just want to make sure to include that as a thought. Um, so I'll talk a, a little bit about what I do at HOK. I'm part of the um, Diversity Advisory Council, or DAC. I'm one of the three firm-wide co-chairs, and each of our 26 offices around the globe have a, um, a DAC representative. And so a few years ago, well, actually, the DAC has been around for over a decade, but certainly after the murder of George Floyd, the firm's leadership um, decided to, um, you know, to really formalize our commitment to diversity and, and, and publish this. Um, so I wanted to make sure that I, I shared that, um, you know, not, not so much to talk about like what HOK is doing, but specifically what firms as, you know, just in general, whether they're small, medium, or large, can be doing. So these are just some of the um, examples of efforts that can be made to increase diversity within the profession. So the specific initiatives, I won't talk about all of these, but um, two that I have been involved with, um, one is HOK Impacts, uh, back when I was a young architect about a decade and a half ago. Um, myself and several other colleagues, um, we created HOK Impact, which was uh, the firm's corporate social responsibility program, looking at all the involvement that we had in organizations like NOMA and the ACE Mentor Program and Canstruction, and just all the different um, sort of pro bono or supportive uh, efforts, we you know we we created a formalized program that the firm continues to support to this day, uh, and then um, HOK Tapestry that was something that was really born out of my experience as NOMA president, um, where you know I would talk to smaller firm owners, particularly um, you know um, some of our members you know they own small black firms. Um, you know, around the country, and they, they're frustrated because NOMA was founded by primarily firm owners who were black, um, and now NOMA has a very large, um, you know, membership, but a lot of the members work for large firms like the one that, that I work for, um, or we have a large student population, and so we're kind of, you know, as an organization getting away from some of the, the core interests of our smaller firm owners. Um, and so I, I took that to heart and thought about ways that we can help with, you know, providing support. Um, and then one specific thing I thought about within the context of HOK was actually um, being more intentional about partnering with smaller, um, you know, design firms, consulting firms to support the larger projects that we're working on. And so that's another initiative that I have been spending a lot more of my time kind of cultivating um, in recent years. Um, and then another big aspect uh, of our success, I think, with recruitment and retention of people is mentorship. And again, this is this is not like you know earth-shattering stuff, but um, certainly whatever firm you might work with or you might consider working with in the future, make sure that they have um, mentoring as, as a part of their um, offerings because it's a really critical piece to to kind of help navigate your career. Um, and so last year, HOK was awarded a BizNow Rise Award for for those efforts. Um, so that's how I spend a, a good chunk of my time um, at the firm, uh, particularly while I'm navigating, you know, both NOMA leadership, which which is now officially over, and then as I embark upon my um, AI leadership coming up. So speaking of NOMA, um, this is an image of uh, one of our project pipeline summer camps. Um, for those who aren't familiar, um, NOMA. Uh, works with middle school and high school students to uh, provide, uh, you know, just exposure to architects and small projects. And um, NOMA has over 40 chapters around the country, and, and many of them have project pipeline camps. Some of them are just a day, others are a week. It just depends on the um, the capacity of that particular 
uh, chapter, and this is from the uh, Illinois NOMA chapter, INOMA, uh, which has, a, has one of the more robust offerings. So NOMA's mission, rooted in a rich legacy of activism, is to empower our local chapters and membership to foster justice and equity in communities of color through outreach, community advocacy, professional development, and design excellence. Um, and so for those who aren't familiar with the numbers, um, about, so on the, on the left-hand side, existing percent of the U.S. population, um, you know, compared to the percentage of licensed architects that we talked about, um, you know, there being very few black women, so specifically 0.04%. Um, but 25% uh, women across the board, uh, Latino American 3%, um, African American 2% total, um, Asian Americans about 4%, and uh, Native American is less than 1%. So these are numbers that we'd like to have as close as possible to the representation of the U.S. because again, if we're um, creating the future for people, we want to reflect those, those folks in the communities that we serve. Um, so the latest uh, snapshot that I took of the Director of African American Architects shows 2,535 uh, total black architects. Um, and so this gets updated every once in a while, but this is how I got to know my number um, like 10 years ago. I was the last um, you know, woman's name on this list and it, the number was 295. So it's not a very scientific method, but it just seems to work. So. Um, so if you ever want to look up, um, you know, who's, who's in the directory, um, go to www.blackarchitect.us. So when I was NOMA president, we created the 2030 Diversity Challenge. Um, and that's in partnership with the AI Large Roundtable, which represents the 60 largest uh, design firms in North America. And so they provided funding um, for some of NOMA's programs that are working towards uh, increasing specifically the, the number of black architects. So there are about 120,000 licensed architects uh, in the United States. Um, uh, there are actually more attorneys just in the state of California, so we're like, like a very small profession in case you weren't aware. Um, but uh, just as I mentioned before, about 2% are, are black, and so um, of the approximately 2,500 that we have, uh, we'd like to get to 5,000 by 2030, which we set this goal um, back in 2020, so we're a little behind, but hopefully um, we can make some progress there. Um, so the plan for progress, unfortunately, elementary, middle, and high school students wouldn't even help with that particular goal because it takes quite a while to become an architect, as many of you probably know. So the, um, the most critical segments are those who are in architecture school right now and those who are already on the path to licensure. Um, and so here's just a visual of what those folks, um, you know, are, are looking like in the in the, um, the the specific programs that NOMA provides to to help uh, foster movement through that pipeline. Um, and then I'll kind of round out with my AIA um, efforts, uh, specifically the guides for equitable practice. Uh, which are guides for understanding and building equity in the architecture profession. Um, I actually worked on the, um, the Equity in the Future of Architecture Committee with current president, uh, Emily Grandstaff Rice, uh, who led that effort, and uh, there are many people on the committee. So we created the guides to really help um, firms of all different sizes be able to, uh, you know, again, foster a sense of belonging and help to create the equity that we want to see within the profession. So that ultimately we can kind of um, all collectively uh, advance the, the 10 principles of design excellence, which would, um, you know, help to going kind of going full circle, um, healing our communities, helping to address some of the disparities that are, are really challenging us. So these are the kind of 10 principles that rose to the top from um, a, an extensive study of what we should really be prioritizing as, as architects. So my um, platform, when I ran for president in 2022, um, I called it the alphabet platform, it's A, B, C, D, Ar you know, really advocating for architects in practice, uh, helping to um, help facilitate belonging in the profession, climate action, and designing the future, which is focused on uh, AI and how that will transform our practices. Um, and then more recently, I came up with uh, a slogan um, I'm testing out, it's called More in 24. And specifically, I want to advocate for more money, more members, and more mission. And we actually talked about in the last, um, the last panel, um, architects create a tremendous amount of value, but we're not 
um, really we're not receiving that value, particularly as it relates to entry level compensation for people who are just coming out of school. Like it just, like the, as I like to say, the math doesn't math. Like you spend a lot, um, you know, to, to become an architect or to, to graduate from school and go through all of the, the processes, but the compensation really doesn't align. And um, I think we have to push for our, um, you know, our practices to advocate, uh, to do a better job of advocating from a business perspective. So that's something that working with the AIA to help um, provide those resources so that we can actually do better collectively. Uh, more members, uh, there are 97,000 AI members currently. I'll be the 100th president on December 15th, and I'd like for us to get to 100,000 members. I feel like that's within striking distance. Um, and then if we achieve those two things, we can achieve more of our mission, which is focused on climate action and equity. So um, that's it for me. Thank you. If you want to reach out, that is my AI email address. For Black and Design, the program's mission is twofold, uh, to expose the next generation of potential black and brown designers and architects in high school to ways of architectural thinking, building, and working, while simultaneously supporting graduate students in a two-way mentor-mentee relationship with both the younger students and working professionals in the architecture field. Ultimately, the program creates a mentorship cluster spanning high school, graduate school, and the workplace. The architecture firm that we partner with for this program, Perkins & Will, is able to build these direct connections with the next generation of black and brown voices in design, which in turn help them to better incorporate and champion these voices in their real world projects. Those studying or practicing design in the built environment should be as diverse as the world we ultimately design with and for. Architecture has not done this so well so far. Building literacy generally about what goes into the built world around us and the impact of design within that is another broader reaching uh, condition that I think is really essential to our program. Once the presence and reach of design in the built environment is recognized all around them, it's possible to imagine how they might design for change within it. It's malleable, it's adaptable, one can redesign it. They can better find representation of themselves there, uh, but they also might more accurately connect the built environment to the needs of the present and the future that they might project. Mentoring a new generation of Black and Brown design faculty is another metric of success in our program. Because Black and Brown current graduate students of design also serve as teaching mentors in our program, these talented students are able to bring hands-on teaching experience to academic positions at universities perhaps in partnership with design practice, following the completion of their professional degree. A big thing that we push on is the networking aspect. The Black in Design program changes the way that people look at the way that we network and inclusivity in design. If we're able to plug people who usually weren't given a seat at a table into really influential circles, then I think that we could see some real change across the institution and across design as a whole. I think the intent of the Black and Design program is to introduce us to various ways of thinking creatively and finding design solutions. From giving presentations on my work to everyone involved in Black and Design this year, I learned how to take constructive criticism and also how to apply that criticism in my future work. This program has definitely impacted my career decisions because I learned a lot about what specifically interests me about architecture and my next steps are attending a college or university with an accredited architecture program. Thank you so much, uh, Suzanne and Imani, for the invitation. Um, yes, it is incredibly inspiring to be here and also very intimidating to speak after a whole range of people who I have admired for a long time and whose work um, continues to challenge and inspire me. Um, so I, um, sorry, give me one second while I figure out how to see. Okay, so I'm going to be speaking here today as both a practicing architect and as a historian. 
Um, and I am excited to share this kind of thoughts around this key question. Can the profession and practice of architecture itself be redesigned? Um, when I was reading the text Civic Professionalism, after which this uh, session was named, Harry Boyd's call to action stood out to me that educators in um, university settings need to, quote, practice their profession as a craft that engages public life on multiple fronts and in myriad ways. This call, I think, applies as well to the profession of architecture, and it reminded me of the philosopher Ivan Ilyich, a critic of institutions and of professions in general. In his writing on the construction of learned professions in the 20th century, including architects, he argued that professions are defined in part by, quote, having the legal power to create the need that they, by law, alone will be allowed to satisfy. And this will come up again, I think, in my critique of building code and building code enforcement. As a practicing architect, I think this criticism can be understood as a kind of design provocation. Can the profession and practice of architecture itself be redefined? And I'm not going to talk about my work as a practitioner that much, but I think it is important to show some of the work of Future Firm um, in order to understand the context um, from which some of these questions emerge for me. Um, so in Chicago, our practice, Future Firm, just, um, serves folks that we describe as change makers. That means our clients are small business owners, they're nonprofits, and they're community developers who serve black, brown, uh, and Asian American communities uh, in Chicago. We work almost exclusively for community-led uh, developers of many scales. I mean, this kind of work has really challenged how I think about the practice of architecture, different from when I was practicing um, at larger firms before I started my own firm, um, including uh, this project Bronzeville Winery, located in what is known as histor uh, Chicago's historical black metropolis on 44th and South Cottage Grove. Um, and it really, the way we kind of worked on this project, um, because of the leadership of Eric Williams and Cecilia Cuff, the owners, moved away from, I think, the kind of sole genius model of practice that many of us are taught in school. Um, instead, it was co-authored collaboratively with furniture designer Norman Teague, with artists Krista Franklin and Lucy Slavitsky, and with DJ Ron Trent, to create a space that would continue to act as a platform for art and culture going forward. And the work we do has also um, kind of expanded my understanding of how architects operate or are required, need to operate um, outside of what is considered the typical, um, traditionally considered the typical realm of design. Um, it has been an honor to work with Maya Camille Broussard of Justice of the Pies. Folks who watch Big Squad know her from Netflix, season two just came out this year, um, where we helped her convert a former dentist's office um, in Chicago's far south side uh, into a commercial and retail bakery. Um, this adaptive reuse of a building um, brought up a kind of range of questions, including at some point we had to draft a definition between, of the def difference between a commercial and retail bakery um, when zoning threatened to deny her permit um, based on a definition that was actually not written in the building code. Um, we've also worked with uh, organizations as an ongoing project like Revolution Workshop, um, which works uh, in Garfield Park in Chicago to bring folks from underserved communities into the building trades, and I think are starting up a pathway program of their own, which is, I think, still confidential, but very exciting. Um, but it's been important to me to understand um, how construction is seen through um, their gaze. So when we started on this project, I thought that we would be designing primarily shop space and classroom space, and what I found out was their space really needs to be split into two, into learning space and social services space for folks coming from underserved communities. Um, just as much as a classroom is needed or a shop is needed, um, support in financial matters, housing matters, um, and mental health matters is necessary. And then lastly, uh, for example, on this project uh, into American Center, um, which is on the boards now, um, which serves folks from the South Asian community as well as other recent immigrants from um, uh, Latin America and the Middle East, our scope has really extended beyond, I think, what is considered the kind of regular realm of design. Uh, a lot of our work has been about mapping the kind of budgetary, spatial, and operational requirements of the many streams of funding um, this organization gets in order to continue their programs to serve those in need. 
Um, and this is the crew. I, I think because I'm talking about co-authorship today, it's important for me to show the entire team. None of these projects are authored by me alone, but instead, instead by the uh, 11 of us, as well as Falana Kwan, who's not pictured. We need to get an updated photo. Uh, but all of us kind of contribute to and author uh, the projects. And we come from a range of backgrounds, both in terms of uh, where we come from in the world, um, our disciplinary backgrounds, um, and our ways that we approach design. But as a historian, I think, as a historian of practice, I have been thinking about um, the way that practice is constructed in another way. So when I was in graduate school, I participated in this project, Office US, um, which documented all of United States architecture practices in the last 100 years. And one of the kind of, um, one of the many themes we noticed is what um, the AIA has also observed, is that the increasing majority of architects either work for sole practitioners or for large corporate firms. And if we think about this kind of trend that has emerged through a series of reasons, legal, economic, and otherwise, we can start to ask that if this kind of form of practice um, has been recently constructed, can it be redesigned as well? So I've always been interested in how the ways, and this is a photo of um, SOM from its days in Inland Steel, where I worked before I started my own practice. And I've been interested in the question, how do the ways that we work shape the work that we do? So in early and mid-century, corporate architecture firms modeled a lot of their managerial and project delivery strategies after methods from the Fortis assembly line, from the arrangement of the desks to the design of title blocks. What other models can we start to reference to create new forms of practice? And so today I want to concentrate, concentrate specifically on building code. Building code, legal texts which govern the construction and the renovation of buildings, is usually seen, and I'm sure by many of you sitting here, as a kind of dry, boring part of the design process. Students, and I can see you guys checking out already, think of the building code as being dense and unintelligible, and practitioners treat it as a kind of technical bulwark requiring compliance but rarely sparking design inspiration. The discipline also tends to silo building codes in the purely technical sphere, mundane documents which at best provide guardrails around health, safety, and welfare, and at worst limit the freewheeling expression of artistic designers such as ourselves. But in the last 50 years, we can actually think about the building code as being kind of profoundly co-authored by architecture and engineering professionals, by lobbyists, by material manufacturers, by testing agencies, by local officials, and by trade groups, an eclectic chorus of voices whose individual points of view actually get lost in the dry documents enforced by local law. The origins of the building code was actually fundamentally co-authored. There were three major regional councils who developed their own codes, which then came together in a kind of single code, and the um, International Code Council in the 1990s. But I think it is worth saying that building codes can be read in this sense as living texts, both indexing and shaping the built environment and the ways of life that are codified through their requirements. So you see in this clip here, in the 1958 edition of the Southern Building Code Congress's Southern Standard Building Code explicitly required racially segregated bathrooms. Architectural practitioners who were in compliance with the law enforced the racist practice. However, in 1973's edition, um, after the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the same provision was removed. So if we start to bring together these histories of revision and amendment, the, battle the building code can actually be read as a kind of battleground, an archive of activism, of rights fought for and agreed upon. So I want to just quickly highlight three chapters, three historical moments when I think it's been important that the building code has not just kept up with social change, but instead these were times when the building code itself, and we could think about this broadly as the profession itself, um, has been the focus of progressive activism from individuals and movements. In 1911, many of you maybe have studied this example um, in architecture history, um, the direct advocacy of labor organizers um, focused on integrating fire and life safety changes um, into the building code. So the Triangle Factory Fire in 1911, 146 workers, mostly immigrant women, died in a factory fire. Um, you could argue that there were kind of two issues at the core of this, labor rights and building code. The Triangle Factory was one of the few firms that had not settled with the um, International Ladies uh, Garment Workers Union in the 1909 uprising. 
And additionally, building code at this time really focused on the protection of property rather than the protection of human lives. And in the wake of the disastrous fire, a group of reformers, socialists, trade union leaders organized to find, um, both seek relief for the families of the workers who were killed and to require a change in building law to create safer buildings. And I think it's notable that at one of the strikes and protests at the funerals of the workers, and I haven't been able to find an image of it yet, but it's documented in the um, newspaper history, one of the central banners um, said, we demand fire protection. Um, and so it was after this um, period that uh, requirements around ex exiting, sprinkling, and what we now call fire resistant construction, at the time was called fireproof construction, was better incorporated into building law. Fast forward to 1977, um, disability advocacy in the 1970s, and here we're getting into the weeds a little bit, but prior to this, ANSA 117.1 was the building code that governed accessibility, um, but it really required it for new construction only. In 1973, the rehabilitation code was passed, including the famous Section 04, which included civil rights language protecting the discrimination on the basis of handicap. As the disability advocate Kitty Cohn said, before Section 504, the responsibility for the consequences of disability rested only on the shoulders of the person with the disability rather than being understood as a societal responsibility. Section 504 dramatically changed that societal perception. But even though Section 504 was passed, regulators were dragging their heels on implementing the actual regulations, which would require specific change, such as ramps, parking spaces, and accessible bathrooms. So in 1977, the American Coalition of Citizens with Disabilities um, got together for a sit-in um, at different places, including in San Francisco, which lasted for 26 days, and organized against President Carter's administration, which subjected, suggested compromises around waivers, longer compliance, schedules and weaker rules. Um, eventually the protests ended when um, the regulations um, as advocated for were passed. But I think it's also worth sharing that leading up to the 1977 sit-ins, um, as documented by historian Bess Williamson, there was a really kind of incredible movement for um, indep the independent living movement, which was organized um, primarily out of UC Berkeley, which pr prioritized a design approach that uh, featured and centered the experiences of disabled people rather than exclusively technical guidelines. So Professor uh, Ray Leifchez uh, worked with students to create large scale models um, and they facilitated kind of conversations with disabled people as consultants who marked up and uh, kind of like worked together to edit uh, the models together. So I think there's always been a way that profession and pedagogy have tried to kind of advance questions of civil rights and justice um, in parallel with the kind of regulatory and code changes that were being implemented. Many of you probably know in 1990, the Capitol crawl when over 1,000 people marched to the US uh, Capitol and demanded that Congress pass the American with Disabilities Act. 60 people, 60 uh, protesters cast aside their wheelchairs and other mobility aids and crawled up the Capitol steps. Um, President George H.W. Bush signed the ADA into law in 1990, which expanded Section 504. Fast forward again, and I think I'm skipping many like interesting smaller episodes, but I want to highlight these three big chapters. In 2016, North Carolina's uh, governor passed a controversial bathroom bill banning transgender people from using the bathrooms that aligned with their gender, ide gender identity. This bill created a natural controver national controversy in the following years, resulting in battles in the courtroom, in the public arena, and in the public square. During this time, a group of LGBTQ advocates, uh, including architects, began to ask a question that foregrounded design as a way to start to cut through the noise. Why were gender separated uh, bathrooms required at all? Could private gender neutral bathrooms provide a solution? And this question led us directly to building code. At that time, the International Plumbing Code, which is the model code, which is adopted by most local authorities, required that commercial restrooms um, be separated by sex and uh, to get into the weeds, that the number of fixtures be divided by male uh, and female. Terry Kogan, who's a professor at law at University of Utah, worked with the National Center for Transgender Equality uh, and the AIA to propose two amendments to the Plumbing Code. 
and I will skip ahead here, but there's some really incredible work by Joel Sanders on trying to think through how uh, single user gender neutral bathrooms um, serve not just uh, trans and LGBTQ communities, but a range of kind of diverse communities with private bathroom needs. So uh, the advocates of these two code modifications, P14 and P15, made the argument that actually an alternative should be uh, proposed that in addition to gender separated bathrooms, there should be a possibility that folks can um, adopt um, gender inclusive bathrooms. And I think it is worth noting that uh, at the public hearings at which these plumbing, plumbing additions, plumbing amendments were eventually passed, here I will go ahead and do a name and shame. The person who spoke out most against the uh, gender neutral bathrooms was Bradley Corporation, the manufacturer of bathroom partition stalls. So the company that was protecting their market share to create um, flimsy plastic uh, bathroom stall dividers was most intent on limiting the rights of trans people. Okay. The Building Code is a co-authored living document. It is a battleground for a more equitable and uh, built environment. I want to just um, kind of introduce, lastly, a question, which is to say that while we have been talking about um, the kind of co-authorship of the Building Code, on the flip side, there is what is currently being called enforcement. But I really want to challenge this term enforcement and think if there are other ways that are more equitable and inclusive to think about the ways that Building Code lands on the ground. Currently, in Chicago, uh, building inspectors, conservation inspectors, um, have issued over 1.1 million building violations in 2006. That is more than the number of individual buildings there are in Chicago. And yet, on the other hand, accountability remains a major issue. Um, after a series of deadly fires in multifamily um, apartment buildings, the city kind of vowed to include a list of scofflaw landlords that list has um, since been abandoned and not been updated. And then this is, and now uh, building on the work that um, Tim previously presented, I think it is important to say that we can't only think about um, kind of delinquent landlords in the context of building violations. Because of redlining and the kind of extractive impact of communities of colors and communities of color in Chicago, building violations um, happen more frequently in the south and west sides in neighborhoods where deferred maintenance has had to occur because of the kind of illegal harm um, that was uh, uh, a result of redlining and the contract buying and selling that followed. So um, just as a recap, uh, Chicago's black communities were robbed of $1 million a day in the estimates by historian Beryl Satter. Um, and because of that, um, families, especially homeowners, were, required, were, were kind of forced into situations where they deferred maintenance in order to preserve their homes if they could. If we overlap a map of building violations, and that's the heat map of dots of different sizes, over a map of uh, redlining, we can see that the concentration of building violations happen in the neighborhoods um, where redlining also occurred. And the longer kind of stakes of building violations is if you are not able to resolve your building violations, your home can go into receivership and then eventually to demolition by the city of Chicago. So while our issues of vacancy in Chicago are well known, you can start to think about building violations and code compliance as an issue that is upstream. So the kind of dark patches are areas of vacancy while the um, vertical lines are areas of building violations. And I think in what uh, this surreal map that folks in Chicago probably intuitively know all too well, if we look at the heat map of building violation, that's the kind of blobs below. I got AIA Illinois to give me the list of all their um, registered design firms and individual members, so small dots and large dots. This kind of surreal map shows that everywhere that architects are located are exactly not in the places that we are needed. On the other hand, the fifth most commonly issued building violation is to submit plans prepared, signed, and sealed by a licensed architect or a registered structural engineer to obtain approval uh, for permit. So while architects are required to help solve issues um, of kind of structural inequality, we are not located in the places we need to serve. So is there a way of thinking about enforcement that pivots away from enforcement and instead to accountability, to resolution, and to co-authorship? 
And I think this leads me to my final provocation, which is if you are entitled to a public defender when accused of committing a crime, should you have a right to a public architect when you are issued a building violation and you cannot afford one? I've been very inspired by Clara Foltz, who was the first woman who was admitted to the California bar. Um, she was the first advocate for the public defender's office, which did not become federal law until decades after she died. But she argued that the law should be a shield as well as a sword. So if we were to take Clara Foltz's argument and apply it to architecture and building code, perhaps for every uh, building inspector, there should be a public architect chosen and paid for in the same way out of the same fund. And I think if we start to expand upon the history of activism and co-authorship in the building code to these questions of implementation and resolution, new um, possibilities may emerge. The Office of the Public Architect could be a place where young architects are trained to get experience and get licensed quickly, where experienced architects represent a range of clients, allowing them to have clout with material manufacturers and to implement policy change, and which could be distributed, I think we're showing here that they are in former USPS offices, be distributed in a city in a way that actually is grounded in community and allows people to visit with an architect the same way they might visit uh, an urgent care doctor. Additionally, are there other forms of implementation um, and resolution for uh, building code violations, such as private public collaborative approaches to um, repairing violations instead of just sending out building inspectors, to have a transparent approach to accountability, to publish the building scoff laws, to substantially reform and reinvest in the Department of Buildings where architects should be excited to work and not dread to work. And lastly, to create a public engagement process around the International Code Council to create the same kind of feedback loop that generated all the significant change in the 19th and 20th centuries. One day, could we live in a city where rather than having hundreds of thousands of building violations, we actually have zero? I believe that civic professionalism for architects has to, be, has to start by promoting activism within the seemingly dry bureaucratic processes, um, which I believe are a site of both tactical and radical design interventions for a more, radical, uh, for a more equitable city. Thank you. The purpose of the Eugene program is to increase diversity representation within the field of architecture in Pittsburgh. Academia, industry, and community partners all working together towards the same goal. Following the internship and community engagement, the students begin a 14-week internship, and this is where wonderful partnerships with industry comes in. Uh, AIA firms, NOMA firms hire our you dreamers to work in the firms. Uh, some of them stay beyond those 12, 14 weeks and have become lifelong citizens of Pittsburgh and really instrumental leaders within the city. In terms of the academic coursework, one of the unique things about UDREAM is our desire to teach various things such as GIS and history and theory and studio, but also do it while recognizing the unique cultural diversity of the cohort. In the future, I see that if this was the kind of module that could be replicated all over and have more students be collaborative with each other and help them figure things out together as to where they want to go from here, it would definitely be super helpful for them. We as an institution, how do we use conventions and tools in architecture and urban design to design for those who do not have the voice as part of the process? And so to quote uh, one of my mentors, uh, Dr. Sharon Sutton, um, is that uh, as an architect, you have to learn how to see the problem, but then you have to also learn to give tactics and give the pencil to those who knows the problem that might be able to address it. These students, these designers, these architects uh, that are not at the table have solutions and tactics against some of our most pressing issues around social and environmental justice. Um, and, and if we can become the bridge to allow them uh, to give voice to them and amplify the, their voices, um, then we can actually begin to have a conversation of how we can actually move together towards a just um, reality, a just life, a just environment. We really got to go out and see the city and understand 
uh, what makes Pittsburgh so great and what can be improved, what our part is as architecture students and uh, young designers. During our final project, I got to speak with the president of the CDC and we talked about you know, going into these neighborhoods, you know, not being from these neighborhoods and how we would have to make sure we're not going in and uprooting anything, you know, and speaking with a local on the site that we chose, you know, I really got a sense of how the culture was and how it is now. And that kind of prompted me to, you know, start thinking of ways to make our project more of a love letter to the community. Thank you so much for the fabulous presentations and really like wonderful videos. Um, so before we kind of launch in, I wanted to um, basically ask our folks who haven't had a chance to speak in person <laughs> yet, if there's anything that you'd like to um, like to add um, relative to the, the work that we saw on the screen, uh, maybe you could kind of just uh, expand a little bit more about um, your, each of your programs and the kind of impact that you're seeing. Um, thank you. Um, you all can hear me, yes? Which one? This one? I'll go with this one. Um, it's a, I, I want to just start by saying that I'm here as one of a collective of individuals who are very invested in uh, the program Black in Design. Um, at the GSD, you heard folks uh, from my team speaking, Shaka Dendi, Tosin Odogbemi, who are um, really fantastically involved in the, um, the life of this program over the past few years. Um, I also want to thank our partners at Perkins and Will, um, namely Brooke Trevis and Phil Harrison, who have been um, really championing our, our collective endeavor on this project. Um, we're new. So this will be our fourth year uh, this spring offering the program. And being here today to talk about it is a particularly challenging moment in its trajectory um, because we are on the cusp of a name change for the program. So for the past three years, it went by Black and Design. And going forward, it will now be called Equity and Design, which is an outcome of the Supreme Court ruling on affirmative, just, on affirmative action um, with respect to admissions. Um, I am heartened at this moment to be able to share that everyone I've just named in the partnership of this program is invested in its future life. Um, and that that life will um, encompass growth, not replacement of any of the constituent individuals and voices that um, have comprised it to date. So um, I just want to note that it's a, a really fantastic moment for me to be here and um, hear more about the kind of history of a range of different programs um, who have been focused on fostering youth voices um, towards design paths uh, today. Um. Hi everyone, I'm Nehar. Um, so sort of like to continue along the lines of what um, Megan was saying, uh, what Udream basically does is provide an opportunity for um, individuals who are like just about to complete their uh, bachelor's in architecture or have recently graduated and are unsure as to where their career paths are gonna lead them there on forward. Um, based off all the presentations that we saw like throughout the day and the ones specifically uh, in this particular segment, we do know that there's a lot of uh, discrepancies and there's a lot of issues that we need to tackle. But as individuals who are like freshly graduating, there are much more um, other concerns that we have as to where is this going to take us? Like, what's what's next for uh, through a career point of view, right? Uh, so, the, what Udream basically does is provide you with an opportunity where you do sort of like a summer school for like six weeks with uh, academic modules, uh, followed by a 14-week internship program, where uh, you get to explore the two different avenues that you potentially have. One being either pursuing. Um, a master's degree in one of the specializations um, that exists within the scope of architecture and construction industry in general, uh, or what it's like to go out into the industry and actually work. Uh, another concern that we have been raising is like, uh, you know, the kind of uh, 
the kind of money that uh, junior architects who are just starting make and how we don't know what it is. So having the opportunity to uh, sort of do an internship also gives um, the U Dreamers an opportunity to prove uh, sort of like their calibers or uh, their scope of work and negotiate as to what it would be like when they actually join in full time. I hope folks are, we actually, I know that it says, I just want to clarify something in the schedule that we're supposed to end at four. We're going to extend for another 10 minutes. <laughs> So not a lot of time, but um, um, but I really thank you so much for giving us a little bit more information about the context of your programs. I just wanted to return um, maybe while we give the audience a couple of moments to think about questions. Um, I was really interested when Milton earlier spoke about architecture as a profession, a discourse, and a field. And I feel like in, in a way, this symposium is structured along those lines, right? The field, building the constellation of support, uh, a web of kind of interlocking systems of relation, which I think a lot of the kind of pathway programs are um, critical in developing. Um, a discourse, right? A kind of critical framework, uh, which is made of systematic inclusions and exclusions, uh, notions of an expanded canon, pedagog pedagogical um, you know, alternative practices, et cetera, and the profession, who we are, how we define the role of the architect through practice, who we serve, and what our impact is in shaping society, culture, um, and maybe regulatory frameworks. I love this idea of the public architect. I think we need this. <laughs> but, um, so I don't know. I, I, I'm wondering if you all want to pick up a little bit kind of where the last panel, um, like if we could start off where the last panel uh, ended off by uh, addressing some of these disconnects between pedagogy and practice, right? Um, I think. You know, I, I appreciated how Anya was like, well, don't end with what I'm saying on this <laughs> you know, sort of pessimistic note. But, um, you know, what are you all seeing at that kind of inflection point? I mean, I think, Nihar, your, your program specifically is looking at that, like, juncture where people are just having their kind of tentative first beginnings in the profession. So I'm, I'm wondering if, if you all have any further insights about this kind of, um, you know, disconnect, like why are we not seeing the kind of retention numbers that we want to see? So I'll start. Um, so when I was a teenager, many, many years ago, my older brother told me not to pursue architecture because I wouldn't get paid enough. Mm -hmm. And obviously I didn't listen. But um, so it's not like a new conversation, like it's a very, um, you know, it's a thing that I think we've had to navigate, especially you know, if you're not coming from a background of privilege, you have to like make difficult choices, um, you know, relative to pursuing this profession and then even the choices that you make once you sort of get in, like which, which positions make the most sense financially, you know, so that you can live in a major city or, or what have you. And so um, I just, I think it's important to, uh, to, to note that it's, it's a conversation we've been having for a long time, but we actually need to advance that conversation. So that's one of the things, not to say that I'll solve it next year as AI president, but I, I want to elevate the conversation so that we can acknowledge that, you know, we have a tremendous, um, you know, amount of talent that's coming through these different pathways programs, but they're making logical, financially logical decisions to choose something adjacent because of the financial dynamic. So I think we, like it's an important um, topic, so I'm glad that you brought that up um, and on the last panel. Um, I, I totally agree. I, um, I think that um, one thing I'm really proud of with the structure of our program is that it condenses, um, it really focuses on mentorship as having an impact to address this. Um, and it doesn't, uh, ally itself with maybe some of the norms of the footprint of the academy or of practice. Mm -hmm. So um, that's one of the beautiful things I think about our partnership with uh, Perkins and Will's office um, in this program is that we've got, um, we've got a kind of ecosystem of mentorship and support for students all the way from high school uh, as they become oriented to the potentials of design as something they could study. And uh, we're not deterministic with it either. We're very much teaching through the discourse of architecture with the expectation that 
hopefully those that join us, no matter what it is they go on to discover they truly love, whether it's in design or not, will take a value of the built environment with them. But I'm really proud of that, what I see to be a, a, a bigger professional issue that this program addresses, which is one of mentorship, and I like very much the fact that it doesn't just fit neatly in a container of existing in the academy or in the professional sphere, but actually spans both. Um, we do that because well, we do that by specific ways. The folks who join us in our program are able to connect with Perkins and Will's offices generally um, through the program and beyond. So we're really structuring this, maybe looking less at the finite 10 weeks that we have to impact students and thinking about how the, the time frame that exceeds that is supported through who they could reach out to as points of contact for navigating later stage professional choices. Um, and that also includes the GSD's alumni network, which is uh, global and uh, linked and supporting this program to help our students sort of navigate later stage choices as well. So mentorship is a really big um, component. Something that when I mentioned growth, we will be growing the number of students that we'll be able to engage in our program going forward, which I'm really happy about, but likewise growing that mentorship network for them on both sides of the partnership. Um, I also think that um, I'm championing growth. Uh, we, it's a free uh, program for Boston area high school students, what we run now. Um, but I worry about a false promise of accessibility through cost without growing later down the chain financial support for students. And so that's something else that um, I've been championing for quite some time through this program and hope we can look towards with more resources going forward. So to me, um, I think it's, it's a combination of cost, which I'm really happy Anya brought up, but also um, a, a support network that helps one navigate many choices as they arise later in, in one's uh, pursuit. Yeah, maybe just to chime in, I'm really glad that you brought up this question of more money and more mission, mm -hmm. because I think as we think about how to transform the profession into a place that a kind of diverse group of architects want to work and keep working, those things are really core. My sense is from architects of all ages, there are kind of three things that would be the ideal life, which is that you make good money, you go home on time so you can have a family and be part of civic life, and you work on great projects that impact that's change. Want. It is. But it's right, it's that's, I mean, like, those are the three things. Like, I, it's, I don't think I've met anybody who doesn't want those three things. And so, but right now, in contemporary practice as it is structured, often you have to choose two out of the three, right? And if we think about this from the kind of firm leadership side, those things are dependent on kind of capital, right? Like if you grind the team into the ground and everyone works late hours, then you get to work on great projects and maybe you make more money. But then you've kind of forsaken one. Or maybe you work on projects that don't have a positive impact, but they have great schedules and timeline. Everyone makes a lot of money and goes home on time. But then one day you wake up and you're like, I didn't get into this field to work on X, Y, or Z, you know, insert your least favorite program there, right? <laughs> so I think that if we, it, the pipeline is so important, but if we don't change the profession, it is kind of like there is nowhere to go. Um, especially, um, it's at the entry level, but it is also at higher levels, right? So the statistics you showed about diversity and licensure, we see that actually women, people of color are joining the field at increasingly high rates, but in the pathway towards licensure mm -hmm. are dropping off. And then afterwards, in firm leadership are dropping off really precipitously. So the profession has to change, otherwise the pipeline, the kind of incredible pipeline work that um, folks here are doing is really, um, We'll, we'll face kind of a dead end, I think. Sorry, I, that was depressing, not optimistic. I, mean, but that, <laughs> I think it's just realistic. I mean, um, you know, I think we've seen so many fantastic examples of ways in which people are getting uh, folks at all, um, at all ages from very different backgrounds to be excited about our discipline, but then where, <laughs> yeah, exactly, where do they go? Mm -hmm. um, so. I, I think it's just realistic, maybe <laughs> not super depressing, but it's an opportunity, right, for all of us. Um, I wanted to make sure that we open it up to our audience and also 
are there folks on Zoom that I can? Okay, so I don't know how to address Zoom questions, but if there are some, um, please feel free to put them in a chat. Uh, are there questions from the audience? Yeah. <laughs> If, does this work? Is it working? <laughs> this is going to be such a good is question when we working? get it. <laughs> <laughs> the microphone has a circumambulator. Mm -hmm. Is it good? Okay. Um, I think I had a question like in terms of like the lack of money in the field. Um, I think it's also like, yes, like one of those obstacles that are stopping black and brown students from entering the field. And um, I was wondering, like, I'm interested in like what kind of measures or initiatives that can be made on the, the business side to address this? Like, how do we add economic value to um, our work as architects? Like, what does that look like, I think? Yeah, so I'll start and happy to, to give the mic over to others. Um, so. Architects create a, a lot of value in the work that we do, but we, um, you know, we tend to be constrained by, um, you know, a certain percentage of construction or just basically our business model. Um, it seems like it doesn't quite align with the amount of effort that goes into the production of, of the work, the creation of the um, of the, the projects, and then ultimately the design documents and construction administration. All like there's a lot that goes into it, as I think you all know. Um, and it just doesn't quite materialize into the compensation that really would make our, our practices more um, uh, more sustainable, let's call it, um, and, and the way that we'd like for it to be sustainable, which, you know, looks at especially starting comp compensation, but, you know, throughout the, the spectrum, I think it's especially challenging. I, you know, I think about, uh, I'll use 2005 numbers, so that's when I was a student here. So I was um, a good friend of mine, he studied, uh, um, industrial and labor relations here uh, on campus, and he was really excited. He got his uh, first offer letter; it was sixty thousand dollars. And I just knew I was like, I'm here for five years. I work around the clock. It's my like mine is gonna be so much better. And then um, I, I actually went down to career services when it was like in the basement of Sibley, and I like flipped open the book because we just had books back then. And um, it was 35,000 was like the average. And I was just like, oh man, my brother was right. This is too <laughs> But I, I mean, clearly I'd already committed. Um, so and the point of that is, you know, we have to address because um, there are a lot of other sort of adjacent um, options to, to architecture that will, you know, that will take our talent. And we, we need that talent to solve some of the issues that, you know, that were discussed on the screen um, earlier. And so, uh, the other thing, and this is probably getting into the weeds a little bit, but I'll just say it quickly. Um, the procurement process for design services is really expensive and really, uh, like for example, sometimes clients will ask us to design an entire project for zero dollars, and they'll choose between you know one of ten firms, and so you've got ten firms that are like doing all this work, spending thousands, sometimes tens of thousands of dollars to pursue a project for one to get selected. So I think there's some efficiencies that we can probably. Um, build into the procurement process too. So those are a couple of things that come to mind, but um, again, if there are other thoughts. Yeah, I, maybe a quick thought, and this is like from, I speak of people in non-related fields, I was talking to somebody who does like accounting for big companies, and one of the things he told me I thought was very interesting, which is that when like big Fortune 500 companies invest in strategy, like when they hire a consulting firm, they call that a, an asset. It's like something that they have invested in that is going to continue to pay off returns for them over time. On the other hand, when they invest in architecture, it's considered a cost, it's a capital mm. cost, right? So it's money that you pay that just like goes out and then that's it. On the other hand, so much of the work that architects do is if not adjacent to strategy, it's actually like more profound than strategy in a way, right? It says, can we redesign everything about how we come together, work together, live together? So architecture should really be compensated as and considered uh, something that continues to provide returns, and yet right now it's not. And I think 
we see that in percentage of construction cost numbers that architects will go after projects from 5 to 15, maybe 20% if you work for very high-end residential firms, but a real estate agent will always get 5%, right? And if you 6%. think about, so oh, sorry, 6%, they are negotiating up even as we speak, right? So if you think about the difference between somebody who takes the key and opens the door to a building versus an architect who is responsible for the kind of entirety of the in building perpetuity. and in perpetuity, liable for it, and like responsible for kind of bringing every other discipline to the table, like those things just seem really out of whack. So I think there's one thing like Kim said about how to make sure that agency or the kind of relevance of architecture is legible to our clients has to be really, um, is really urgent. On the flip side, I think because of the work that I do in Chicago, it's so clear to me that there's so much work to be done, especially in underserved communities. These are kind of neighborhoods that need at the same time grocery stores, restaurants, hospitals, housing, like all those things need to happen at the same time for neighborhoods to kind of improve and for um, them to be able to serve the residents that live there. There is a kind of structural relationship to the work that architects do relative to investment and development capital. And I think that what I am inspired by in terms of activists from the past is that like our activism needs to really also be around directing capital towards development in the neighborhoods and places that need it most and also contributing to and being part of that change rather than chasing the money where it is now which doesn't necessarily serve our communities or create more equitable cities. Fantastic. Thank you. All right. Other questions? There was another one. Am I out of, <laughs> I know I'm like out of time also. <laughs> but, um, any other, oh, yep, go for it. Um, thank you so much for the um, talk. I guess I was struck well, by what you, you just said about adjacent industries taking architectural talent um, I was thinking that the construction industry historically and currently is really reliant on um, undocumented skilled labor. And I was wondering if maybe that one avenue of kind of reaching underserved communities would be to have more of, I guess, an interaction between architecture, which is, I guess, seen as I guess, above this labor in some ways. Um, I don't know, if, is there something that we can do as a community to address that and maybe go back to the roots of architecture as being in part a craft, a craftsmanship type of position, if that makes any sense? Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think that there, there's, you know, a few different models that we can pursue. I mean, I think, um, you know, that's certainly one thing to engage, you know, be more engaged in communities. I think a lot of architecture firms and smaller practices in particular do that um, already, but I think, you know, opening up, um, you know, more opportunities for, and I think what a lot of the pathway programs do, obviously for, you know, focused on youth, but also there are probably opportunities for, um, you know, for people who are going into construction to have more connectivity to the design process. So I think there's definitely some potential there. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Wanna... I mean, I've, I've really enjoyed seeing so many examples of um, the pathway programs doing work in communities and building things that have an afterlife beyond the limit of the program. So I think um, for me, that's really exciting coming from an, a kind of academic perspective because it's it's where the discipline is forced to sort of check uh, connectedness or distance between a theory and, and practice or like its application in the world. So I would just say that I think we're, uh, we're, uh, the pathway programs have been really inspiring just in so far as the fact that they're, they're bringing those things into, into alignment with one another, sort of what, what's being conceived of in the classroom and then what finds its way into, into the built environment. Um, I think design build firms and things like that sort of take that to the next level. But um, I'm excited by the generations to come if they're if they're coming through these programs and getting exposure to that at earlier stages than has maybe been the case historically. 
Yeah, I think I hear in your question, like I think if we look at the history of practice in the US, and this is making a vast generalization, we have really narrowed the scope of what is considered an architect's work, right? Mm -hmm. And from you know previous models, but particularly in the 1970s and 80s, when kind of contracts with between architects, between architects, owners, and builders were kind of cemented in their current form, which makes us three legs of a like, kind of wobbly triangle with antagonistic relationships on all sides, right? But I think what I hear from students and what we see from young designers is there is this desire for architecture to do more, to do strategy, to do construction, to do various forms of things that design actually really enables us to do. And so rather than the profession trying to continue to narrow our scope to reduce risk, which is often the kind of tendency, I think, as firms get larger, um, instead to try to like find ways to kind of bring ourselves back into like a more pluris, plural, pluralistic form of agency, which is I think what both what the kind of next generation wants to do, but also something that would increase our value to the communities we serve as well as to our kind of clients at large. Can I add to that? So uh, while you were talking about like, you know, uh, following like a separate avenue along those lines, but there are also like building science level things that go along with this. So I personally, um, I did my bachelor's in architecture, but then I swayed away from designing altogether. I was like, this is not what I wanna do. And I got down uh, into like sustainable designing and building sciences. I currently teach a course that talks specifically only about the indoor environmental quality. So there are other avenues that can also be pursued along these lines where you can contribute to the construction industry, to the design industry, but with the help of numbers, and which is again like something that is going to um, affect not just your productivity, but also the occupant health, which is basically what we as designers also need to focus on, and not just like, um, you know, the aesthetic uh, aesthetics part of it. That's definitely important, not saying it's not, but there are other avenues that can also be explored along those lines. And I think, unfortunately, we have to stop there, um, but I think it's a really um, kind of wonderful closing note to uh, think about the wide variety of pathway programs that we've seen, um, and also how many of them are about kind of expanding this notion of like what an architect is and what they can do and how they can impact society. So I think, you know, kind of ending on this note of new models of practice that, um, you know, maybe are doing more strategy, cons construction, advocacy, policy change, uh, and, uh, new developments in material science, right? That there's a kind of skill set that we as architects have um, that are shaping kind of new models of practice um, in addition to designing built, built work. Um, so thank you so much for being here and thank you for um, your insights. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Let the <laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Uh, good evening. I am honored to be here today to introduce you to Dr. Sharon Agrita Sutton, who in many ways needs no introduction. Currently a distinguished visiting professor at Parsons School of Design, Dr. Sutton previously served on the faculties of Columbia University, Pratt Institute, and the University of Cincinnati, the University of Michigan, and the University of Washington. Dr. Sutton was the first African American to receive the AIA ACSA Topaz Medallion for Excellence in Architectural Education and the 12th African American woman to be licensed to practice architecture in the United States. Her recent books include Pedagogy of a Beloved Commons, Pursuing Democracy's Promise Through Place-Based Activism, and When Ivory Towers Were Black, a story about race in America's cities and universities. So what more can I say about a woman who holds five academic degrees in music, architecture, philosophy, and psychology, and has studied printmaking internationally, and has her fine art in the Library of Congress? 
What I can add is that Dr. Sutton is a woman who has been an inspiration to me since I first learned about her in Jack Travis's book, African American Architects in Current Practice. I discovered this book when I attended my first NOMA conference so many years ago. Since then, I have admired Dr. Sutton and respected her work from afar while also having the pleasure of engaging with her in intimate conversations on various occasions where she challenged me to think about practice and discipline. As a student and member of the Minority Organization of Architecture, Art and Planning, MOAP, here at Cornell, you honored us by speaking at our 1995 Vertner Woodson Tandy Symposium entitled On the Eve of the Other. I hope you remember that, that's right. Your lecture, The Power of the Other to Bring About Social Change, and following workshop, The Other Power is the Power from Within, Learn How to Use It, I can scarcely remember. However, when we would meet again as colleagues at Parsons, my studio there entitled Take Care of Yourself was very much in dialogue with the practices and principles you laid out in your writings. Your essay, Creating Landscapes of Safety in the book Architecture of Fear, was a kind of revelation that sparked ideas for me about what practice could be. Your most recent book, which I still owe you a review of, I want to share a quote from in your conclusion. I set out to explore an aspirational framework that would help young people take hands-on action within the commons of low-income neighborhoods where they witness daily symbolic reminders of their abandonment and marginal status. I began by proposing that the emotional, physical, and intellectual realms of place-based critical pedagogy could help them ameliorate disinvestment in community infrastructure and amplify their political voice. Over the years, you have been pivotal to ongoing work with youth at Medgar Evers College Proprietary School in Brooklyn, New York. You shared with them your work in an exhibition I co-created at the Center for Architecture. They witnessed firsthand that a black woman could harness the power to center her life in such a way that it could inform architectural and urban practices. They saw that their lives mattered and that institutions could be available to them as resources for this exchange. I know this was not a perfect experience for you, but let me remind you of one student for whom that was life-changing. After seeing your work, he began to ask critical questions within his school of how he could have an impact in his community. With support from local elected officials, he was promoted to fellows in the Obama Foundation, My Brother's Keepers Alliance. You were with us, Dr. Sutton, when he met with our governor this summer. And later that summer, along with completing the engineering summer program here at Cornell, he would meet Barack Obama on Martha's Vineyard, where he mirrored you by example and shared what he had to contribute to his community based on his expertise, interest, and knowingness. I am sure that countless students across our nation who through your practice and research have been supported to meet their greatest potential as effective agents of change in their communities. I should also add that you have been a valuable contributor to the educational experience of our students here at Cornell. As a critic and, more, as a critic and in more casual encounters, usually at Dear Norma Darden's Miss Mamie Spoonbart II in Harlem, where you last gathered with us to celebrate your 82nd birthday. Your role as an educator, author, and artist, and citizen architect with global reach, as it states in your bio, is a model of leading by example, and your exacting support and honest criticism to the cohort of scholars and practitioners who you have mentored throughout the years is incalculable. My dear friends, colleagues, guests, it is my great pleasure to welcome back to Cornell, Dr. Sharon Igrita Sutton. Well, that has to be the best introduction I've ever gotten. <laughs> uh, before I start, I'd just like to know who's in the room. Are there any students here? 
Oh, and you're not doing midterms. Thank you for coming. I'm so happy you're here. Are there any faculty here who are not involved in the program? Okay, thank you for coming. Um, how about architects? Are there any architects around? Wow, we have like a great group. How about community people? Okay, all right. Okay, okay, okay. that's terrific. Well, thank you all for, for coming. I'm very pleased to be part of this very wide-ranging discussion that we've had. This is only the second time in a long career of public speaking that I have been asked to provide a closing keynote rather than an opening one. And what a daunting assignment it is. I am standing here knowing that you have already been sitting in this very uncomfortable, very unfriendly auditorium listening to three sessions lasting for a total of about five hours. You have already heard about the low achieving students who are poorly served by this nation's racist education system, but who have also inspired an array of remarkable innovations in inclusivity. You have already witnessed various strategies for being more inclusive in your own approach to design and design education. You have already been offered ways to embrace the cultural identities of diverse individuals while bringing about institutional transformation. And you have already viewed an exhibition and had some tasty refreshments that have eased your mind into a much needed restful state. So, what's left to say at the end of this very full day? While paying tribute to the wealth of ideas offered during the symposium, I have decided to take a Lou Kahn approach and turn the conversation upside down. This evening, I'm going to put some ribbons and bows on the day by asking you to reconsider who should be the focus of your attention. Given the appalling level of race-based economic inequality in this country, should your innovations be oriented toward transforming the educational experiences of low-income youth who are more likely to be African American and Hispanic, or should they be oriented toward transforming the educational experiences of well-to-do youth who are more likely to be Asian and white? Or should you consider their mutual transformation? Though I was asked to speak for much longer, my lecture will only last for about half an hour, which is the time I need to take you through the highlights of my own personal struggle with these questions, providing you with the time you need to offer guidance on the next step of my journey. So let's get started by thinking about what constitutes achievement. My ambivalence about this topic began in my childhood when I observed two very different parents. One had a third grade education with minimal literacy skills, but he could find handfuls of four leaf clovers, add up bills without pencil and paper, and drive a car so it seemed like it was part of a Walt Disney animation. The other was a former elementary school teacher with beautiful handwriting, but she could not find a single four-leaf clover, was nervous about adding up bills even with pencil and paper, and never learned to drive a car. 
long before I studied psychology and studied the concept of multiple intelligences, I experienced the paradox of achievement at home as my young persona figured out which of my very different, differently talented parents would be best suited to the particular task at hand. I carried this outlook with me when I accepted a job as an architect in residence at the lowest achieving public school in Brooklyn, New York, where children were predominantly African American and impoverished. The school, which you heard about in the introduction to the symposium, featured an arts curriculum and was situated in a middle an upper middle class, predominantly white neighborhood where parents sent their children to private school but controlled the fate of the local public school. Because the neighbors believed that the school's black and brown students needed law and order rather than art, the principal wanted me to educate them on the value of an arts education and charged me with demonstrating their creativity. With funding from the National Endowment for the Arts, I became obsessed with this assignment and figuring out how I could help the fourth, fifth, and sixth graders in my classes display their talents in the schoolyard so the neighbors could observe them in action. To address the principal's charge, I developed a year-long curriculum. During the fall semester, I instructed three classes of about 100 children. I taught them to design and represent three-dimensional space through assignments that required them to work together in small teams. Toward the end of the semester, all three classes participated in a day-long charrette to develop the design for a structure that a huge team would build in the schoolyard. During the second semester, I engaged a much larger team, which eventually involved over 1,000 children, teachers, parents, and neighbors in building the structure. The first year, the neighbors called the police, thinking the children were up to no good with their work tools. But by the second year, the neighbors joined in the action. Similarly, at first, the National Endowment for the Arts paid for all the materials and my residency. But by the fourth year, the funding came entirely from the parents and neighbors who were so thrilled with what the children were learning that they doubled my residency hours and the construction budget. Meantime, the project became the subject of my doctoral dissertation in psychology, my empirical research demonstrating that the children who participated in the design build activities <coughs> learned to be significantly more cooperative and environmentally aware than those who did not. The data provided concrete evidence that economically disadvantaged children can perform in superior ways even if their academic test scores do not improve as my dissertation advisor hoped they would. After a short stint at the University of Cincinnati, I accepted a position at the University of Michigan where I received a W.K. Kellogg National Fellowship that required me to increase the social justice focus of my youth work. 
With additional funding from the Foundation and the National Endowment for the Arts, I conceived the Urban Network, a program that helped elementary and middle school teachers undertake activities similar to the ones I had done in Brooklyn, reorienting the method methodology that I had developed as an architect to teachers who lacked design expertise but wanted to engage their students in improving their deteriorated school surroundings. Initially, I targeted inner city schools, but when more affluent schools began applying to the program, I included them as well. The result being that I was able to observe the nation's separate and distinctly unequal education system. For example, during a field trip to New York City, I visited 10 elementary and middle schools with sharply contrasting environments, including a private school where in 1990, tuition was $10,000 per year, a Hebrew day school, two public schools that offered enriched education to high achievers, and six low achieving inner city schools. No matter what its environment, my lesson was the same in each school. I asked the eight to 13 year old children what the major problems were in their community and what they could do about them. The inner city children told me what they had experienced firsthand. They had seen someone get killed. A friend had committed suicide or been sent to jail. A relative was born with AIDS. They would have to avoid the drug pimps on their way home from school. The more well-to-do children focused upon fears of events that had not happened to anyone in the class. Being robbed, beaten up by gangs, ripped off by welfare cheats, or held back by uneducated people. Their comments suggesting their need to be protected, to be kept separate, and an association of their fears with people of color. The well-to-do children were particularly insistent that the only possible solution to these problems were war, the police, the National Guard, vigilantes, surveillance equipment, bulletproof glass, or armored guards. They expressed an even greater fear and sense of powerlessness than those for whom drugs, crime, failure, poverty, and violence were part of everyday life. The book I wrote, Evaluating the Urban Network, called attention to what children learn from experiencing the material conditions of poverty and wealth. I characterized the physical environment as a textbook that instructs children about society and their place within it. For example, that they are of no value and deserve their lot or conversely, that they are superior and entitled to all that they have. In the book, I argued that educators should actively engage children in reconfiguring the lessons they learned from their surroundings, whether about hopelessness or entitlement, and further noted that they should be concerned with all place-related deficiencies that children accrue, including spiritual deficiencies in compassion and empathy, as well as intellectual deficiencies in math 
and science. In today's society, which is even more segregated by race and class than it was in the 1990s, a holistic approach to ameliorating young people's place-related deficiencies seems even more relevant but less likely to occur as neoliberal theories of preparing students for the workforce increasingly dominate the purpose of education. After I left Michigan to join the faculty at the University of Washington, my research center received unsolicited funding from the Ford Foundation to address the problem of delinquent teenagers in communities of color who fail to become engaged in productive activities. To counter this stereotype of disengaged youth of color, in a, in a disengaged youth of color, my research team identified a selective group of after-school youth programs that were operating within community-based organizations and were successfully engaging young people in addressing an array of local challenges, sometimes even providing them with stipends to do so. A national study that my team conducted revealed that, contrary to prevailing stereotypes, young people in these programs were doing amazing work to improve their disenfranchised neighborhoods. Whether through political or place-based activism, they were campaigning for better food and better schools, tackling gang violence and over-policing, creating gardens and farmers markets, painting murals and staging art festivals, cleaning up rivers, and even building housing. Wanting to amplify the work that was happening in these organizations, I decided to reframe the Ford study around the notion of cultivating critically informed citizens in an increasingly divided and intolerant nation. The book that resulted posits that the challenges low-income youth of color experience within their disinvested surroundings are worsened by a neoliberal public education system that emphasizes winning at all cost, competitiveness, and an almost rabid individualism. It illustrates how critically informed citizens can develop by exercising agency in what I refer to as the commons, a political and psychic space whose values are mapped out in physical space. Drawing from hundreds of pages of data, some collected over a decade ago and some collected recently, my beloved Commons book demonstrates that the concreteness of three-dimensional public space provides a literal stage where young people can experiment with collective life and practice working toward just and inclusive futures. The program that is most relevant to this gathering was offered by an organization called Academe, my pseudonym for a nationally recognized youth organization in Harlem, New York, that developed African American, Latino, and Latina youth as critical thinkers and leaders. It began as the community outreach project of two Harlem born Ivy League seniors who established the program in one of their own public high schools after earning their degrees. 
their pedagogy targeted the total sociopolitical development of disadvantaged youth, introducing them to the writings and speeches of the 1960s African American intelligentsia, most notably James Baldwin, Angela Davis, and Malcolm X. Then they positioned the youth as public intellectuals who had the knowledge and political savvy to assume, assume leadership in the commons of their Harlem neighborhood, providing opportunities for their charges to take, undertake informed action. The youth, ages seven to 21, identified problems, researched them, and then organized their peers, families, and neighbors. They undertook campaigns for rent stabilization in their homes, for student support staff instead of police officers in their schools, and against police brutality and marijuana felony laws throughout the city and state. They undertook such activities as getting out the vote on election night, interviewing older people, and mapping the physical infrastructure. They garden year round to provide inexpensive fresh produce in a food desert. And they worked over many years to organize a coalition of residents to advocate for redeveloping a condemned school building. Academe has an exceptional track record of helping the youth improve the physical, political, sociocultural, and economic infrastructure of their neighborhood. But it also helps them advance academically and in chosen careers. For example, while only 34% of African American, Latino, and Latina uh, students graduate from high school, 94% of Academe's alumni do. Academe and the other organizations in my study add nuance to my ongoing efforts to redefine disadvantage as an opportunity to experiment with conceiving new forms of collective life. Without question, these organizations excelled in creating safe spaces for youth to listen to one another, openly embrace diverse populations and concerns, and acquire tolerance for difference. Yet programs like Academe that primarily serve low-income youth give me pause as I wonder how affluent youth will learn to be tolerant, to work things through, to compromise if they are isolated from their less affluent counterparts. In his concept of a beloved community, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. envisioned what he referred to as the architectural pattern of a great world house where people who are unduly separated in ideas, culture, and interest would recognize a geographical oneness with others and somehow learn to live together as a family because, as he noted, we can never again live apart. Thinking about my study population and the enrichment programs described here today, I wonder how well-to-do youth will develop geographical oneness and be prepared to share their privileges with their less well-to-do counterparts. And I wonder how both groups will learn to live together as a family in a great world house. These are the questions I have been struggling with on my journey through the paradox 
of achievement. While I was on this journey from childhood to being an architect in residence, to founding the Urban Network, and finally to conducting the Ford Foundation study and writing the beloved Commons book, several profound shifts were occurring in my socio-political world. For one, the nation's income inequality, which is among the highest in the developed world, had been increasing since Ronald Reagan won two landslide victories in the 1980s as an advocate for neoliberal reforms favoring big business. As a result of a snowballing percentage of wealth going to a shrinking percentage of the population, the poor can no longer participate equally in decisions that affect their lives. While the rich and powerful have increasingly proven their total inability to govern. According to the New York Times, many voters have simply audit, opted out because they are, and I'm quoting the New York Times here, weary of weathering the tumult of the Trump presidency, a pandemic, the capital insurrection, inflation, multiple presidential impeachments, and far-right Republicans' pervasive lies about fraud in the 2020 election. Tragically, voter disenfranchisement is happening at the very moment that an insidious corporate power has penetrated deep into the education system, completely supplanting the goal of cultivating democratic citizenship with that of preparing human capital for industry. The education system has shifted from serving a public good to being a private investment in individual earning capacity. A shift that devalues the pedagogy that panelists presented today. Yet this is precisely the pedagogy that both impoverished and affluent young people need to combat the injustices and intolerances of a democracy that has veered off course. The double-edged problem of rising income inequality and having leaders who are ill-prepared to govern by the bankrupt education they received is made even more egregious by the increasing risk of trying to enter the mainstream by earning a college degree. When the cost of attending college was manageable, students could be assured that their investment of time and money would pay off in a more comfortable lifestyle than those who held only a high school degree. However, in the last 20 years, the cost to attend a four-year private college has almost doubled, and it has more than doubled at four-year public colleges. As the cost of a college education has risen into the stratosphere, the benefits of earning a degree have become so murky that the percentage of young adults who said that earning one was very important fell over the last decade to 41% from 71%. And almost half of college-oriented parents said they would prefer that their children not earn a four-year college degree, possibly fearing that they would be among the 40% who start but do not graduate. According to Federal Reserve studies, those students who borrow money but do not finish their degrees 
are doing worse than adults who never attended college at all. Given the increasing riskiness of the college degree business, I would imagine that the trend will be toward an ever more affluent college student body, many of them with spiritual deficiencies similar to or even worse than the ones I observed 30 years ago in the urban network. This trend has clarified my ongoing ambivalence about the paradox of achievement. I am convinced that discussions like this one can only move toward more just futures by addressing the spiritual deficiencies that result from neoliberal education. That they must not only consider how to make education more inclusive of low-income and ethnic minority students, but that they must also consider how to increase privileged students' capacity for compassion and empathy. Because of my longtime involvement in teaching design studios that involve community clients, I have been collaborating with colleagues from Dark Matter University, some of whom you've heard from today, to develop a community-centered pedagogy for my studios at Parsons that would do just that. Among the principles of practice that we have discussed are building trust with community partners, establishing mutual expectations for the relationship, securing funding to pay community partners for their participation, and for hiring student interns to continue the work after the studio ends, and following up with them to see if their goals for the partnership have been met. You learned quite a bit about this pedagogy earlier today in Naomi Langer Voss's video and a presentation about her ARC Scholars program. But let me tell you the backstory and also uh, do my bit with turning things upside down. I first encountered Naomi 38 years ago in a junior year undergraduate architecture studio that I was teaching at the University of Michigan. It was her first studio and my first experiment in teaching a studio that had a community client. Furthermore, the client happened to be the Lions Club in the village of Dexter where I lived. Not only that, but the proposal for a gazebo that Naomi's team designed was the one the Lions selected to build. And it remains standing today, having provided the backdrop for countless community gatherings, large and small, providing a stage for collective life in the village of Dexter. When my former protege in community service told me of her efforts to expose young people who live in New York City public housing to architecture, I immediately envisioned an opportunity for envisioning the educational, for enriching the educational experiences of my students at Parsons, the number one school of design in the nation and among the top three globally. A private school where tuition is almost $60,000 annually, but whose graduation rate for undergraduates with exceptional financial need is just 3%. Despite its mission of social justice, Parsons is anything but a model of justice. So I felt that Naomi's Naik Art Scholars could help enrich my students' expensive but deficient educational environment. 
After she became the co-instructor this fall in my senior undergraduate architecture studio, we developed a syllabus that includes five collaborative sessions with her art scholars. The Parsons students present their in-progress work, get feedback, and then work hands-on with the art scholars to refine their ideas. The jury is still out on how well this collaboration will work and how low our student evaluations will be. <laughs> but we hope that the ARC scholars will benefit from Parsons students' disciplinary knowledge, which emphasizes originality and artistic expression aimed at uplifting the human spirit. At the same time, we hope that the Parsons students will benefit from the ARC scholars' personal knowledge of the complexities and nuances of life in the community for which they are developing hypothetical design proposals. Together, we hope that the group will cultivate new ways of knowing, consensus building, and mutually respectful relationships across disciplinary and social boundaries. So let me end by inviting you to share the legacy of my differently talented parents. First, I invite you to see educating the next generation of architects, not simply as transmitting disciplinary knowledge, but also as an opportunity to cultivate their full potential, especially their ability to contribute to collective life in a democracy. Relatedly, I invite you to create initiatives that enrich students intellectually, artistically, socially, spiritually, and even physically. Initiatives that engage their whole persons in working together to build a great world house. Most of all, I invite you to ensure that your enrichment programs strive to unite young people across social class so they learn to be tolerant, compromise, and see things through the eyes of others. In putting the ribbons and bows on this symposium, my charge to you is to equip all junior architects, irrespective of their level of achievement or material conditions, to be citizens who have the critical skills to challenge injustice, the courage to speak truth to power, and the compassion to advance not just their own self-interest, but the health and well-being of others. Let's support all junior architects in working hands-on to achieve the geographical oneness of a beloved commons. Thank you so much for listening at the end of this very long and enriching day. Thank you. I'm terrible at answering questions, but you know, I need the practice. Thanks so much. Um, thank you very much for really a thought provoking talk. Um, something that really caught me was the way that you describe spiritual deficiency. So I'd be curious to hear more about your, your perspective about this idea of spirit in a classroom and how it can be developed or devolved uh, in different structures. You know, I think that this wonderful symposium is an example of the lack of spirit in the way we deal in academia, and the way we 
in education in general, not just higher education, but all of education, that we've trained ourselves to not have feelings, to sit in chairs that are totally uncomfortable and, and refuse to do so, to, you know, to go out in the grass or something. <laughs> Uh, that we've, we've trained ourselves to obey, to comply in, very, um, in ways that diminish our spirit and our ability to sense other people and other surroundings because we've turned off our feelings. So when I talk about spirituality, I'm really talking about feelings, soul, you know, the, um, the personal experience of, of education. Of, you know, when I came in, I wanted to know, who are you? I don't, you know, I got my speech prepared. Who's in the room? Um, I, I had a, um, Naomi and I had a, a mid-review and I was very upset because I was so busy trying to get everything ready that I didn't have an opportunity to bring a little spirituality into the review, which for me is not starting with, you know, the project. It's starting with a little food, maybe a little toast, what the students want to get out of it, and then getting to the project. You know, it's, it's paying attention to our bodies and our souls, and not just our minds and and the skills we're supposed to be learning. So that's what I mean when I speak of spirituality. It's, it's bringing our feelings uh, and our expression. You know my background is in music. So music is all about feeling. Uh, and I've never lost that. Does that is that a terrible answer? I, I give terrible <laughs> answers. I know I give terrible answers. <laughs> I saw a lot of students here. I would love for one of the students to ask a question. Hello, uh, my name is Ethan. Uh, I just wanted to thank you for this beautiful um, this presentation. Um, it feels like I'm going to speak a little bit personally here. It feels like you've said something that I felt a lot of people are thinking, or at least a lot of students are thinking, in terms of you know shutting down a certain part of their personality or a certain part of their mind in order to excel. Yeah. And to me, that resonated a lot, kind of going through five years of being at a PWI. Not, not necessarily Cornell. We're, we're the two visiting students from RPI. So this entire ethos is, is speaking to me a lot. And I guess the question would be, how would you recommend approaching maybe a professor or even a dean to kind of bring that feeling back or champion the the ideals you're 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 talking about here? Because it seems like such an orthodox unorthodox conversation to have. Yeah, I'm so glad to hear the students are talking about it. You know, we there's been a lot of talk among uh, students of color that their identities have been suppressed. But I think it's true for all students. And I think it's one of the reasons that the, um, uh, the, the psychological mind, you know, that there's a psychological problem. That there are a lot of students that are having emotional problems because they're under extreme pressure to suppress everything about themselves and be successful. So my advice would, to you would be to get your story together as a group. You know, the first thing, you know, I'm, I'm a, if you read my book, you'll find that I'm very um, influenced by Paolo Freire. So the, that methodology is the first thing is to work together, talk with one another, and develop your own truth, the consciousness of your own truth within a historical context. Know what has happened before and where you are within it. And then develop the ability to take collective action. So on this issue of, you know, how, how you spend your day, I mean, people have been talking about um, working very hard and not getting paid 
But the, you know, there's also an issue of how you spend your time in school. So I think getting together and having a conversation on what your experience are and have solutions. Don't just have a complaint. Have an idea for how you could transform your experience and be better architects by having a more holistic experience. So that would be my advice. I just want to call attention to the student that just asked the question and the other student that's here and your mother. Um, so these students are actually from RPI oh, and from um, RPI. We, they just arrived today. We didn't know they were coming. They're part of um, the NOMAS group at RPI that initiated a program that we featured in the case, uh, the case studies. Oh, and so I think it, it's just a super exciting what they're doing as a, a NOMAS group. They've started their own yeah. um, program working with high school students in Troy. Yeah. And so I just want to call attention to that because it's just amazing you showed up. <laughs> well, it's a, yeah. And I actually have history at RPI from the, the former dean there was my sponsor for fellowship. So, and I feel very connected to, so I, I feel a sort of spiritual connection to RPI and, and have been, been there before. So I'm so glad you, that you could come. And, and please have that conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, you know, as always, I've, I've you know, followed your career, similar to Peter. Uh, you know, I was a member of that 1995 group that brought you here back in, uh, at that time. And, um, and again, have seen you speak multiple times. Um, and we've also had chances to, uh, you, you know, collaborate on, on reviews and in class and things of that nature. And so, again, it's great to hear it in a kind of formalized presentation, the work that you've been doing and conducting over your career. Um, and, and my question, uh, it's really aimed at some level of not necessarily assessment, but how do we necessarily have a kind of post uh, evaluation as to, you know, uh, impact and effectiveness, right, yeah. of, of education, especially of the programs, many of the programs that we've seen today in which we see, you know, many people who put their, their time, their effort, their spirit into these, um, you know, high school programs, um, junior high programs, even elementary programs that introduce people to the, the community, to architecture, to design. And, um, but what is, how do we know that these are being, um, are effective programs? Yeah. Well, you know, we, we ask for empirical evidence. It's a society that's run on data. But I think it depends on what kind of data um, and the kind of test score data that we're using to measure success, I think, are not the right ones. Uh, I think it's effect over time and effect in bringing about change and that we also have to look at collective achievement and not just individual achievement. The program that I ref, and, and you know, in order to get the money, <laughs> which is the problem, because the people who, the, the corporate people, they're foundations, but they're actually corporate people, are actually controlling the whole thing by the way they give out funding. So you have to be clever enough to play both sides of the street. So academia has been able to get those test scores that will get them the funding uh, and have the community support that allows them to still be transformative in their community, which means that they're doing double duty. They're working twice as hard. And that's a shame, but it's where we are. Uh, I was talking, I think, at lunch about the need for when you're doing social justice work, you really have to do double performance. You have to create the evidence that the mainstream wants in order to get into the door. 
and then you have to create the evidence that will bring about social change. So you're working both sides of the street, and I, I think I, Peter mentioned that book that I've forgotten about, of Jack Travis's. I think I dealt with that, you know, that double bind that you're in to get into the box and change the box. So that's, that, that's the problem you have to solve, is providing the evidence that's going to get you the funding that will allow you to exist while also disrupting the whole society that's providing the funding. Two of the programs that are in the book, two of the three, were able to do that. The one that, was, that I didn't talk about, the Hawaii program, was especially successful because they were doing, they were working absolutely against the government with government funding. They were getting government funding to disrupt the government. It was amazing. <laughs> and, and they were doing it with the power of youth because kids, you know, they can, they can speak truth to power in the way that grown-ups cannot. So they prepared the youth. The youth would go out and do their testimonies. And, and at the same time, they would go to school and be successful in school, give them the performance data that they needed to, you know, to show that they were sending kids to college and the kids were doing well while they were still you know, disrupting the whole system that goes on in Hawaii of the government giving money to tourism and the military. So. Thank you. Thank you for such a um, brilliant closing and encapsulation of, of so much that, that we're um, talking about today and that you've done in your career. I have two questions. One is, um, what do you think the role of, of black philanthropy is in, in what you've been discussing in your work? And then secondly, I'd love to hear your thoughts on reparations and what, what you think that means, what it could mean, what it should mean. Um, yeah. You know, I'd love to hear your thoughts on those. Those are two things I haven't thought about. So I have to speak totally off the top of my head. I guess I'm disappointed in black philanthropy that, um, you know, I'm for creating the circular economy in which people get, you know, forget about re reparations. Give me my land and my money, enough money to operate, and get out of my way. And that's not happening. That, that would be my form of form of reparations would be getting land and putting it and creating the legal structures that allow the land to be operated collectively and owned collectively. Because um, I, I think, you know, it, it has to be collective reparations. Um, and I'm, I, I'm disappointed that I don't see the black leadership uh, advocating for that kind of really change in how the whole economic structure would be operated. It seems to be much more fitting within the norms rather than disrupting the norms. My view of reparations would be, you know, I don't want to go back. I don't want to go off to another island, right? I'm beyond that, but I, I, I do envision that you need to have your own land, your own ability to produce, to generate. Um, I won't say work. I, th I call it production, and to recycle that into, um, to education. Uh, And food, food and education. Yes, ma'am. Hello, thank you so much for your talk. Uh, at the end of your talk, you um, mentioned um, empathy and compassion. 
the need for empathy and compassion in education. And I have been thinking about how does one learn empathy and compassion? And you mentioned music. And um, there are obviously other arts like literature, poetry, um, learning the stories of human experience, yeah. history. Uh, and usually, you know, the literature builds empathy when it can put the reader in the shoes of the other. Yeah. Uh, so I wonder if um, the overemphasis on learning the experience of your own identity group is actually impairing uh, the building of empathy and whether we need to also think of learning the human experience, not necessarily uh, or there needs to be a balance between identity-related uh, discussions and the human experience. So that's yeah. one uh, part A of my question. And the part B of my question is uh, all the things that build, may build empathy and compassion in education, let's say humanities, and there's so much the investment on learning literature, music, the arts, and history, and story. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if uh, the world is going to be even further challenged in, or the architecture education, there's a the investment on humanities, whether we will be further challenged in building yeah. compassion and uh, empathy. Yeah, I, I think you, yeah. you answered the question. Um, yeah, I, you know, in studying these programs, I was, I thought about the very question that you're answering, because they, these programs do wonderful work in getting uh, youth in touch with their culture and having them express it, getting respect for them within their own culture. And that seems really important. And yet, you know, I have the same question that you have. Does that isolate people in the same way that people are isolated, you know, when they go off in their own, you know, upper income or middle income enclaves? You know, where is it that we come together? Um, you know, people that looked at, say, women's colleges and HBCUs felt, they argued that there's a time when a marginalized group needs to be with their own group to develop their own identity. And the, the evidence is very powerful that, um, you know, I think we heard some of it in the first, in the opening speech of the success and, and the, the evidence, oh no, it was, uh, I'm getting them all mixed up. That somebody talked about the, the success of HBCU, uh, people trained at HBCUs. And that same evidence exists for the women's colleges, that a lot of the women's leaders came out of women's colleges and it's very powerful. But then you look in at what's going on in politics and you say, how are people going to, to learn to be together? We don't know how to be together and we live separately. So where are we ever gonna learn to be together? So I think that maybe we've, we have to have a better balance, that you have to learn about your own identity and the marginalized group you know, whether it's women or people of color or disabled people, or whoever it is, uh, LGBTQ Q people, they have a harder challenge than mainstream because they have to figure out what their identity is. But then if they stay only by themselves, how are other people going to learn about that group? So I think it's a both and question. Um, on the issue of, you know, what's happening with only, with choosing, with creating educational programs based on what people are going to earn, driven by the tuition issue, the cost of education issue, is such um, a rabbit hole that it is eliminating the very things we need to be learning. Uh, music, art, literature, you know, all of those things 
that help you think, uh, you know, outside of the box. Because, th you know, that's one of the ways of learning to think about, to learning to think. That's the way of learning to think critically. So to, I mean, that's my beef about education, neoliberal education, is that it is so focused on, I mean, the fact that accreditors accredit universities based on how many, how many jobs graduate gets, graduates get, and how long it takes to get them is kind of crazy, rather than some other measure of human achievement. Thank you so much. This was a wonderful talk. But I'm, I'm left with a couple of questions, and it, it sort of follows the trajectory you outlined for us of sort of of your career, you know, you were in these public universities, you were working deeply locally in some ways, and then now you're at Pratt, and you talked about sort of a global student body in a way, and how you are, you know, I'm thinking of the title of the first book, Weaving a Tapestry, and you're trying to make these connections between students at very different, both, you know, questions of very different places in terms of both their identities and class, right? You're really talking about an intersectionality of class and race or caste. And so in a global sort of focused university, much like ours, so our classrooms here have are about 40% international students and in the undergraduate um, play, space, they go up to 90, 100% international looking at the graduate space. And in thinking about a place-based pedagogy, I think what's really fascinating is trying to teach a place-based pedagogy when you're so distant from place. Yeah. Right? And then two things happen. Either you root it in Ithaca, and then you become extractive and exploitative of the local community. Right? right? Or you try somehow to span into a place that you don't know anything about as an instructor. And the other day, Imani did this wonderful presentation in a class that we co-teach, architects, planners, and artists. We have 145 students. I'm sure they complain. I see a couple of them here. Um, you know, I'm sure there's all kinds of issues with this class that we're trying to experiment with. But the interesting thing is, Imani talked in that class. Imani, if you'll forgive me for just quoting you. Um, she talked a lot about how one of the issues was to really think about sight. And to think about site, in a, in, to do site analysis differently from how we're trained to do it now as architects, right? And it goes back to, I think, Ezra's comment. Can you think about site as, you know, through history, through narrative, through song, through sweat, through tears, and all of that, right? Mm -hmm. but, but it's extraordinarily difficult yeah. for an instructor to think about site that is distant. Site that is what? That is distant. Oh, yeah. Right? And my classroom has kids from 40 countries. Yeah. So I'm really curious, and you're at Pratt, which must be very similar. I'm at Parsons. Oh, you're at Parsons. And we're 45% international. So I'm very curious, actually, to hear some thoughts on that kind of classroom when one is talking about researching, thinking about a place-based pedagogy and activism. Right. Well, I think the place has to be where you are teaching. And I'm, I'm very dis, you know, uncomfortable with the idea of doing a summer program in a place that I don't know, for example. So I think it has to be in the place where you know, which is in itself hard. Uh, I've taught at Michigan, which was Detroit as a community outreach. Seattle was the best experience because I was living in a place that had a community that I could serve. And New York has been a real challenge to, for me to, even though I, I spent 25 years there before I left, that I don't have roots in a community in New York. So I'm like, I could, you know, I could go to Switzerland as easily as I could go to a neighborhood, which is why I started with Naomi, because she has connections with the Public Housing Authority. So I think it, 
is difficult wherever you are to get connections in a community, to build connections in a community. And once you've built the connections, then it's those connections that become the informants of the students, wherever they're from. And you know, they may be from many, not only from other countries, but from other parts of the country. So you have students from all over, and you know, you need to have an informant that you trust, which were those um, principles that I briefly mentioned that I've been talking about with dark matter, of how you build a relationship with a community that becomes your, your, your true partner. They're your source of information. It's a long-term relationship, and they need to be compensated for that relationship. They can't do it volunteer. So I, I think it's, I, I agree with the problem that you have described, and I think it's even larger than the one that you've described, that it, you know, it applies not just to international students, but to all students. They're coming from all over. And you may live in a place but not have connections with the people you were, you're wanting to work with. So, taint easy. Thank you for the question. Thank you for all the questions. I think the mic, oh, it's working. I think we'll, we'll end it there then, okay, Dr. Sutton. Okay, I can Sutton. get Thank off you my so little <laughs> stool here. You need a hand. <laughs> some sort of, uh, we need to thank the people. Uh, should, we, should we go outside and hold hands? <laughs> Do some spiritual some stuff? Yeah. Let's get outside. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. You yeah. did everything. Yeah. 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 Yeah.